Good evening. I now call the Rockland Unified School District Board of Education regular meeting for Wednesday, September 6, 2023 to order. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Sophie Burns. Here. Derek Counter. Here. Tiffany Sadoff. Here. Rochelle Price. Here. Michelle Sutherland. Here. Julie Hupp. Here. Tonight we have Sophie Burns from Rockland High as our student board rep. Welcome, Sophie. Will you please introduce the color guard and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the presentation of the colors by the Rockland Unified School District's Junior ROTC Color Guard and the Pledge of Allegiance. The commander and U.S. flag bearer for this evening's color guard is Cadet Captain Caitlin Burns. The state flag is carried by Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Liam Turley. The right guard is Cadet Airman First Class Ryan Manning. The left guard is Cadet Technical Sergeant Sophia Burkhalter. The alternate tonight is Cadet Captain Trenton Sublet. Before we move into our regularly scheduled program, I just want to make a quick comment. As um, board president, I'm just going to throw this in here. I want to quickly speak in regard to social media posts made last week. So it's not on our agenda. So I'm just going to make a quick comment. I can only speak to my own posts. There were a few, but only two on my own Facebook page. One in which I invited Christ-centered, family-focused individuals to join committees and the next in which I invited all others who love children and our families and our community to join said committees. I would never intentionally exclude anyone from participating in our schools. As soon as it was pointed out to me that someone felt excluded, I made the second post. I've spent all of my years trying to get as many people as possible on school campuses and helping out teachers. I've taught, loved, and served in this community and nearby for 30 plus years. In those years, I taught hundreds of children and genuinely loved every one of them as well as their families. Not one has ever reported feeling discriminated against and not one would ever report me trying to teach Sunday school in a classroom. Moving forward, it is my full intention to continue loving children and serving families with all the passions of my heart as I have always done. And now we will move on to our special, thank you, our special recognition and presentations portion of the meeting. Chief Dosange, will you introduce our family partners in education recognition tonight? Good evening, President Hupp, trustees and superintendent Stock. The Families Partners in Education program is an opportunity for the Rockland Unified School District to recognize family engagement and involvement to help our students achieve excellence during the school year. For the first Family Partners in Education recognition for the 23-24 school year, we have Breen Elementary School Principal Jennifer Palmer joining us to introduce the Boozer family. Good evening, President Hupp, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Stock, and members of the Cabinet. I feel privileged to be here today recognizing the Boozer family. We are honoring Jenny, Max, Oren, and Ruby for their dedication and commitment to Breen Elementary. We know that volunteerism is the cornerstone of Rockland Unified, and the Boozer family is a true model of it. Mr. Boozer has been a member of our school site council for the past two years. He's had the pleasure of starting while we were meeting by Zoom. He has always been engaged in asking relevant questions in order to truly understand both our site and safety plan, which was impressive in a virtual situation. 
Um, as I learned sitting here, we can also add cross-country coach. Uh, he just shared with me today, he was named one of our cross-country coaches, so he continues to add to his list. Mrs. Boozer has been the heart and soul of our garden program for the past four years. She is part of a mighty team of just a few, but in the past four years, they've transformed it into a learning space for all our students and a treasure to our community. When we asked outgoing sixth graders their favorite part of green, it was clear that the garden was at the top of their list. Students come to our garden to engage in both exploration activities and targeted lessons, all created by the garden moms, as I like to call them. All of these are purposeful and well thought out. However, my favorite lessons are those that Mrs. Boozer calls employees of the month. This is where students learn how insects help grow or help our garden grow. What is most special about Mrs. Boozer's dedication to Breen and our garden is her passion for inclusion. One of our SDC teachers approached her team a couple of years ago and wanted to have her students engage more fully in the garden. Mrs. Boozer met with the teacher and developed a plan to have more engagement. They planted plants that were more sensory in nature and planned activities that were specifically designed with them in mind. This was in addition to them going with their typical peers. It is this commitment that makes our garden program truly special. The Boozer family is such an incredible example of giving back to their school community. We are blessed to have them at Breen and can't thank them enough for their time, dedication, and commitment to our school. Thank you. Okay, well, I will echo those words. I am so impressed by everything that you do. And actually, I was talking to Superintendent Stock about this garden, which I didn't know about, so I'm looking forward to coming to see it. And I have to say, as far as including the SDC program in the gardening, it's so valuable. And just taking that extra step to think about students who don't always have the same access to all the areas of campus at all times that our other kids do. So that's just, I think, just so valuable, we can't even measure it. So thank you for choosing to spend so much of your time at Breen with the kids. Thank you so much for coming out this evening and all that you do for our schools. All right, we will now move on to employee organization reports. Welcome CSEA President Chuck Haddix to present the CSEA report. Good evening, President Huff, Board of Trustees and Superintendent Stock. Um, I forgot my readers today too. I had to print the font a little bigger. Um, on August 28th, thank you, <laughs> On August 28th, the chapter met at Rockland High School for our regular scheduled chapter meeting. During our meeting, we ratified, voted on, and passed the new start and ending times for the high school night custodians. This change in starting and ending hours are just for the two high schools, Whitney High School and Rockland High School. This time change has no effect at any other sites in the district. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. All right, now to item 4.2, welcome RTPA President Travis Mojet to present the RTPA report. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome back. I haven't seen you guys since we went to summer vacation. I think our last meeting together was in May, so it's good to be back. Um, I want to start off just by reminding all of you, I'm an ally. RTPA is an ally. And when 
I say RTPA is an ally, I mean to every, hear me, every student on our campus. Doesn't matter how they identify. So that in mind, you can imagine the shock, the frustration, the anger, all the emotions that not only I, but RTPA memberships feeling after the pending agenda item was mentioned at the August 6th board meeting. That agenda item is 7.1 for tonight, and we'll hear a lot more about it later. Um, but I want to speak to a few pieces with that while I have your attention now. Um, first off, Rockland Unified is a district of inclusion and excellence. This policy, this idea is not excellent, is not inclusive. You should be ashamed of yourself for even discussing this policy, even allow it to be on our agenda. That said, we spent the last four years, tens of thousands of dollars, hours and hours of time working to be collaborative, to be impartial, to represent the best interests of our students. Where's the collaboration on this policy? We want committees for everything except board-specific personal agenda items. We want committees some of you board members sit on to celebrate labor management and accomplish things collaboratively. Where's the collaboration on policies like this that affect every kid, every classroom, and every campus in our district? Where's the collaboration? Some of you responded to my email, and I appreciate that response. But your response just talked about why we're not going to collaborate on this one. So are we a collaborative district? Are you a collaborative board? Is labor management just smoke and mirrors so our community thinks our teachers are happy and our district is functioning? I hope it's not. That's not my intent. I know Superintendent Stock and I work a lot together on that to not be the intent of the district as a whole. So I have to ask, where's the problem? Where's the breakdown in communication? Where's the phone call? And why with all those questions? Look at the division that this policy and this lack of collaboration has created in our community. Look at the division in this room and outside this building tonight. That's on you. You five represent this. Our job as teachers, your job as board members, is to bring students, teachers, and this community together for educational excellence. It's on the wall. It's not just there for a, a catchy expression. It's hard to be excellent when we're focused on things that have nothing to do with the classroom, that have nothing to do with education, have nothing to do with making our classrooms and schools safer and better inclusive, inclusive environments for our students. That's not excellent. So I'm just going to go through some of the legal violations around this policy and where RTPA is and will be. I know you all received our legal notice. I appreciate the one response I got from that. So when you go and implement a policy unilaterally, that's a violation of the ERA. You have an obligation to negotiate. And Julie, I know you know this well. You're a teacher and a leader in a neighboring district. You have an obligation to negotiate any impacts, any changes in working conditions. That's a proactive obligation, not a reactive obligation. So if any policy is passed tonight, we will be filing with PERB. We will win with PERB, I promise you that. If this policy passes tonight, I won't comply. I'm not gonna follow a policy that breaks trust with my students, that endangers their lives. I won't out any student for any reason, for anything. Yeah. Along with this violation of your obligation to bargain impacts, we're going to spend countless hours, countless resources, in addition to what's already been spent on this topic, in addition to the things that were put in place to have people here tonight to talk and speak to you about this issue, this concern, this policy that seems so necessary, but nobody can give a reason why, or an example in Rockland where it's even appropriate. <laughs> Not being a person of legal expertise, I am excited that we have um, one of our GLS attorneys I'll be speaking later this evening, more specifically to the legal actions. This is an attorney that is well-respected and well, very familiar with Rockland, somebody that we work with regularly 
um, when teachers need representation that helps us in legal actions and hasn't steered us wrong yet, both the district or our TPA. So I'm gonna go back to my why. Why do you feel the need to put a target on a student's back? You can answer, this is a dialogue. The agenda item allows us to dialogue. I know when the district office comes up and presents, you ask questions, so I'm welcome to interrupt me and ask questions anytime. Why are you creating an environment that's unwelcoming to students? No matter what happens here tonight, kids that walk into my classroom tomorrow will no longer feel as safe and protected as they did today. No matter what, that's on you. That's not on me, that's on you. So for probably two, maybe three years, we heard many of you board members, whether it was as a board member in your campaigns to become board members, speak about government overreach. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. So you don't want the government to overreach and get into your families, but you want to create a policy that requires me, a public employee of the government, to call a family and get in the middle of their business. I guess overreach is only okay when it suits your agenda, it violates school trust, creates problems in families, and definitely creates student safety concerns. But it's okay, because your policy allows me three days to call CPS before I call the parents. So I can call and say, hey, the parents are gonna have a CPS violation as soon as I call them, but there's no concern there that the policy is invalid, illegal, and unsafe in the beginning. Co The irony is we write this policy that's going to out students, that's targeting a group of students, and then just to cover ourselves, you go in into our non-discriminatory article and you make some changes there, because that's how we're going to cover ourselves. I don't know about you guys, but the irony of the policy being in red was all the red flags I needed. <laughs> so we have a policy that now needs us to create an amendment to our non-discriminatory policy to make sure that we're only discriminating if they don't check these boxes, right? It's not discriminatory if it's the parents, if it's the school counselor, right? Those policies all were fine before. I ask you tonight whether you're gonna, I, I'm picking up, you're probably not gonna engage with me tonight, and I'm, that's just a shame, I think. But uh, at least at some point, maybe you can tell us the why. And maybe you can give us the honest why. If it's because your own political beliefs, your personal beliefs, your religious beliefs, at least be forward about that. So I do want to recognize President Hupp, you did open the meeting with a statement about comments and frustrations from the community and some backlash from a post that clearly were sent around your own personal beliefs. And I'm all for First Amendment, people allowed to have their own beliefs. But like you, I sit in a position of authority. I sit in a position that doesn't allow me the privilege to just have my own opinion on everything. Um, so you sit up here and you talk about how we're inclusive and how only after people brought it to your attention, you went and made a second post. I never heard the apology though. I never heard the ownership of that mistake. So I hope that as a parent in this district, as a teacher in this district, that whether I'm Christ-centered or not, I'm welcome on these committees. And while you made your statement, it's a little too little and a little too late. I'm gonna recommend you board members take ownership of the respect and recognition that you have in this community and the seats that you represent, and that you remove trustee Price, or sorry, Trustee Hupp, President Hupp, from her position, if not from the school board. There's been a clear violation here. That violation crosses so many lines, it, it would take me all night to go over them. But I think you've heard enough. I'm going to transition over to just to give you the gravity of the situation we're in here. So with me is one of our CTA state board members, Mike Patterson. 
He's going to speak a little bit with me about the legal context, the severity Travis, of this. Hang on. Travis, this is the RTPA President's Report. And this we, is. And, and we appreciate your time up here, and, and we have this. And this, please, and we'll have this conversation, and, and he, he can speak up and during 7.1 when we have all these, but this is the President's So report, under the please. governance of my union protections, Mike and CTA is allowed to be up here with me. So. So that's fine, but putting it another way, there are about 200 people who've come here to speak tonight. I understand that. So I that. hope that you'll be respectful of that. I, I will be respectful of that. So I'm going to invite Mike up here now. Thank you, Travis. Um, <laughs> President Tuff, members of the school board, Superintendent Stock, uh, I'm Mike Patterson. Uh, been on the CTA Board of Directors for eight years, representing 23 counties in uh, Northern California. Just want you to know, I've lived my entire life in San Joaquin, Butte, and El Dorado County. I am not a San Francisco or LA liberal coming here to Placer County to give you the CTA point of view. I am your neighbor in El Dorado County. It's really important to understand the action that you are considering is illegal. Your change in board policy is going to require the employees of this school district to violate the law to follow your board policy if it passes. How can you possibly put your employees in a situation they have to choose between following board policy and possibly being considered insubordinate if they don't, or following the law and protecting students? How can you do that as a school board? That is not your job. Your job is not to further your political agenda on the backs of the students and the employees in Rockland. If you pass this, CTA will immediately file unfair labor practice charges with the Public Employee Relation Board. We already have for several districts across the state. CTA has already been, been in contact with Rob Bonta, the Attorney General, that's already filed a lawsuit against Chino Valley. And I know you probably all heard on the news today that an injunction was filed in Chino Valley that that board policy cannot go into place. So I guess you'll be in the news again. What blows my mind is this board's willingness to waste taxpayer dollars in defending lawsuits for illegal board policies when the money should be spent on the children of Rockland, giving them the best possible education, but you're way more concerned with your political agendas than you are with educating the students in your community, and it's really quite deplorable. Don't waste taxpayers' dollars. Don't pass illegal board resolutions. You do not want to take on RTPA and the California Teachers Association, and you will if you pass this policy. I urge you not to do it, and with that, I will turn it back over to Travis. So again, I just want to reiterate, read the room, look at the environment. People don't show up because you're doing something good for kids, unfortunately, in these numbers. People show up like this because there is a problem that you have created, and they are fighting with everything they have to keep kids safe and keep Rockland schools excellent. Thank you.
Now to item 5.1, comments and report from student board representative Sophie Burns from Rockland High School. Sophie, welcome and will you please share your report? Good evening, trustees and superintendent stock. Here are a few updates from our schools. At Cory Trail, the Broncos are off to a great start with the second annual family picnic sponsored by their PTC. This school year, they focus to ensure all Broncos are connected and thriving. They are looking forward to many special events promoting a positive school culture and are excited to see the growth of their dual language program to first grade. Rock Creek kicked off their school year with popsicles with the principal and a meet the teacher event as well as a school wide rally on the first day of school. They are quickly learning and reinforcing their school wide expectations and are enjoying getting the year kicked off with positivity. September brings them their annual Red Hawk run. At Sunset Ranch, a student became heartbroken at Maui's recent fire and loss. Her parents and the PTC supported her vision by holding a bake sale, which raised $1,343 for the Maui Strong Restoration Fund. They are so proud of students like their fourth grader, Riley Epidendio, who stepped up as service leaders. To begin the school year, the Antelope Creek community embarked on an important service learning project to provide relief funds for those impacted by the recent fires in Maui. Fifth grade students, with support from their teachers, Mr. Castle and Ms. Root, sold lays before school to raise funds for those that were impacted by this terrible tragedy. Led by their fifth grade team, the Antelope Creek community raised over $1,500 for impacted communities to aid relief efforts in Maui. Also, Antelope Creek is proud to announce that the piloting phase for transformation into an art magnet program has begun. Nine teachers in their classrooms have begun to infuse visual and performing arts into their daily learning and teaching experiences. Piloting teachers also attend an all-day professional development in early August to learn new visual and performing arts strategies that they could bring to their classrooms. In the coming months, they will all continue to collaborate, learn, reflect, and create. In addition, the whole Antelope Creek staff has launched a book study on the element of art and how to infuse these elements into their daily teaching and learning. Students have already been provided lots of opportunities to learn and demonstrate their understanding of standards in all subject areas using different forms of art. They are excited to begin to share some of these finished products with the public in the coming months. If you walk the campus, you will start to see more and more art all around you, demonstrating the teaching and learning going on at Antelope Creek. Spark the Arts at Antelope Creek is off and running. Sierra Elementary is off to a great start. Their PTC has partnered with Boosterthon to help them build STEAM for their fund run, which is one of their biggest fundraisers of the year, and covers the cost of their second language instruction, which is a requirement of maintaining their status as an IB school as well as IBEAM training for their staff, PBIS incentives, assemblies, and so much more. Their teachers have been focused on building the classroom community and establishing positive peer relationships in class, on the playground, playground, and with their buddy classes. Teachers have also been conducting social, emotional, safety, digital citizenship lessons, core content lessons, and baseline assessments. They're excited for a fun year of nurturing globally-minded, compassionate, and balanced learners at Sierra Elementary. At Breen, kindergarten is having fun learning the rules on campus. Their purposeful people character trait, cooperation, using words in a kind way, singing the alphabet, and learning their numbers one through 10. Fourth graders participated in a yearly assembly called A Touch of Understanding. This is a hands-on program which builds empathy through interaction with speakers who have a variety of disabilities and use specific support devices. Whitney had an exciting summer being named Cal High Sports Division number two state school of the year for 2022 to 2023, the first time for a Sac Joaquin section school. They recently wrapped up a tremendous wow week with many community building activities on campus and ended with a great school-wide rally. They are now in the middle of I Believe Week, which focuses on students identifying when something is wrong with themselves or a friend. The week is in accordance with Suicide Prevention Week. The week is filled with giveaways, a school-wide assembly, and a campus decor. The students are gearing up for Club Rush scheduled for September 13th, where students can get involved with students who share similar interests. And now at this time, the Whitney president and I would like to make a joint statement at the podium. Good evening, trustees and superintendent stock. My name is Nayeli Glode, and I'm the student body president at Whitney High School. And I'm Sophie Burns, student body president of Rockland High School. We are here today to address a perspective of the student body that is against the new policy which will jeopardize the safety of our students and will also diminish the trust students have in their teachers and staff. (laughs) 
At both of our high schools, the main goal is to promote an environment that is safe, inclusive, and welcoming for all students, no matter gender, sexual, sexual identity, religion, race, or ethnicity. The new policy forces teachers to violate their students' privacy and alert parents if their child wants to use a different identity other than their biological one. Although, although this policy may seem like it is helping by informing parents of their child's identity, it instead puts teachers in an uncomfortable position on outing their students on a topic that should be addressed on the students' own personal circumstances and when they feel ready. In response to this policy, a Whitney student said, quote, this policy is not about protecting trans children by informing their parents about their gender identity. It is about taking away their privacy and trying to inhibit trans students' access to their right to be kept safe and protected within their schools and communities. No one, especially not the school board, has the right to dictate who a child feels comfortable enough to come out to. Come out to. <laughs> They also most definitely should not have the right to force teachers or staff into a position where they must jeopardize the relationship between themselves and their students because they are obligated to report back to the parents. This policy is unjust on so many different levels and it is astonishing that board members believe that they have a right to dictate such an intimate part of students' lives. A Rockland student said, quote, the parent notification policy being proposed by the Board of Trustees is a violation of trans students' civil rights. If Rockland Unified wants to continue to preach that school is a safe environment, then they can't reasonably pass this policy. By passing this policy, trans students will live in constant fear at school. Trans students deserve to identify at school as they please without being afraid of being outed to their parents, end quote. This policy not only has the potential to make our schools an unwelcoming environment where students may be isolated, but also introduces the fears of outing students to parents or homes that are not safe spaces. Instead of protecting our school's youth, this is putting them in danger of abusive households, depression, anxiety, and other unpredictable factors. It wouldn't be the first time that issues such as this invasion of privacy has occurred. Channing Smith, a Tennessee high schooler, took his own life in 2019 after being outed to not only his family, but his school. Is this the type of outcome we want to provoke by implementing this bill in our schools? This is not a rare case. In fact, it's a complete opposite. In the last couple of years, plaster suicide statistics among youths have already been rising. Introducing such an invasive bill that puts students into precarious situations will inevitably cause a spike in such numbers. The Rockland School District School should be to prevent such problems from taking place instead of adding fuel to the fire with such a risky bill. The truth of the matter is our school should not be the ones to deal with matters concerning a student's sexual identity it is not, as it is not an issue that breaches the jurisdiction of the school board. This creates a sense of stiff anxiety for both the student and the teacher that has to intervene. A student should be the one to decide what details about their sexual identity they want to share and to whom they want to share it with. All students deserve the same privacy and respect on campus no matter the circumstance. If anyone comes onto a Rockland Unified campus and is scared about being outed by a staff member on such a personal aspect of their identity, then something needs to change. Safety and privacy is a priority. Every student should feel comfortable at school because at the end of the day, that is the main responsibility of the Rockland Unified School Board. Not only does this policy create an unsafe school and home environment, but it, is also, it also directly contradicts the Rockland Unified School District's non-discrimination policy listed on their website. This policy states that, quote, the Rockland Unified School District is committed to equal opportunity for all individuals. District programs, activities, and services shall be free from unlawful discrimination, harassment, intimidation, and or bullying based on actual or perceived characteristics characteristics of race, color, ancestry, nationality, immigration status, age, ethnicity, religion, marital status, medical information, mental or physical disability, sex, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, gender expression, genetic information, or any other legally protected status or, or association with a person or group with one or more of these actual or perceived characteristics, end quote. These are all promises made by the Rockland School Board to the Rockland community. The United States of America as a whole promises the aspects of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
Why are all three of these American rights being stripped from us through an unnecessary policy that does not protect the students of this district, but also goes against the RUSD vows made to them? Our schools should not be a place of political or religious discourse, but a neutral location that is accepting to all. To close, we just want to bring up the district's most recent strategic plan result, 2.3, which states that their goal is to, quote, establish an inclusive culture where diversity and individual differences are valued and celebrated, end quote. On behalf of the student body, we ask you to please reconsider the damage of this policy will bring to our community as a whole. The RUC board must uphold their strategic plan and promises stated on their website for the sake of safety of students on and off campus. On behalf of the student body, thank you for your time and your consideration. <laughs> Thank you. Now to item 5.1, comments and reports, sorry. 5.2, comments from board and superintendent. Trustees, do you have board comments you would like to share tonight? So um, thank you for being up here. I know it's your first meeting, so great presentation. Great to hear about all the exciting events that are happening at our schools and the kids and and the amazing fundraising that was happening for the, uh, the burning victims in Maui. That was, that was really cool to see in here. So, and uh, great to have kids back in school, see sports going on, see just all the great events, uh, the week of welcome, the, just great to see things back in order. So thank you, thank you. Welcome, Sophie. What are your plans for next year? Just planning on going to college and possibly to pursue engineering. Awesome. Not sure where, but that's always been the goal. Yeah, you've got time, good for you. Welcome. Thank you for your um, being here. We appreciate you and welcome you. I just wanted to share with my colleagues, I, I, didn't re I didn't realize all the things that these other schools have done, which was awesome. I just wanted to give a shout out to uh, Coach Muscarella at Rockland High School. They, um, their team wanted to do something special and they were already headed to Hawaii and so they gathered together uh, $7,795 in Visa gift cards, which was amazing. And Coach Muscarella got in touch with Lahaina Luna High School, athletic director, PE teacher, and two coaches. And as they arrived in Maui, he was telling me that there was a short window. They had actually just a layover there. And they got through TSA really quickly, were able to, he thought maybe it'd just be a few players, but the entire team was able to meet with the coaches and the athletic director, uh, which was really fantastic, and give these gift cards to these kids. This school has um, 1,000 students, so they feel like it's gonna make a really big difference. And so I'm really proud of our students and our coaches at Rockland High School that did that. I uh, also wanted to um, just give a, a shout out to our community. We had an overwhelming response to our call for uh, community engagement with over 240, right? I think you told me um, parents, um, which is awesome. That says a lot about Rockland and that we have parents that are engaged and want to be on committees, and I really appreciate that. Last thing I wanted to say is um, I, I saw the garden at Brain that that family was recognized for today, and one thing that um, Mrs. Palmer didn't mention is that they have set up um, a garden docent program, which has made that program really um, sustainable because parents are coming in every week and helping teach those lessons, um, which is awesome. And I loved how she said they had a mighty few doing a whole lot of work. So a uh, shout out to those parents and we appreciate that engagement. Okay, well, good evening. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit more time tonight with my comments. First off, I do want to mention back to school nights. So I stopped by Springview, Granite Oaks, Rockland High, and Whitney High, and the turnout was really solid. So thank you to the parents who showed up. Thank you to the teachers who spent time putting together awesome presentations to help get everyone acclimated to their new school year. Thank you to our new student trustees for speaking tonight. Um, but I have to say candidly, it just, it feels, strangely awkward talking about school events right now and hearing all the great things that are going on. Honestly, it felt a little bit embarrassing to me to have a family come in who's done so much for our district in the midst of all of this going on. It just really overshadows it. 
So I want to take a little bit of time, or maybe a lot of time, to talk about why this room is so full tonight. So if attendance here tonight bears any resemblance to the emails that we've all been getting to our inboxes the last couple of weeks, we have people here tonight for a few reasons. So there are parents here who are upset about the inaccessibility of this board-mandated parent science committee group. You're right, we had a ton of people fill out the form because it turns out a lot of parents didn't even realize that this board recently rejected the previous recommendation that was brought to us with unanimous approval. There are likely people here who are, are here concerned about President Hupp's exclusionary call to action, which was made from an official school board social media account, which I think is a critical piece. I think it's really important that all RUSD families feel valued and represented by this board. Words matter, and I'm not gonna to speak to intention, but words matter. So when the board president asks for as many Christ-centered family focus, which, what does that mean, or principled parents as we can get, it signals that there's a priority on volunteers who share her personal values. <laughs> not, not simply to be represented, of course, but as many as we can get, that, that reads a different way. It shouldn't matter what any of us up here personally think about any parent in RUSD. Really, there are two qualifiers for volunteering. Are you an RUSD parent? Yes. Do you have the time and the desire to volunteer? Yes. Great. Thank you so much for volunteering your time. And then, of course, we have parents, students, and community members here about Action Item 7.1, which we will talk about later. I want to talk about the big picture. The common thread among these issues is that they have been introduced into our community by this board and actions by this board, not vice versa. Our USD parents did not approach the board demanding a deeper dive into curriculum selection. Our USC parents are not pushing for curriculum to be selected using a religious lens of any kind in, in our public schools. And most importantly, parents have not put forth a referendum to violate student privacy rights under the law. In fact, parents have pushed back on some of these board agendas, yet concerned parents aren't given any answers if they don't agree with the majority here. We had a petition of 800 signatures of parents concerned about science and wanting answers, and they didn't get any answers. <laughs> these culture war divisive issues just keep barreling out from this dais. The actions of the board are not reflecting the big interests and priorities of our district to the detriment of our students and the fabric of our community. I know that my colleagues will say, as they have say, said before, that they've received phone calls about these issues, begging them to take this on. And I, I'm not going to say that that's not true, but as I'm trying to put it into words, I thought I'm gonna try to illustrate kind of what I think about this and why I think that this doesn't serve our community. Okay, so it's something different for me. Okay, so let's pretend here we have a bell curve, okay? And so we have our normal mean and some standard deviations here. And this represents the big picture interests in our community related to our schools, okay? So I'm fairly new to this board, but I have been tuning in now for a few years, and I've seen what people organically show up for in large numbers, not prompted by the board, but on their own. And so that's in here. So we're talking about curriculum, and that's not always an easy topic, right? But it's important and it's very valid to what we do here for a school district. Okay, we have people that come out in, with concerns for programs, students and parents that want to see programs that they feel are important maintained. We see people come out advocating for sports and our quality sports programs. We see people come out for mental health. We see them come out to support each other, students and faculty members and the achievements that are going on. When I was going around knocking on doors last summer, Republican doors, Democrat doors, independent doors. I didn't get a lot of this culture war stuff. 
there were few concerns. And the ones that we did get were about bullying and the way that the district handles it. We got concerns. We got concerns about our school facilities and are they secure and are they going to keep our kids safe from outside threats? These are the big picture items that we all care about, we can all come together for. These are the things that make the biggest impact on the most students. Does that mean that these issues out here in the tails aren't important? No, not necessarily. Maybe these are smaller issues that get brought up at a school site that a principal handles, okay? Maybe these are things that are best handled talking parent and child. Maybe they're political issues that are best taken on by political activists who are trying to see if they can get these things advanced. We might even care about these things in the tales in our personal lives, and we're always gonna hear people out that have those concerns. But here, in this position that we have elected to govern over a public school board, the middle is where it's at. This is where I believe we need to be. Otherwise, Otherwise, you end up with a room like this, and you have angry people on all sides across the board. You have highly skilled, qualified educators and district staff that are scrambling to meet the whims of the board rather than doing their jobs that they're here to do, that we pay them to do, to educate our kids. I cannot overstate to the public the amount of time, energy, and resources that are getting pulled away from our students and poured into these fringe political aims. Legal representation and consultation doesn't come cheap. When you throw out a curriculum to try to find a new one, that costs money. We sometimes are making decisions that impact students that are just a few thousand dollars that make the difference. And we're making these choices day after day. So this room here are full inboxes, the people outside, the people watching YouTube, that is parent involvement. Whether this board agrees or not, people are activated, they're paying attention. I think that from our recent expansion on parent involvement, we are starting to learn some things already. Parents don't show up because the board mandates it. They show up because they care about things, because they feel that it's meaningful and impactful to their child's education. They come when it's accessible to them. They also come when they feel like something's going wrong and they have to. What I'm learning is that when we have sparsely filled boardrooms here, when we have committees and parent review nights that are sparsely attended, it doesn't reflect a lack of caring or interest. It, it reflects an implicit trust in the board and the district that the things are getting done and that the issues are handled appropriately. We are witnessing right now broken trust, and I believe that now my colleagues here are the ones that have to fix it. So to close on this issue of broken trust, I'm going to ask um, you, Superintendent Stock, to please clarify the procedure for how parents were chosen for the Science Committee, because a lot of concerns were brought up, and I would just like to clarify that for everyone. Um, trustees, uh, the process used was that the board, uh, I mean, the district solicited parent and interest in the, uh, for any of the advisory committees. Parents were given a, a information about each of the committees, uh, information when it would meet, uh, days time so they could make selections and prioritize their interest. Uh, we did receive 246 different parents uh, submit uh, interest to serve on committees. With the elementary science committee specifically, um, the uh, ed code requires that a committee that makes a recommendation related to curriculum be comprised of a majority of teachers. Um, and so the, the, we have, uh, on that committee, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, just teachers, we have some site administrators, district administrators, and parents. Um, we s were selecting five parents to serve on the committee. And the random process, we, we looked at wanting elementary parents because it was an elementary science. We also wanted to make sure that we had in those slots different schools represented, so no school has more than one parent on it. Uh, second, we wanted to ensure that at least one of the uh, slots was for a Title I school because of the unique needs those school communities have. And then we also will work to make sure that we had a, a difference in the grade span. So somebody from a younger elementary grade and parents from a little bit of an older elementary grade to make sure we had a well-rounded parent perspective. 
And so what we did is we took parents that had put in that as their first choice, because we asked parents to give us their priorities, and I think there were approximately 100 or so that had indicated that as a first choice. And then we, we used a random number generator, uh, and then we just pulled names until we filled the five slots using that criteria. And so we then worked to confirm attendance uh, in that. Uh, we actually had one parent that indicated they could not make it, so we then chose another name to fill those slots. And so that was the process that staff used and then worked to do that. And we wanted to, we, the board we knew wanted us to work on the science curriculum uh, as, as quickly as we could to bring a new recommendation. And so that committee actually had its first meeting today uh, with parents in attendance. And, and so we are working uh, on the other committees uh, as well. We'll be getting out information uh, to those um, in the next, next week, we anticipate. And we used a similar process of using a random a process to select names, and then we'll also have alternates as needed in case people can't fill in. And those other committees start up later, either at the end of September or October. Thank you. Um, so from what I understand with that, about 100 parents or so put the science committee as their top choice. And so we gave five slots. So I know there are a lot of parents who wanted to get involved and were willing to clear their calendar for those dates. How would you recommend, or is there a way for those students to, or parents to still be involved in this process? Um, there, there are uh, four additional uh, opportunities. Um, first is um, that the, we will be making a, a formal presentation to the board as an information item on the recommendation, and, and that is anticipated to occur in, I'm looking at associate, in uh, this fall, in, the recommendation? The recommendation the board will be in January. So it will come in January. At that time, there's parents can share, make comments on it. Um, also, once that's done, then we will also be holding a parent information night to give parents uh, an opportunity to interact with staff, look at the curriculum, answer questions. Uh, then uh, there's also, we will put up on our website uh, the opportunity to view the curriculum for parents. So in case they can't come in, again, we want to have access so they can look at it at their home. Um, they can come into the district office, look at it, hard copies here as well, but we want to make sure there's full access. And then we'll also list up uh, on that uh, the trustees' emails so that parents can give uh, their thoughts and feedback to the board directly via that. And then we also will, when the recommendation is presented as, a, as an action item for the board, um, then parents can also welcome to uh, you know, be at the meeting and, and share their uh, thoughts and, and, and I feedback with the board there. So there will be four opportunities outside of the committee for uh, parents community to, to share their input with the board. Okay, at, at what point would it be the right time to ask about that process with the emailing versus the form like we have had in the past where we are able to view all of the responses for parents who choose to participate? Would that be in January or prior? Um, it, it, the board could, you know, agendize that as a, as a, as a um, item for discussion on, on input related to that matter if it chose to. Um, if, if it was a, if the board wanted to have a discussion about that, I, I would recommend the board agendize uh, parent feedback on, on curriculum so the board could have a discussion at a board meeting related okay. to that. But uh, the staff is operating under the practice we used when we uh, most recently did high school science and French adoption uh, mm -hmm. based on feedback from the board. Okay, thank you. I would like to take a minute uh, just to echo thanks and appreciation to Sophie uh, for being up here. It's no easy task, especially your first night being up on a day is. And so thank you for making the time in between your studies to come out and represent uh, your students. It is always important for trustees to hear a student voice. And so I want to say thank you to you, Sophie. And then Nayali, if she's still out here, thank you. Thank you for coming, for taking the time to talk to students, to represent. You were elected to represent the voices of students on campus. And so I thank you for taking that responsibility tonight. Um, I have many other things I, I wanted to highlight, like a touch of understanding, um, uh, the art magnet pilot. Um, but the reality is we have hundreds of people that are waiting to give comment tonight. 
And uh, it is very clear that the role of a school board is to ensure that school districts are responsive to the values, beliefs, and priorities of their communities. And so because there are hundreds that are waiting not only in this room, but outside, and it is clearly already getting dark, uh, I will reserve my comments for 7.1 for when we get to that agenda item. Um, but I will say uh, that it is incredibly important that we remember that we were elected to hear from our local community. And so tonight, I look forward to hearing from our locals, from our parents, from our taxpayers that have concerns for their students. I hope that we can keep it student focused. I hope that we can remember that that is the role of the board. Thank you. Welcome, Sophie. I am actually on the committee with you, so I look forward to getting to know you better. Um, I, too, will reserve my comments. I see a very thick pile of people who would like to speak, and I do want to hear from every single one of them. So we'll stay here as long as it takes, and we will hear from every single person who would like to speak at this meeting tonight. Superintendent Stock, would you have some comments? Uh, trustees, just a few quick uh, pieces. Today, our students completed their 15th day of school, and this is our first board meeting since the start of the school year. I'm pleased to share with the board that we had an overall strong start to our school year and that our enrollment is approximately 150 students over last year. Um, we also successfully have begun implementation of increasing music education programs for all fourth, fifth, and sixth grade students. And, and we will continue to up the board as, as the year progresses. Also, a Trustee Price was elected to the Placer County School Board Association Executive Board for a three-year term, where she'll be working to support school boards throughout Placer County. And I also want to thank, uh, with the uh, incredible work of our custodial and maintenance staff, who have worked tirelessly uh, during the day, evenings, even weekends, uh, to address the variety of issues that come up as the school year starts to ensure the best learning environment for our students and teachers are there. And we really couldn't, couldn't start this year in the way we have without them. So we want to thank them. All right, thank you. Moving now to 6.1, the consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar are to be considered routine and will be enacted by one motion followed by a roll call vote. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless the Board of Trustees, audience, or staff request specific items to be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action. Any items removed will be voted upon following the motion to approve the consent calendar. Does any trustee wish to remove an item from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action? Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items? So moved. First by Trustee Price. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Counter. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Sophie Burns. Yes. Derek Counter. Yes. Tiffany Sadoff. Yes. Rochelle Price. Yes. Michelle Sutherland. Yes. Julie Hupp. Yes. Motion passes. Now on to item 7.1, action on revision to Administrative Regulation 5020 Parent Rights and Responsibilities and Administrative Regulation 5145.3 Non-Discrimination Harassment Superintendent Stock. Uh, trustees, um, just uh, to kind of quickly frame the issue, at the August 9th uh, board meeting, um, the board uh, requested to uh, rev have uh, a subcommittee of the board, which comprised of a trustee, a counter, and, and President Hupp, to review our board policies and administrative regulations that address parent notification with a goal of increasing uh, communication to families and parent notification. Uh, the subcommittee worked with legal counsel, and, and the result of that work is uh, before the board tonight with am amended uh, Administrative Regulations 5020, Parent Rights and Responsibilities, and Administrative Regulation 5145.3, Non-Discrimination Harassment. Thank you. Um, so Trustee Counter and I sat on the committee with um, Superintendent Stock and our legal counsel, and we went through carefully some proposed items and um, really went through it with a fine tooth comb. I'm, I'm, I know you have some things to say, Trustee yeah. Counter. So um, again, sat down, we agendized this, went through, is it 5020 and uh, 5143? 
walk through with the committee, with legal, walk through our own RUSD policies, looked at other district policies, looked at California law, Supreme Court law, assembly bills, education code, federal law, edits, red lines, rewrites. We, we threw some things up, we, we edited them, we, we rewrote them, we changed them, we modified them, we, we took a bunch of different perspectives on here. Um, there's some current, uh, it was mentioned earlier, there are some current uh, AG, Chino Hills policies that, are, that, that were referenced. Um, again, those are for them to review and, and they go through a specific process. There's issues of parent rights and student rights that are all nuanced to the state of California. Um, these cases will all go through California law and, and I'm assuming at some point maybe the, the Supreme Court. What we're looking for and what we wanted to bring up was how do we improve parent notification aligned students, parents, and teachers from an RUSD perspective. And I know um, we'll, we'll all go through different caveats and I know, again, folks, there's a lot of you in here and I'm sure a lot of you want to speak. There's a lot of people outside, so we'll try to get to that as fast as possible. Okay, so I'm going to read the way 21 is worded. So it says, at the top it says parents have the right, and 21 says to be notified within three school days when their child requests to be identified as a gender other than the child's biological sex or gender, requests to use a name that differs from their legal name other than a commonly recognized nickname, or to use pronouns that do not align with the child's biological sex or gender, requests access to sex segregated school programs and activities or bathrooms or changing facilities that do not align with the child's biological sex or gender. Notification shall be made by the classroom teacher, counselor, or site administrator. Such notification shall only be delayed up to 48 hours to full, fulfill mandated reporter requirements when a staff member in conjunction with the site administrator determines based on creditable evidence that such notification may result in substantial jeopardy to the child's safety. So what I want to point out is what it doesn't include. It does not say anything about a child's relationship with their counselor. It does not say anything about protected speech. It doesn't say that uh, if a child is talking to their friends and they um, say that they wanna use a different pronoun that somebody's supposed to run to the phone and call home. This is triggered only by the child requesting to change something the whole school. So it's not, everyone will get a chance to speak. This is not about a child's relationships. I actually have many students and friends um, who would fall under this, but not because they're not requesting anything. They're not asking for the school to change anything. I, in a lot, a lot of the emails that we have received, um, it's a very much overstated what this policy covers. This policy is actually very simple and it doesn't cover 90% of the things that we're receiving in the emails or that people think it covers. I question whether or not very many people have actually read and understood the policy. It Excuse says- me, Matt. Folks, 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 please. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please display appropriate behavior, please. We'll get to you, we will get to you. We will get to you. Everyone will get a chance to speak. Just wait your turn. So we will speak about this. The, the procedure for this is we will speak about this up here at the podium. And then once we're done introducing the policy, then everyone will get a chance to speak. Everyone who wants to will get two minutes at the podium. But first we have to introduce it, okay? So I had several people reach out to me and ask legitimate questions about the policy and not just assume a lot of things, but most of the people that reached out assumed a lot of things. This 
policy was looked at to include parents. We believe that the relationship between parents, students, and staff should be open. It shouldn't be a relationship where people are holding secrets and hiding things. Between parents, students, we're here for our families. We're not, we're not here to keep secrets and, tell, and lie for people. We're here for our families to love our families, and it is inclusive. It, it amazes me that people say it's not inclusive. What we're looking to do is include families all together. All right, so now board members, it is open for discussion. I know there's lots of questions and again, lots of comments that want to be made. And so rather than attempting to answer every question, I do want to start out with a why. I can speak for myself. I have had parents, I have had teachers, I have had staff members request this policy. The why for me is that studies for decades have showed that parent involvement increases the capacity of our students. We have study after study after study. For years, our own district has encouraged parent involvement. The data is quite clear. Involved, caring parents matter. When it comes to this policy, the easiest way I can communicate my why is, if there is not a notification, there cannot be a dialogue. We are asking, I am asking for dialogue. That is all. I am asking for dialogue between our staff and our parents. There is no existing state law that students have rights separate from their parent. I have met with several, I have met with several civil rights attorneys. Federal law supersedes state law and federal law is clear. Parents have a right to direct the upbringing, education, and care of their children. This policy, this policy to me is not about what children are doing on campuses. This is about informing parents of what the school is doing. The policy is very clear on that, that this is about how the school is handling these situations and communicating with the parents. CDE guidance is not law. We've been here before. We've handled arbitrary statewide mandates. Guidance is guidance. So until this is resolved in a court setting, I cannot overstep parent rights when it comes to the right, which is clearly stated in Cal Ed Code and federal law that they have a right to know about the education and the upbringing of their children when they are in a public school setting. I look forward to hearing from each and every person tonight, but I do think it's appropriate that we make clear why this is being brought forward. There has been many, many um, assumptions that are wildly inaccurate and inappropriate. I am speaking on this tonight because I have parents, teachers, and staff that have asked me to do so. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you will get your turn. You will get your turn. We have to discuss this before we turn it over to the public. This decision is not one that I take lightly. It is one that I've wrestled with and not only put a lot of thought into, but also hours of conversations proactively gathering information from a variety of sources and perspectives. It is complicated, emotional, and challenging for many reasons. I am grateful and empathetic to the concerns that have been shared with me via emails, texts, and phone calls, especially as we care for all of our students. We want them to feel safe, supported, and accepted, especially this typically most fragile group. When I say we, I mean everyone. I will give everyone in this room benefit of the doubt. That is why you're each here. That is why you're engaged in your child's education. 
I feel confident in our teachers, our counselors, our school psychologists, and our administrators. I have visited with a lot of them, and they have an especially amazing opportunity to connect with their students, and I feel like they are not only up for the challenge, they take it seriously and do a great job at it. In 2013, I was part of a district strategic plan committee. It was a fascinating process where teachers, secretaries, custodians, parents, and district staff worked together. I came away from that with a better understanding of district goals and visions. However, there was one thing that, la that left a lasting impression and reminded me of why the Rockland community and Rockland Unified are amazing. The people in this district are focused on excellent academics, and they recognize that education is a three-way triangle with the students, staff, and parents working together. I've kept that image with me the last decade working on various positions. For me, this issue remains as simple as that. That three-legged chair, students, staff, and parents, needs all three legs to stand. I love that students connect, and this policy still allows for one-on-one -on -one trusted relationships and conversations. I want that to continue. We have amazing staff who care deeply. And just like now, when a child requests to add a nickname to Aries or Schoology, the way this works is that a counselor or administrator communicates to them, your parents are going to be able to see this change. Most of the time, students say, okay, my parents already know and are already calling me that. Sometimes they say, hmm, I may not be ready for that. That opens the door for dialogue, for our school psychologists to have a conversation, a protocol that they already have in place. How can I help? Do you want some tools? Do you want me to be there to have this conversation? What resources can I connect you to? Rarely, and let me repeat rarely, is there a concern for safety? Most of us are parents here, good parents, and I'm going to give you benefit of the doubt that you're amazing parents. I refuse to assume that parents of Rockland students have ill will. It is my assumption that your child's well-being is the most important thing in your life. Part, being part of a major decision in your minor child's life is at the top of your priority list. It is my opinion the primary role of raising children, supporting them, and loving them is a parent's job, not the school's. Parents send their children to school with a level of trust. They trust that their child's well-being will be communicated with them as parents. Ask any administrator when there is a concern, big or small, the first thing that they do is call the parents and work together to support the child. The school and the professional educators are there to educate them and support them, but it is the parents' responsibility to have dinner with their kids, truly know them, and provide physical, emotional, academic support for them. I am not suggesting that 100% of time this happens in an ideal way. We have protocols in place, safety nets that have worked for years to help those families and students that may be struggling. I am, however, suggesting that we give parents the benefit of the doubt. We have amazing parents in this district, and they have to be part of a three-way triangle for our children to continue to learn and excel. Taking that into consideration, I am, some, I am supportive of these proposed policy changes. OK, well, I think um, some points made. And I think that the dialogue that you bring up about the name change is a perfect example of how that goes on right now with respect. And I really appreciate that you took time to go and talk to teachers and staff on sites. So I think that that's really um, great that you did that. Um, I will say, though, I'm disappointed that you all are choosing to follow this agenda that some other districts have put into place and are now already receiving issues with it. You know, I really feel like all that we've ever talked about here with, in terms of how we govern is local control and that we're gonna make decisions based on what's right for Rockland Unified. Since this item was brought to the table by Trustee Counter and seconded by President Hupp, as of, I don't know, 6 p.m. tonight, we received 184 emails in opposition to this and 22 in support. <laughs> Most of those in support, I mean, they truly seem to be well-intentioned emails from concerned parents. But I'm, I'm highlighting the higher opposition here, but I want to look at the big picture. We have tens of thousands of registered voters in Rockland, right? And we have 144 against it and 22 for it. That tells me 
even with all of you here and out there and phone calls, like this is still a, a fringe issue that's targeting a very, very small and very vulnerable group of our kids in Rockland Unified. And typically, I will be honest, I have the feeling of, okay, well, you know, these are public meetings, but I, I like to hear from Rockland residents and Rockland Unified parents and students. But it's a fact that there are other local districts and local communities who are watching tonight. It's relevant. I understand why the greater community would be concerned because if this passes tonight, it's coming for our neighbors, right? <laughs> but they're waiting. They're waiting to see how badly this blows up here for Rockland Unified. And then they're gonna decide whether to proceed or not. Do they want to subject their community as we are to this divisiveness and this media spectacle conflict and for some fear, I have to imagine? We're okay with that, I guess. We're just going to deal with the fallout later. We're taking the focus away again from the amazing work that's being done here. It's just, I still, it's so strange to me to hear these things at the beginning of the meeting and it feels like there's just this elephant hanging over it. We can't really focus our attention and our energy on these things that are being done when we have all of this going on. You all have called this an expansion of parents' rights because, of course, who is going to argue with that, with parents' rights, right? I want to understand what rights we do not yet possess as parents. I've looked over the Parents' Bill of Rights. We've got all of that. We have access to the curriculum taught to our kids. We can be free to visit their campuses. We can contact our local electeds and give them a piece of our mind, okay? We decide where we want them to go to school. If we want our kids to go to a school with people who look, think, act just like we do, we can do that. If we want to create an environment for our kids where we are monitoring every interaction they have, every move they make, we can, we can close them in and we can do that. That's our right. No one's going to stop us from doing that. In public school, parents aren't able to monitor their child's every action and conversation. That's true. That's not a bad thing if we agree that some degree of independence and autonomy is necessary to give kids room to learn and grow into thriving, productive young adults. The law agrees with the importance of student privacy and equal protections under the law at the federal and the state level. And, you know, to say, I mean, students here, children here in California at age 12 have medical privacy, right? For better or worse, it's not unheard of that we find ways to protect those who need it. That is why they exist, to protect the people who it has been shown over time because of bad things that happen that we need to put it in place. It's not an agenda, it's a protection. It's very easy to Google the poor outcomes for the physical and mental well-being of trans kids who are not protected. There are plenty, there's plenty of reputable data. I will agree, a supportive household, great, but I, it's, we can't guarantee that. And why are we going to put ourselves in a position to say that we can? It is a fact that trans kids are subjected to abuse, neglect, isolation by those who are supposed to care for them, who we believe should, but aren't. All of us sitting up here are parents. Of course, we all want our kids to feel comfortable coming to us and talking to us about anything that's on their mind, anything that's weighing on them. All of us here, I don't care what you believe, want our child to come to us right away if they identify as anything other than what we know them to be. We all want that. However, even in the most accepting households, a child might not feel ready to talk to their parents right away. Why are we going to put that on teachers to interfere in their personal life against their wishes? Yes, we will help as a district to give them the support they need to go to them. It should not be on the teacher. How then, imagine how that plays out for both parties, teacher and student, after doing something like that, and then they're supposed to still go into class and learn and teach and be taught like nothing ever happened? What does that look like? Is that productive? 
I cannot imagine a reality where a, an adult, say, is asked, what's your story? How did you decide to come out to your family? When did you do it? How? Oh, well, the, the school district did it for me. I wasn't ready. I told them I didn't want it, but they just did it anyway. That doesn't seem respectful of individuals' freedom. I want to know why this board, none of us up here have personal knowledge of what this experience is like, myself included. Why do we feel emboldened to make this decision for another human being? In the worst case scenarios, we would have teachers acting as the catalyst to turn a student's home life into a volatile, unsafe environment. And then we'll expect them to come to school and do their best learning. I, I implore you all to think about how this will actually play out. Like, what does this actually look like in real life? If, if, you, get, if you get this to, to be put into place, okay? You, do any of you really believe? Ex, excuse me. Okay, if we want the meeting to continue, then we're going to need to be behaving. There are a lot of people who wish to speak tonight. Let's be respectful. Let's let the meeting play out. We'll hear everyone. But let's be adults. We have children in the room. We're going to act like adults. Please, let's move on with the meeting. Keep your hands to yourself. Okay. Okay. Okay, you guys. I also want to say that I feel very uncomfortable with this adding of a 48-hour provision to contact CPS. I do not believe that that is an adequate solution to protect harm. What, what even is determined to be credible evidence that substantial jeopardy to the child's safety might occur? What, how would we know? Trustee so many Sutherland, times- I'm, You're asking a lot of questions. Do you want any answers or do you just want to keep asking? This I is I want our to just board meeting. We will speak to each other. It's fine. Relax. I, I she just is want, I just speaking. Want to, I just actually would just like to finish speaking. Um, a child choosing to wait to talk to their parents might be what keeps the peace. The introduction of this outing may be what causes this unsafe environment. And we would be the ones doing that. That is, it's scary. And a CPS investigation into a household, that's not gonna have negative impacts on the student who's then expected to go to school and learn. I don't believe that this policy helps anyone. And I think it potentially hurts someone, even one kid. This is not a hypothetical in our district. What will you all do and how will you feel when harm comes to them at their own hand or someone else's and your name is on public record as a yes vote on this? It's a public school here. Can we please just let kids come to school and be accepted at face value by their teachers? No, no judgment from the teachers who are there to just make sure that they feel comfortable to get an education. Let them feel comfortable to exist and be safe. I just want to say for the record, I believe we should take no action on this item and keep things how they are. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. But why are we going to introduce something that we know can cause kids to be unsafe? I know that this is uncomfortable for a lot of people. And I'm not expecting that everyone is ever going to agree on this. But being uncomfortable about the idea of trans kids or the fact that social media is so supportive of it and the fact that students figuring out who they are looks different than it does, you know, than it did 20, 30, 40 years ago, I get that. But we have to just think about safety and what we're here for, for education. I believe that if we must take action, why don't we just focus on parent empowerment? Like what we have here, we have this list of parent responsibilities in the same item. We could add language to the parent responsibilities, something like 
parents shall encourage regular dialogue with their child about their daily experiences and any stressors they may be dealing with. Because we're talking about parent-child relationships, not inserting ourselves into it. We can also offer trainings at future parent university events with people like marriage and family therapists or school counselors to give parents the tools to talk to their kids. I think that there are ways to achieve what you want and improving that dialogue and making parents more open. We could give teachers better skills to talk to kids. But this, I, I, I just, I think if any of you are open at all to talking about other options, please say so. Like, let's talk about some other options. Thank you. So, yeah. first off, so th thank you all for entertain for attending, for watching online, for taking time out of your family and kid activities and different things and choosing to uh, attend an RUSD meeting. Please be respectful. Please display, display appropriate behavior. Um, when we go to public comment on this agenda item, we'll, you'll have two minutes. We'll queue up folks, um, I think, at three at a time. So the person speaking will be the first name. There'll be a second person and a third person. As the second person moves up, please, as the third person's called, please move so we can expect this as much as possible. There are a lot of people inside and outside. Um, again, as, as Julie said, we're gonna try to get through and we wanna get through everyone here. We wanna get public comment from everyone. So please, please, please be respectful. Um, I can say just in final, um, teachers, staff, school does an amazing job of educating students, inspiring lifelong learners and problem solvers. Um, there's a lot of impact that teachers and schools have on, on every kid from that call it four or five age to that 17, 18 age where they're going through the educational system. Um, parents, teachers, and educators are a significant part of learning, decision making, and education that are involved in all of our students and all of our kids becoming adults. We want students to think, adjust, be creative, explore, try, error, try again provide effort, achieve, be courageous, engage, react, show empathy, show love, support, be kind, be happy, all those things that we've all said to, to kids in and out of our community and our own. This is why the communication between teachers and parents when anything arises is crucial to the success of all students. Nothing is different until the request is made, as we've stated before. Child success is a synergistic relationship between teachers and parents and keeping any part of the child's life confidential creates an unnecessary wall or barrier between the student, the teacher, and the parent. I respect all of you guys here and everyone out there. We wanna hear from everybody. Again, please be respectful. We'll have two minutes. Um, if you do have to move, get up, please do it in a respectful way. Try to keep it going. So Michelle, I just wanted to respond to a couple of things that you said. Um, one, I do take exception to the none of us have personal knowledge. I actually do. Um, I am not going to share personal stories, but I do have personal knowledge. And um, it is a very painful thing to be kept out of a child's life that you love and you want to support. You said several things. I, I wish I could have just dialogued with you while you were speaking because there were many things that you said. I think a lot of it is far overreaching what the policy says. And, and that, as did many, many of the emails that we received. Um, this is not about Let me just put it this way. There was a, a lovely young person who uh, in seventh grade decided that they had a lot of things going on and they made some decisions and um, they went to the school counselor. They worked with the school counselor for several months and then by the end of the, the several months, the school counselor worked with that child to um, speak to their parents and then the parents were called in and with the counselor and the child together they were able to discuss the changes that the child wanted to make this policy does not say that that can't happen it doesn't cover that at all 
This is on the other side of that, when requests are being made to publicly change pronouns, names, whatever. It's, it doesn't circumvent those relationships that are important and that can strengthen the child and that we encourage and we, we want the child to confide in teachers and counselors and administrators and whoever else they feel comfortable confiding in. This policy does not circumvent that process. It's only at the point when the child is requesting open changes from the school. So on, an, on another point, you said, what does that look like and how does it play out? I can tell you what it looks like if we don't have the policy because my experience was somewhere that didn't have a policy like this. And what it looked like was a school who decided that mom probably wasn't gonna be supportive because she was in the military and so she must be Republican or something. And so they decided to encourage the child not to speak to their parent rather than the other way around because they assumed the parent would not be supportive. They made that choice. They made that decision in a family where they had no right to do that. And so this mom was kept out of all of this process for a child that needed their parent. But the school decided that wasn't what the child needed. Well, and, and I understand that. And I think, but, but we're looking at Rockland Unified and that's not what happens here. But that's it not doesn't, what we do here. <laughs> That's not, so I've, I've Michelle, asked. Michelle, people are human. People are human. And they make mistakes. And they make judgment calls that they may not have the right to make. That's the point. It's parents' decision, not school's decision. And people keep saying things like, um, it's not up to the school. It's not up to the school. And I agree with that a thousand percent. It's not up to the school. It's up to the parents. And that's why the parents it's, need to be involved. It's, it's, up, it's, up to the, it's up to the student. Let us finish up, and then you will have your turn. It's up to the student. And I think it's still these, the judgment calls you talk about, that is not borne out by what is happening in Rockland Unified. And that is, again, why I just wonder why we are pulling from other districts and what they're doing where they may very well have that problem there. But that is not what's being done here. Our staff are supportive of students. They're always going to give them the tools that they, that they need. They're not, no one should be, and from what I understand, policy is, it's not a personal judgment call. These are not, this is how the student is coming to school. Again, face value. No one is encouraging or discouraging. It is just, you are accepted and we are going to educate you. But that's what's it happening also, here. It, it also requires though, that the teacher and the school take actions without talking to the parents. And this is only triggered when actions are being required to be taken. Nobody mm -hmm. is saying the kid can't come as they are, be supported, be loved, be taken in. This is only when the school is being required to take action. I, I, under, I, do, I do understand the language, Peace. but I think it is, it, it comes to Rochelle's Trustee Price's point about a teacher saying, a student saying, okay, I want to change my name in Aries, and a, and a teacher saying, oh, you know, if you do that, then, you know, your parents are going to see that. Oh, I'm not ready. If a student decides that they want to be called a different name at school, they understand that they're taking on some new level of openness that maybe makes it more likely that their parents will know. I think they are making that choice to take another step forward and then we are going to then force the rest of the way regardless we don't know what's going on in these kids lives and that is i don't think that you're wrong in concerns and i don't think that people i think everyone has their own experience and i didn't mean necessarily i meant our own internal experiences earlier because i lived on our own but <clears throat> i'm sorry i just i think this it's just risky, 
and we can just let kids do what they're doing and give them guidance and support and give parents the tools and give teachers the tools because that's what it's about, right? Parents want their kids to talk to them. So I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with you. And I think that they still can do those things. I don't think that this policy stops them from doing those things. And I just to finish what I was saying before, because you asked what does this look like and how does it play out, when a parent comes on campus and the child has been allowed to change their name and their pronouns at school, how does that play out? Does the parent then, well, I'll tell you how it plays out. The parent gets blocked from coming to the classroom because they might see the name tag is different than what they sent their child to school with. That, that did not happen in this district. Okay. That was my personal experience. But what I'm saying to you is that we are humans. And if we are requiring 600 humans to make these decisions independently without having it in policy, which again is only triggered when I the understand. child requests this. It's not, the teacher is not triggering it. The child is triggering it. We, this please, is the board ladies and is gentlemen, triggering please be respectful. It. I mean, this, it's, you're making a choice for the whole situation. It's, again, it, that didn't happen in our district. We're making decisions for Rockland Unified, respectfully. So I have said everything I need to say. Are we ready to hear public comment? We are ready to hear respectful public comment. And I will, um, is everybody ready? Okay. So there are guidelines for public comment. And if the guidelines are not followed, we end public comment. That we need to be respectful. So these are the guidelines, and the guidelines will be followed or we will end public comment. So please remember, this is a meeting, it's not a circus. Public comment is an opportunity for members of the public, public to address the Board of Education in open meeting. Members of the public are encouraged to address the board concerning any item on the agenda or any item of interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. The board will not take action or have discussions on any item not appearing on the posted agenda except as authorized by law. We are speaking about 7.1 right now. We note that the views and comments expressed during public comments are those of the individual speaker and do not necessarily reflect, reflect the opinions, beliefs, or positions of the district, the board, or district staff. The district believes in a welcoming and safe environment for its meetings for all of our community. The board respects each individual's rights to express ideas and opinions. However, we expect speakers to refrain from personal attacks based on protected categories under state and federal law, including race, religion, disability, or sexual orientation, Everyone is protected in this room. It is an ongoing objective of the district to serve all our students and prepare them to flourish as responsible, ethical, and productive citizens. In preserving this mission, we kindly ask that when making public comments, you refrain from the use of profanity, exercise tolerance of others and their viewpoints, and exemplify model behavior. Please be mindful that district students are watching. You're encouraged to address the board directly and the public in a respectful manner, such that all those observing from children to adults are made to feel welcome and safe and valued. The board will not permit any disturbance or willful interruptions of board meetings, persistent or accept Excessive disruptions by any individual or group shall be grounds for the board president to terminate the privilege of addressing the board. Under recently adopted law, disruptive individuals may be removed and excluded from the board meeting. We appreciate the public's participation and your assistance in helping the board keep its meeting efficient and effective. And we really do want to hear from everyone. And there are many 
many, many comments. We will probably be here for several hours. So I ask, please, that you keep your clapping short, you keep your cheers short, very short, so that we can move through and let everybody who wants to come up to the podium. Please, no booing or disrespectful behavior. Really, this is a board meeting, and we are interested in every single comment that wants to be made. I will, these are the rules, so if you wanted a comment, you turn in a comment card prior to the agenda item, which is what we're addressing right now. When you come up to the podium, please state your full name, the city you live in, and school your children attend. All comments must be addressed to the board. Please face the board when you're making your comments. Individual speakers will be allowed two minutes to address the board on each on this agenda item. We're not going to adjust the time that I know of. Um, and your time cannot be yielded to anyone else. So when you come up to the podium, your two minutes is your two minutes. Use it the best you can. And after two minutes, the mic will shut off and we'll move on to the next person. So prepare yourself for your two minutes. I will call the first speaker, and then I will tell you who's on deck. If you're on deck, can you please just go ahead and stand and be ready to come right up to the mic as soon as the speaker's finished? Oh boy, and I'll do my best on names, I promise. I think it's Rex Carpenter. Rex. All right. And on deck is um, Bill Asaley, Assemblyman Bill Asaley. You are on deck. My name is Rex Carpenter. I lived in Rockland for over 20 years. My children have graduated. I have a granddaughter going to Ike Middle School. I'm here tonight to ask you to do no harm. I know two ladies that are passing out food in Placer and El Dorado County to over thousands of people every month. Both these ladies are gay. Now here's their story. One mother when she found out her child was gay, told her grandpa to beat it out of her. Grandpa tried, it didn't work. The other lady, when her mother found out that she was gay, she went to her pastor. The pastor told the mother to throw the kid out of the house because she will turn the other children gay. The mother threw the child out of the house. Please don't allow this to happen to our children. Please do not harm them. Your vote, your action could harm our children. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I'm sorry. Up next is Bill. Thank you, Rex. And on deck is Sasha Oates. We don't organize the cards. Good evening, board. My name is Assemblyman Bill Asaley. I'm the original author of Assembly Bill 1314, which is the parental notification policy uh, that's being discussed and advanced throughout the state. I want to back up for a minute and explain how we got here. A lot of people think we are taking action. In fact, we are reacting to actions by the state. We are here today because bureaucrats, unelected bureaucrats, decided that they know what's better for 
children than their own parents. The California Department of Education issued guidance last year instructing school boards such as yours to keep transgender plans um, and actions of schools hidden from parents under an alleged right of privacy that they say children enjoy. There is no right to privacy between children and their parents. The Supreme Court has repeatedly reaffirmed that parents have a constitutional right to raise their children without government interference. So the central question is what authority does a school have to withhold information from parents? And we submit there is none. And what this whole issue is about is who gets to raise our kids? Who gets to raise the next generation of Californians? Is it the government or is it their parents? And it is their parents. And this is a fight we will take and it's a fight we want and we will take it to the Supreme Court. Today's ruling by one judge does not control. Uh, there will be many cases filed and many judges. Ultimately, this will land in the Supreme Court. And I'm confident there that they will reaffirm parental rights in the United States. And within the last few seconds here, I just want to commend the board for taking this up despite the strong minority opposition. There are hundreds of parents outside. There are hundreds of parents home right now with their kids, making dinner, getting ready for tomorrow, and they cannot line up here hours ahead of time. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Up now is Sasha. On deck is Alicia Watkins. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Sasha Oates. I am non-binary, and I have an experience that I feel like you should hear, especially as I was outed by my school. See, this was a note partially written by my school counselor. On a different note, Sasha shows signs of gender confusion. She is attracted to both boys and girls, but seems to identify herself personally with more boyish characteristics and feelings. Sasha has discussed her feelings regarding her gender directly with the psychologist and peripherally her research specialist teacher. Sasha tends to dress in an androgynous manner. This outed me before I was ready to my parents. Within a month, I was sent to Utah to undergo conversion therapy in a locked facility. And a month later, I was in a concrete room, naked and beaten and injected with medications. This is what happens when you out tra transgender students. This is not a hyperbole, this is an actual experience. I am living here, it did not change me. I am 30 years old, I am still non-binary. What it did teach me? What conversion therapy taught me was to hate myself, was that God didn't love me. It did not get me closer to the religion of my parents. It separated me. Instead, I was vulnerable and left out, and I did not trust my teachers after that. I did not get an opportunity to in the future, but I did not trust my teachers. I did not concentrate at school. I was always afraid, and unfortunately, that's the reality that many trans students live with every day. And not 73% of trans students endure psychological abuse from their parents and about. Time's up, thank you very much. Okay, Alicia Watkins is up. And on deck is Asher Palmer. Do we have Alicia? My name is Alicia Watkins. This is a letter from an anonymous Rockland student who didn't feel safe coming here. My best friend should be here to speak, but she's not here anymore. My best friend killed herself because her parents are awful people. They didn't beat her, but they shamed her, isolated, and emotionally abused her. My best friend was beautiful, smart, kind, and funny. She was a trans girl, born in the wrong body, but not with the wrong soul. That wasn't okay with her parents, because when they found out, they pulled her from school, took away her phone, and forbid her from seeing any friends. She killed herself before she was old enough to drive. Her parents didn't even give her a funeral because they said, he lived in sin and he died in sin. 
Well, the people who actually loved her gave her a memorial, and we will always remember her. I don't understand how her parents or churches or heartless politicians can live with themselves with the pain they cause. We're going to remember this when we're old enough to vote. We'll vote you out and shame you for being the worst bullies my generation has ever seen. Yes, you are bullies. You want to expose kids to cruel parents that already deny who their kids are. They, these parents say they don't care if their kids are LGBTQ+, but demand to know if their kids are trans. Well, safe parents do know if their kids are trans. You talk about parents' rights, but you say nothing about children's rights. Children have rights, too. If you can't honor our rights, what the hell are you doing on school boards? Signed a heartbroken Rockland student. And with my remaining seconds, I'll just say I think it's disgusting that this board covers up for abusive football players, but wants to expose trans students. <laughs> Up next is Asher, and on deck is Jen Brookover. Um, hello, my name is Asher Palmer. I go to Rockland High School, and I'm here today to speak for those who cannot and express my concern for this proposed action. Although I have a supportive household where I feel I can safely voice my opinions, I know many people who do not have that, and I would like to keep those people safe and protected. Um, out of kids and teens in the heterosexual community, 14% have considered suicide and 6% have attempted suicide. However, out of kids and teens in the LGBTQ community, 48 have considered suicide and 27 have attempted suicide. That is roughly four times the amount. Not having a trusted adult could leave these kids without someone to talk to, only spiking these suicide rates. I personally have friends who have tried to hurt themselves or commit suicide due to feeling unsafe or unheard in their homes. Even in a supportive household, members of the LGBTQ community could still feel these suicidal feelings and urges to harm themselves, me included. Students feeling unsafe in their home could cause developmental issues in alcohol and substance abuse, which are both very common side effects of growing up in an abusive, abusive environment. I personally have a friend who would not be safe in his home if he came out to his parents as trans. He would not be safe, his siblings would not be kind to him, and his parents would not be kind to him. And he does not feel safe expressing this at school, um, but my house will always be a safe place for him because I want him to be safe with himself. I hope you take my words into consideration and understand how unsafe children could become in their own households if this action is approved. Asher, thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. Now is Jen Brookover, and next is Beth Curtis. Jen Brookover, I'm a parent in Rockland. My kids go to Valley View, and I did read the entire policy. The policy is not about parents' rights. This is about targeting a marginalized group of children and the advancement of a political agenda. According to the Trevor Project, only one in three LGBTQ plus youth say they live in an LGBTQ plus affirming home. I'd share more stats about LGBTQ plus suicide attempts and ideation, abuse, anxiety, and depression, the percentage of unhoused youth, mainly due to their parents kicking them out of their homes, violence against them from their own families, and ostracism from their families and churches. But if you cared about these statistics, you wouldn't be proposing this harmful policy. Our students should not be used for personal political agendas. You're weaponizing our children for political gain. This policy violates privacy laws and anti-discrimination laws. You are well aware that this will open our district to lawsuits. In fact, you're courting it. Mandated reporters are required by law to report if they suspect any type of abuse. In this proposed policy, it states that there needs to be credible evidence to make a report. This completely contradicts the mandated reporting law. For those of us who are mandated reporters, we understand that we need to report even if we just have a suspicion and it's not our job to provide evidence. In this policy, it asks for the written permission from a student to inform their parents, and if a student refuses, you have the audacity to include, and I quote, it may limit the district's ability to address the student's need related to the student's status as transgender or nonconforming. So let's call this what it is. Putting politics above the safety of all students that you swore to serve. You also swore to uphold the California Constitution, which protects children's rights. You are putting the agenda of Moms for Liberty and other hate groups above the care and safety of students. Shame on you. <laughs> Thank you.
Up next is Beth Curtis, and on deck is Kurt Weidman. Dear honored board members, my name is Beth Curtis. I'm a private civil rights and employment attorney, and I live in Truckee. I also have a contract to represent teachers through the CTA Group Legal Services Program, meaning that I regularly represent teachers in your district when there are employment issues like layoff or discipline. Finally, I'm a parent of two girls who attended Placer County Public Schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. As a private attorney, I want to tell you that I agree with the Attorney General of the State of California that the amendments to the policy that you are being asked to vote on tonight are blatantly illegal, and I read the policy. On August 28th, so just over a week ago, the State of California sued the Chino Valley Unified School District for adopting a similar policy. I'm happy to give you a copy of the lawsuit. Um, if you as board members adopt this policy tonight, you're placing your district in a place to be sued by the state of California, which is a very expensive place to be. As publicly elected officials with a fiduciary duty to safeguard the district's funds, deliberately adopting a policy that you know will bring on litigation doesn't seem fiscally prudent. But in my most important role as the mother of an LGBTQ daughter who grew up and went to school in Placer County, I want to tell you how harmful and unnecessary I believe this policy to be. My daughter in high school came out to me and told me her identity on my own, or on her own, and that day was incredibly moving to me because she honored me by showing me how much she trusted me when she shared her identity with me. And I tried to honor that trust by accepting her as who she was and by loving her as exactly who she is, and I wouldn't change one hair on her head. She went on to found Truckee High's first high school pride club to create a safe place for other students who knew who were also LGBTQIA. That's your parental right, to honor who your children are, to be there for them when they're ready to talk to you. And if any teacher asks me for my advice, it's going to be to follow California law, not a board policy that goes against it. Thank you. All right. Up now is Kurt Weidman. On deck is Josephine Topping. Thank you, board. Uh, Superintendent Stock. Um, I did want to talk in support of the policy change. Uh, one thing to remember in, in California, uh, the age of majority is 18, and we're not talking about, I don't know if we should really be using the word students, we're talking about children at this point. Um, children in the state of California have limited rights. Most of those rights are vested in, in parents. Um, there's certain things at the age of 18 that you get to, that you get to do. Uh, you can enter into binding contracts, you can vote in federal elections, you can vote in lo local elections, you can enlist in the military without parental consent, you can marry without parental consent, you can make medical decisions without con uh, parental consent, and this is all in California. Um, you can buy lottery tickets. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of things that you, at 18, that you can do. Um, one thing that's important to believe that we believe we're protecting the children from those who destroy their innocence and exploit them for their own purposes. On the whole, parents are the best protectors of children and have the natural right and duty for the care, custody, and control over their children. Children, in the main, are naturally incapable of exercising self-government until they reach the age of majority. So I would like you to reinforce really the law of the land and this policy doesn't run against that, and it doesn't run against the, the uh, state of California's laws either. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Up next is Josephine, and on deck is Stephanie Gomez. I wanna start with saying that I'm so grateful for the students who know how valuable enough they are to attend this meeting and to speak for themselves and for those who don't feel safe to do so. This is amazing and really encouraging, thank you. I also am grateful for Travis Mujet stating that so eloquently and factually what is felt by the majority in this room and in the community and that the CTA is willing to file a lawsuit regarding this discriminatory regulation. As a queer member of the community, I appreciate the work that you are doing for today and for the future. I would add that those who are asking for this discriminatory regulation not only in the community but here on the board are the very humans the trans youth need to be protected from. The control and power that is attempted to be exerted here is fueled by those in the religious right in this community and on this board which was clearly uh, demonstrated by Ms. Hupp 
when asking for Christ-centered families on boards, which was then backtracked when realizing the misstep engaging the community response. Some in this board clearly have an agenda are quite loudly supported, encouraged by pastors and communities, uh, uh, church communities, and I don't understand how religion should have a voice in the public educational institution, and I'm glad that lawsuits will be brought. And lastly, I would like to say, most importantly, regardless of all of this that is going on, the queer youth who sit here today and who are listening online, I want you to know, and I want to reiterate, you are loved, and you are beautiful, and you are valued, and that your, existent is, your existence is art, and glorious, and no matter what the bullies inside or outside this room say, you're perfect. And you have the right to determine when or if you ever come out. I am honored to be in your presence, and I appreciate all of you. Okay, thank you. Josephine, up next, Stephanie, and on deck, Marcy Johnson. Thank you, my name is Stephanie Gomez, and I'm here as a parent of two Rockland students, one who just recently graduated from Whitney High School, and the other is a third grader at Quarry Trail. Um, as a licensed clinical social worker, I have an ethical obligation to articulate that this is a very dangerous proposal. I wanted to tell you that this amendment is a blatant violation of California Education Code and AB, AB 1266, but you already know that, and you don't care. I also wanted to tell you about um, the LGBTQ youth are four times more likely to seriously consider suicide, but you already know that and you don't care. So I wanted to just point out, as a licensed clinical social worker, all it takes is one suicide to spark an epidemic in our community. They can be contagious, did you know that? It happened most recently in Palo Alto and in Clovis. And before you proceed with any vote on this amendment, I would refer you to the January 2020 article published in the Lancet Medical Journal on clustering suicides in children and adolescents. This proposal is putting children at risk of dying. I'm also concerned that if you pass this amendment, we're going to see a mass exodus of our most skilled teachers and counselors they value building trusting relationships and providing safe spaces for our students to learn and develop. But based on tonight and my email correspondence, you've made up your mind. You're not going to listen. So my public comment is intended to support all of the beautiful non-binary students in our community who need to know that there are so many adults here who love you and care about you. Please come to us. Come to us. We will be your safe space if the school can't. Thank you. So yes, Marcy Johnson, and then after Marcy is Rivers, I'm not sure how to pronounce, Apodaca? I'm sure you're used to your name being mispronounced. Am I ready? Ladies and gentlemen, please be respectful. Marcy. Marcy. The so I actually heard that I was on deck. I, um, I actually gave up my seat because I thought it was really important for you guys to hear more from the students who these policies and these revisions are impacting. Um, I will say from my perspective, Hup, as somebody who just posted something about your religious counter, as somebody who liked that comment, I really don't trust your guys' judgment when it comes to making these revisions for these students. You don't know what they're going through. You don't understand. They're here telling you. And if you really want to hear about our community and you really want to hear from the people that this is impacting, then I suggest you guys listen. Because in my opinion, they're what, they're what, they're what matters here. And they're telling you what they want. And if you don't listen to them, then you are putting everybody's needs before them, and that students are who you're here to protect. So, thank you guys. Rivers, I meant no disrespect. I get my name mispronounced all the time. On deck is Price Johnson. 
Good evening. My name is actually Barbara Smith, but I am here speaking for Rivers Apodaca, who's not here this evening. And I can't wonder but if the reason Rivers chose not to come tonight is because they didn't feel this was a safe space. Forcing teachers to tell a student's parents about their sexual and or romantic orientation or their gender identity can effectively destroy relationships between a parent and their child. If that parent is of the belief that their child is this way as a choice, out of rebellion, and in some cases, they think that it is a sin and that God doesn't approve. Not every child is in a safe household. Not every child has the safety of coming out to their parents. Not every child is ready for their parents to know these things about them. However, every child does deserve their right to privacy, and every child deserves to feel safe at school. Some children get kicked out of their homes for being LGBTQ+. Rivers is part of the LGBTQ community, and while Rivers is out to all of Rivers' friends and Rivers' mom, that doesn't mean that Rivers won't be affected by this policy. For all these reasons and many more, please reject this policy. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is Price Johnson and on deck, Mark Baer. Great. Hello board, hello Rockland community. Uh, first of all, I just wanna say, Sophie, thank you so much to you and all your peers that showed up today and made a statement and represented your classmates and your peers as someone who, when I was in high school, we had maybe one or two secretly you know, LGBT um, identifying students, and that was a very secret thing. I know that takes a lot of courage, but I know it's getting easier day by day. So just thank you all so much for showing up today, and board, I just wanted to recognize them. Uh, secondly, I am Price Johnson. I'm showing up today as a father of two in the Rockland Elementary um, School. Uh, I do my best to try and volunteer daily. I'm a cleared adult on campus. I attend every field trip both of my children attend. Uh, I also run a weekly uh, board game club for the, for the children where we teach critical thinking. We teach a number of, of different concepts that they really enjoy and, and find uh, compelling. But I, I'm here today because I am just appalled and I'm disappointed and I'm hurt that this board showed up today with prepared statements that they were planned and prepared to move forward with this. When we have hundreds of your community out here, I didn't come with a prepared speech, but I did take a couple notes of a few of the comments in your opening statements. Uh, Hup, you said you found it astonishing that, you didn't, that we didn't consider these policies inclusive. Well, I would suggest that a, an ad hoc committee of yourself and trustee counter does not make for a, a diversive or an inclusive committee to review any type of policy that infects an entire community that we have here in Rockland. So I, I would first of all just rebuke that. Secondly, um, Trustee Safoff, you mentioned that there can't be dialogue without outing children to parents. I would strongly disagree. That conversation should be held between their parents and those children. That should not be a conversation originating with the teachers. Uh, so I, I completely agree with you on that. And uh, lastly, Hup, I just wanted to say, um, you know, you said this is a simple policy and you emphasized how simple it was. Well, guess what? This is not a simple concept. This is a very nuanced and complex cultural situation. Okay, thank you, Price. Up next is Mark Baer and on deck is Barbara Smith. Hello, my name is Mark Baer. Every student, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity, deserves to feel safe, welcome, and respected in their academic environment. This is why it is so important to not pass this bogus policy that takes these kids' basic rights away. In turn, this policy will make these kids' lives so much harder than it needs to be for them. Students that are a part of the LGBTQ plus community are already at a severe disadvantage. I lost a friend of mine when I was 18 years old. He took a shotgun to his head and shot and killed himself right in front of me, all because he was gay and was bullied and harassed all throughout high school. Please hear this. This is not a cry for just students that identify as LGBTQ+. It is a pri privacy for every student. 
However, we must first fight for the rights of the students that are under attack. To all the LGBTQ students in this district and other districts in the area, we love and support you. We will not stop fighting until you have the same rights as every student. Please throw this out. Thank you, Mark. Barbara, I just want to point out that there are hundreds of people waiting, and you have already had a moment at the microphone. I appreciate that, but these are my words. These are not someone else's words, so I think I deserve time to speak. Trustee Hupp, I would like to request uh, that we please discuss this because it was clearly stated at the beginning that somebody is not allowed to uh, relinquish their time to another individual, and I'm incredibly thankful for every community member here tonight. I would like to hear from everybody. I would like to request that anybody that has already spoken, please wait until all have spoken, and then they are welcome to a second round if we have time and availability. Perhaps if any of you besides Trustee Sutherland had answered my emails, I wouldn't feel compelled to come up here and speak to you in person. Start the clock. We, ha we have in the past seen people come up and speak as a proxy for those who don't feel but comfortable coming. But not again come up. This is the problem with, literally this stack is this thick. I'm just asking you to have consideration for your community. There, there are uh, hundreds of people outside waiting to speak. It's, it's, it's our policy that you get two minutes. Exactly, exactly, yeah. No, we don't have, I mean, this is the discretion of the board. What is he saying? So we do ask that all people in the room respect the board procedure and we have many, many people on deck. This is especially important for those children. Next up is Ellen DeBach Riley. Okay. This okay. is a board meeting between school board members. We would like to make ourselves available. However, if we are unable to have decorum in the room, then we must call for a recess. We will recess for five minutes.
trustees. And we would like to hear from everyone in the room, everyone who put in a card. So let's please continue in a respectful manner, respecting each other's time and um, turn. So right now I have Ellen DeBach Riley, and on deck is Boomer Bennett. Ellen, are you still here? Is Ellen still here? I can put her after. We can bump. Do we have we'll Ellen in the room? All right, then All right. I am going to move her to next. And Boomer Bennett, you're up. Hey, awesome people. Appreciate you guys. Um, Roger Stock, you're awesome. You're amazing. Um, so uh, while we were, while you guys were talking, some students uh, that go to Rockland and Whitney, um, they wanted to make sure that I said that there are many students on both sides of this issue, and they talk about this issue at school with awesome dialogue, and there is no, there's none of this amongst the students who are on both sides of the issue, so it seems like students are mature than we are nowadays. Uh, so... Each teacher, educator, and administrator has given me full consent to use their words and phrases, but not have given me consent to use their name out of fear of retaliation from coworkers and community members who might disagree with their positions. Teachers, educators, and administrators are going weary of playing the role of parent and where they have, when they have only been trained to be educators and advisors. These teachers, educators, and administrators uh, believe the best way uh, for a student, for their students to succeed is for them, uh, is with, is for them to partner with their parent when it comes to their mental, physical, and spiritual matters concerning their students. These teachers, educators, and administrators are growing frustrated and confused at why they are being burdened to be the parents and make parental decisions uh, with children that aren't there theirs. And this is the one that hit home for me and uh, my community. Many of these teachers and administrators have chosen actively not to be parents themselves. However, they find themselves on the end of making decisions as parents. Uh, these uh, teachers, educators, and administrators are desperately and fervently seeking this motion to pass so that they continue to be educators and allow parents to continue to be amazing parents to these amazing kids. Thank you. Thank you, Boomer. Do we have Ellen? Okay, so Ellen is up now, and after Ellen is Jessica Hardy. Forgive me, I was taking a bio break. Didn't hear my name. Um, Ellen DeBach Riley, I'm here to ask to state that your number one job is to protect students, especially vulnerable students. The proposed policy to out trans students will only harm them. Trans students with supportive parents already know their child's preferences. Only non-supportive parents will be surprised by these notifications. There's a reason they don't already know. As a lesbian who grew up with non-supportive parents, I know the anguish and fear that that creates, and it persists to this day. These students know the danger better than any of us. Only these students will be affected by these policies. It helps no one. By the way, September is Suicide Prevention Month. I urge you to reject this exclusively harmful policy. Thank you, Ellen. Up now is Jessica Hardy and on deck, Katie West. My name is Jessica Hardy. I'm a third grade teacher and the current Rockland Unified Teacher of the Year and Placer County Teacher of the Year. 
I've spent the past few months representing Rockland Unified on a very clear platform of equity and inclusion. And I believe we've done some really important work these past few years with the support of Superintendent Stock, training from Mr. Limoges and Dr. McDonald. Teachers have implemented that training back in their classrooms and we're truly working toward making a difference for the safety and inclusion of all of our students on all campuses. I have learned that inclusion is a verb, it is an action. As public educators, we strive every single day to have students feel safe, supported, and seen. Seen for exactly who they are, no matter what that looks like. By proposing this board policy amendment, we are jeopardizing that very safety and undoing so much of that work. Sometimes when we get caught up in policies, we forget the real stories of the students they affect. When I taught in Southern California, I had a student who was very gender non-conforming. He played tea parties at recess, borrowed glitter bows, asked me to call him by his first initial only at school. And now you might feel more comfortable if he wanted to be a football player instead of a makeup artist when he grew up, but I didn't bat an eye at this. You see, to me, this was not a sensitive issue. I think we will truly hit a milestone in our district when sensitive issues aren't sensitive at all. And these children can choose to simply exist exactly how they are and how they feel inside without the fear of judgment, hate, discrimination, and putting their very lives in danger. I knew this was simply a child engaging in pure self-expression in a safe place. A few years ago after graduation, the student reached out to me. He told me that he came out to his parents in his own time, telling them who he was and who he had always been. He was kicked out and attempted suicide, a reaction I could have predicted well over a decade ago. Now I'm a mandated reporter of many things, which I take very seriously. Self-expression is not one of them. I'm asking you to trust us. Trust us as professionals, as teachers. Trust us to keep students safe. Trust us to have personal connections with students and make decisions in their best interest. Trust us on curriculum decisions. Thank you. All right, up now is Katie West, and on deck is Joseph DiGiordano. West, and I'm a I live in Rockland, California, and I'm a parent of Cobblestone Elementary School. I'm a Rockland kid. Having moved here with my family in the summer of 1987, I've attended Parker Whitney, Rockland Elementary, Springview Middle School, and graduated from Rockland High School in 1998, and then went on to graduate from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in 2005. My husband and I could have moved anywhere within the Sacramento Bay Area region with our careers, but we chose Rockland to have our future children have the excellent education that I have, have had growing up. Our daughter is now a Rockland Unified, Student, and we have been amazed by the outpouring of educational excellence from all of our teachers up to this point. Rockland Unified strategic plan sets an explicit goal to quote, establish an inclusive culture where diversity and individual differences are valued and celebrated, end quote. My husband and I, as well as many others that we know personally that are not here tonight because they're taking care of their families, are deeply concerned with the direction and current board is attempting to move this district. Board President Julie Hupp's recent public request quote, we need as many Christ-centered, family-focused parents as we can get on those curriculum committees, end quote, is inappropriate, discriminatory, and a violation of our oath to serve all the members of Rockland's educational community. Hupp's request honors neither diversity nor celebrates individual differences. In addition to the board president's faith-based agendas, the proposed amendments to Administrative Regulation AR5020 and Administrative Regulation AR5145.3 in board item 7.1 of tonight's board meeting creates an environment where teachers are made to be big government officials and attempts to spy on our children. Our children have the right to privacy and our schools should not interfere in our children's unique individuality. As a concerned parent and member of this community, I implore you to put your own political agendas aside and act in a manner that reflects the long history of educational excellence, stated above your heads, that Rockland Unified has always re represented. Please do what is best for all of our students and their families and reject the proposed amendments to board item 7.1. Shame on all four of you. Thank you, Katie. Up next, Joseph. And on deck, Luca Thompson. Appreciate you guys having us here today. I'm sad to hear about all the pain and suffering individuals in our community have, have gone through. Um, my name is Joe DiDordano. I am a Placer County resident. My student, my children are within the public school system here. I was not handed a prefabricated letter and directed to inform the audience that this is from an anonymous Rockland High student. These are my words. 
I am also a licensed mental health individual. I understand the impact and importance of healthy family involvement. I've served as children, families, and adults for over a decade within this capacity. I've worked in the after-school system as well previous to that for about 10 years. As a parent and as a professional, I am in support of amending this administrative regulation. Amending this is not outing anyone. Amending this is opening up communication between the student and school. And if the student chooses, the school will notify the parents. I support increased parent and school involvement and collaboration to meet everyone's needs. This is called a CFT meeting, child family team meeting. And our community could benefit from a little more of those. I'm glad for Rockland to continue to light the way. I support amending this. Thank you, Joseph. Up next is Luca, and on deck is Jennifer Choi. Uh, hello. I would say that this is uh, nice to be up here, but let's be honest, I should not be up here having to tell grown adults that this is a bad idea. Um, <laughs> um, I have kind of a question for the four of you. Um, what's your backup plan for when this blows up in your face? Like, like, like genuinely. Um, multiple districts have already tried this and they're already being sued into the ground by the state of California. So I don't know what makes you guys think that this district in particular is special enough to pull this off. Because really it's not, it's just another school district. Um, second of all, are you gonna take responsibility for the fallout? Like when kids start getting disowned, when grades start falling because kids are too busy hiding themselves from their parents, or when the suicide rate spikes, are you going to take responsibility? Or are you going to do what this district seems to excel at and sweep it under the rug and pretend like nothing ever happened. I am tired of seeing my friends having to hide themselves from their parents already. Are you really just willing to make that worse? I, I, I seriously should not be up here. You are grown people. How would, I am just baffled by the fact that like, like, one of, like one of my friends uh, uh, down there said, I'm a kid, I should not be having to deal with this right now. Why are you making us? Just, you're adults, figure it out yourselves. Thank you, Luca. Up next, Jennifer Choi on deck, Macintosh Morgan. Good evening, my name is Jennifer Chow, uh, and I am an attorney with the ACLU of Northern California. We at the ACLU are deeply concerned about Rockland's proposed policy. California students have the right to a safe and welcoming school environment and the right to keep their personal information private. Numerous courts have held that gender identity and sexual orientation are among the most intimate and private details of one's life and are protected by the Constitution and students do not waive their reasonable expectation of privacy simply by being out at school. Moreover, policies that target or invite targeting of students on the basis of gender or sexual orientation are prohibited by state and federal anti-discrimination laws. In fact, just this morning, as others have mentioned, a California court affirmed this by blocking a similar policy from Chino Valley Unified. In ruling, the judge expressed serious concern that these policies single out a protected class of students and potentially expose them to clear and present danger when they are outed without their consent and before they're ready. Ideally, young people will feel comfortable sharing their gender identity with their families and many parents do respond with compassion, acceptance and support. Unfortunately, not all young people are able to be their authentic selves at home safely and studies show that even having one trusted adult in their lives can significantly improve an LGBTQ young person's ability to thrive. Policies like this one break down trust at school and impair students' ability to explore and discuss their identity at school as a part, as a part of preparing to discuss it at home. In the last year alone, there have been at least five lawsuits addressing the issue of forced outing in California 
And from those lawsuits, we have had two decisions, the one from this morning and another one from July in which a federal judge upheld Chico Unified's policy. Jennifer, thank you. Up next is McIntosh Morgan. And on deck is Jennifer Treador Morgan. Make a difference. My name is McIntosh, one of the presidents of the LGBTQIA Plus Alliance Club at Rockland High School. When I was first discovering who I was, I was outed by a close friend who, to people at my school. I was 11. Many of the people who were closest to me began to distance themselves. Those who stayed were told I was going to turn them gay. Since then, I was able to come out on my own terms. Since then, I can no longer count on my two hands how many times I have been harassed at school for being transgender. Our schools are not a safe place for the transgender community. There is absolutely no way the school can determine whether or not the child they are outing lives in a safe environment. By approving this policy, you are also guaranteeing that the schools, the child's school is even less of a space safe place safe place for them to openly be themselves. This policy is dangerous and will only do harm to the students. I urge you to make the right choice and reject this policy. Thank you. Thank you, McIntosh. Up next is Jennifer and on deck is Joe Smith. Hello, my name is Jennifer. I'm a social worker. I'm also a parent of three kids attending Rockland schools, elementary, middle school, and high school, two of which are queer. I urge you not to pass this proposed policy to out queer kids for wanting, just for wanting their identity to be affirmed. It comes from a place of privilege to believe that families won't be harmed by this policy. Regardless of the platform of the election that seated you, as public school board members, you carry the burden of protecting and serving all students, especially those on the fringes, such as queer youth. It is irrelevant to align their existence with our, your ideologies. Let's talk instead, let's talk about the life and death impact on queer youth who are denied name and gender affirming care, which is what you are doing. You, they either get outed and have gender affirming, or they're just not. They're just denied their identity. You already know that adolescent risk, adolescent suicide is the leading cause of death, but trans youth, as several have mentioned, are at four times greater risk of suicide attempt, in part due to gender dysphoria. While non-queer teens are concerned about things like career choice, the top three concerns of queer youth are unaccepting families, school bullying, and a fear of being outed, which you are proposing to do. Schools are supposed to be a safe haven. Queer youth must precariously navigate where and with whom they come out. In fact, 20, only 21% of queer youth in California are out to their parents. One in four homeless youth are queer. Why? Jennifer, thank, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Up next is Joe Smith. And on deck is Jay Smith. Opportunity to talk. Somebody mentioned earlier why is this policy being proposed? I'll tell you why. This is the local version of the national attack on transgender rights. It's based on religious dogma and political dogma. And those of you that are in favor of this, I want to know. And look at me while I'm talking to you. Show a little respect. Julie, I'm addressing you. 
Have the courage to I, look I'm at actually me. writing your words have down because respect. I think they're have important. Have some respect as a speaker. I don't really think you think my words are important. That's not the point. The point is, what happened to your guys' soul? You guys are all pre pretend to be Christians and care about the kids. How are you showing care and concern? You've heard. You've seen all these people. You know the damage this is going to do. Give it a rest. You guys are never happy unless you're making life difficult for the transgender community. First, a landing spot. Now this. What next? How much are you going to torture them? Thank you. Up next, Jay Smith. On deck, Natalie at Panley, maybe? I'd like to take a moment of silence for all of the LGBTQ youth who are no longer alive, no longer with us, or didn't feel safe enough to come and share their stories. School is supposed to be a safe space for all students. It is in every student handbook that discrimination will not be tolerated. As adults, it is your job to protect every kid, celebrate them in whole, and guide them safely to adulthood. This policy is violent, immoral, and illegal. If you out a kid to a bigot, they will be beaten, kicked out, possibly killed. If not by a bigot, by the streets they're banished to or their own hand. They will be ostracized, harassed, and assaulted. This will lead to dropouts and suicides. Futures will be thrown away for the crime of authenticity. Their blood will be on your hands. You are waging war and we will not take it quietly. We'll come for your jobs. We'll shame you in public. The district will be, the district will be sued and the funding for schools will be going to lawsuits in vain because discrimination has no place in California law. Just ask the state attorney general. Take our kids' futures and we'll take your livelihood. Shame on you for wanting to violate Title IX and endangering kids. Jay, we don't take threats up here. If you want to talk about the issues, that's great, but threatening the board members is not how we work around here. It's not a threat, it's a promise. Up next is Natalie, and, but we're gonna pause for a second just to say we need to take a breath we are here to hear you. We are listening to everyone who gets up to speak. You don't need to scream. You don't need to make threats. But you are welcome to come up and say everything you have prepared at the podium. So now we have Natalie. And on deck is Carrie Funtham. I think that was taken out of context. Michelle. I want to say thank you. It is not easy to stand in your position right here. You're not tone deaf to the needs of the community, and you're compassionate. You're obviously here for the right reasons, and I just want to say thank you. Um, I'm reading something from a youth who was indeed outed. Um, they're 15 or 16 years old, and I'm just going to read what they wrote. Um, they, they do not go to public school anymore, so there's that. I'm a transgender man, and I was outed by my school five years ago. I want you to close your eyes and imagine something with me. Imagine you're a kid at your elementary school, playing games with friends, learning new things, checking out library books. But suddenly one day, the principal finds something out about you and forces you to tell them. But they tell you not to worry at all. What's said in this room stays in this room. And now imagine in horror, as the principal tells every single person at your school, what you were forced to tell them. And now a spotlight is on you. You didn't want it, but you can't get out of it now. People are coming up to you saying cruel things, asking invasive and uncomfortable questions, but it's okay for them to do that now because of the spotlight. Imagine the pain of watching the people you loved most walking away. Imagine living a life in constant fear and sorrow. Imagine a life where not even your own parents are people by your side anymore because of your differences. Now imagine all of that just because of who you want to be. And remember, this is how you're going to affect trans and gay kids if schools decide to let teachers out their students. 
And I just want to encourage you, instead of tokenizing youth and saying it's very sweet that you came up here and you shared your opinions, and we want to hear what you have to say, really listen to them. They're out here. Listen to them. Like, that, that's what we're here for. I really encourage you to do that. All right, up next is Verity Gould, and on deck is Mark Two. Did I skip somebody? I'm yes. so very sorry. Yes, then Verity. So sorry. Please. Hello, my name is Verity Fantham. My pronouns are she, her. I'm reading for Nicole Morgan, whose pronouns are they, them. In Nicole's words, what others don't have, I'm lucky to have a supportive family. I am a trans and homosexual 14-year-old who first discovered who I was around sixth grade. I'm lucky that I am being raised to love who I want and to love being me, but not everybody has that. The day I'm writing this, one of my friends told me that I was lucky to have supportive parents. I don't feel lucky though. I feel scared and sad for the people who aren't lucky, the people who can't be themselves around the people they love, who can't love who they want to love. I am afraid that outing the students without knowing if they have a safe home environment will only endanger more people. I urge you to rethink your choice. Thank you, from Nicole. Thank you. Now we have Verity, and on deck is Mark Two. Hello, and thank you for letting me speak. My name is Verity Gould, and I live in Lincoln. I am reading a letter from a Rockland student who wishes and needs to remain anonymous. To the board, I'll keep my words short and simple, but I hope that these might be meaning to you, meaningful to you. Firstly, that this policy is being decided today will endanger many of my peers across the whole district. You have considered the parents' rights to know, even though it's unconstitutional under California law, but now I beg you to consider children's rights to safety. Think of the children whose parents do not support the LGBTQ plus community. Think of the children whose parents might have a violent reaction in response to their children being part of the community. Think of the physical danger that queer children in our school district will be in. You are the school board dedicated to creating and sustaining conditions that support excellent teaching and learning. These are your words. I beg you and ask for you to ask yourself, is this the threat of violence at home truly a condition that supports excellent learning? Do my queer peers deserve the threat of their own parents hanging over their heads for daring to express themselves for who they truly are. Lastly, I will speak from personal experience. I am a queer teenager. I use pronouns that don't align to my birth sex. This policy frightens me to my very soul. It shows me that adults that I was... Pr Thank you, Verity. Time, sorry. Thank you. Okay, so now we have Mark, and on deck is Jeremy Waddell. Good evening. My name is Mark Two. Uh, two current and three former, one of which identifies as LGBTQ and who felt unsafe to come out to her mother. I'm also a California licensed attorney. And I'm here to register my strong opposition to this incomprehensibly stupid rule to require mandatory outing of students to parents. Because number one, it does not solve any known problem and instead greatly increases the harm and risk to the most vulnerable students. Two, the rule will invite and result in completely unnecessary, expensive litigation that the district will ultimately lose. And three, 
because this rule does nothing to enhance educational experience or learning inside the, the classroom and instead promotes personal, political, and religious agendas that should have no place in this district. First, the school board should not adopt this rule because it does not, take, does not solve any problem. There is not a large, pervasive, systemic problem of parents not being told what is happening with their kids. Uh, this is truly a solution looking for a problem. Instead, the rule makes our classrooms less safe and the most vulnerable students um, in danger. We all know that the LGBTQ plus teens are at a disproportionately higher risk of depression, self-harm, suicide, and this rule only worsens that. The second reason the board should not adopt this has been discussed extensively. This will result in litigation that will cost us taxpayers money and is a pointless, ridiculous waste of time. Finally, this is really being brought about because of personal, religious, and political views. It should not be here. And President Hupp, I am a principled father. I am a principled parent. My principles are love, kindness, inclusion. And Thank you, Mark. Okay, up next is Jeremy Waddell, and on deck is Al Pelly. Jeremy Waddell, and I wear many hats in this district. Tonight I come to you as the grievance chair of secondary education. You have said a lot about parents' rights tonight, but what I want to speak to you is about the rights of the students in California. According to Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution of the State of California, all people are by nature free and independent and have inalienable rights. Among these are privacy. Not only does this board policy violate constitutional rights of students, this policy violates California's Equal Protection Clause, Ed Code Sections 200 and 220, and Government Code Section 11135. To put it simply, this policy is illegal. All people have an inalienable right to privacy. School boards lack the authority to go against the laws of this country, from Tinker versus Des Moines, the Brown v. Board of Education to the Constitution of the state we live in. There's a poem written by Martin and Mueller that we teach in eighth grade. First they came for the communists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for me, and by that time, there was no one left to speak up for me. Tonight, this board comes for the constitutional rights of children. Though I am not a child, I will speak up because you don't speak, if you don't speak up right now, we don't have rights in a few years. What will be next? A parent's right to limit free speech? A parent's right to ban books? A parent's right to segregation? When we discard the laws of our nation to oppress the rights of others, we go against the foundational principles of our society. Please vote no on this agenda item. Thank you, Jeremy. Now is Al Pelly and on deck Ashley Blair. Hello, my name is Aloysius William Pelly. I live in Rockland, California. I have two children that currently reside at, in, or go to Rockland High School. I have one that graduated. I'm reading for anonymous student number three at Rockland High School. I am a 15 year old and use they then pronouns. I am lucky to be in a good house with parents that accept me. However, the same cannot be told for many of my fellow classmates. This year on the first day of our club meet, met a school administrator came in and told us that our campus was a safe space for all of us. But how could it be a safe space if this policy is adopted? Several people I know have asked to be called by their dead name when their parents are around whether it is because they don't feel comfortable telling their parents or aren't ready to tell them yet, it is not the place of the school to tell the parents things they should be told to them by their children. Children have rights and you should be putting the school district, you would be putting the school district in a legally precarious position if you adopt the policy. Disclosing a student's sexual orientation or gender identity without the student's permission exposes the school district to lawsuits for violations of a student's constitutional right to privacy. California's anti-discriminatory laws 
as well as federal laws such as the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act and HIPAA. It is the best interest for both the students and the district as a whole to turn down this policy and throw it out the back window. Signed, a 15-year-old who hopes that school can remain the safe places they're supposed to be. Me, I implore the school members to drop this hateful, discriminatory agenda item that some of you are trying to bring to fruition under the guise of parents' rights. Jesus would hug my children. You guys are... Thank you all. Okay, up now is Ashley Blair. And on deck, it might say Jane Doe or Jamie. I'm a student at Rockman High School, and I just want to say I am terrified to be here. I am terrified to put myself out in front and speak out against this proposition. But fortunately, I am in a loving and safe environment where I have the opportunity to rep represent those who don't. On our first meeting of our LGBTQ plus Alliance Club, our advisor had to ask the vice principal to chaperone to make sure that the students felt safe in the room. He had been brought in because the previous day at our club rush, Myself and others were harassed for simply being a face for a safe place. He talked about how the school needs to be a safe place and how they would not stand for any injustices and intolerances on our campus. How can we ensure the safeties they deserve? How, do we, how can we ensure the safeties of our students if we don't give them the privacy they deserve? If this proposal gets passed, the ability of students to have their own safe space diminishes greatly. Whether a student's home is just unsafe for them to fully be themselves, or they're just not ready to tell their parents yet, students deserve to do things on their own time. We are in a place where we are growing and learning about who we are. And this proposal ruins the sanctity of kind teachers and students' personal journeys. Please think of the students and help keep our facilities safe. This pro proposition is just the first step to a downward spiral passing this proposition, how do we know that this won't create a more hostile environment on our school? How do we know that this won't lead into a more controlling campus and board? Listen to the students and put your trust into us and keep our schools about education. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. So this is you? OK. And then on deck is Anne B. Rockland Unified Board members, I do not wish to share my name. That is why I put Jane Doe on there. I don't want you to remember my name. I want you to remember my words, my words and those of others, the words of those who think that the legislation is subtly undermining what should be a student's right to privacy the words of a non-binary student who has been in the district and used to love it until you guys proposed this policy. The words of someone who is cisgender and says that this will hurt people, students specifically, who want to go by a different gender or name. I understand that this may seem simple on the surface, but nothing is ever simple. And regardless of any aspect of your policy proposition, which I did read in its entirely, it will not help what you think it is going to help. I know that you want Rockland USD schools to increase their attendance rates, and that's a good thing, but this will do nothing but make them go down in the negatives. The policies are unethical and will take away classroom or personal time that could be valuable for something else. School is not for having discussions like this. That is for students on their own time. School is for learning for teaching kids how to act and how to just be. And if we can't let them be themselves without being outed, then we're not doing the one thing that school is meant to do. We're supposed to be safe here. I know that I myself and many other people will not feel safe if this is passed. And if not for the students affected, then at least just for the reputation, please. I, love, I have been here since kindergarten, and I love these schools. I don't want to see it go downhill. Do not forcefully intrude on a student's privacy. 
reject this policy and lead our U.S. Okay, up now is Anne. I, sorry, Anne, on deck is Marika Porter. Sorry, go ahead. Um, I sincerely hope that your board will not adopt the policy requiring teachers and staff to disclose an LGBTQ status of their students to their parents. Why? Enacting this policy will waste valuable district funds. School board members are charged to keep the district's budget balanced. And knowing that the Rockland School District would undoubtedly be sued not only by the Attorney General, but also by C their own CTA um, organization, this policy would be, uh, fis this would be a really fiscally in irresponsible decision to adopt this policy. Um, number two, this policy would lower staff morale and lead to many good teachers to leave the district. I'm a former teacher. Uh, teachers went into the profession certainly not for the money, but because they care about their kids. It would crush many teachers if they were for forced out through any of their students. This policy would create an environment of distrust between students and their teachers, which would make classroom classrooms far less welcoming, both for teachers and their students. Please remember, teachers are your most important resource. You need to support your teachers. And finally, and most importantly, this policy would harm students. A board member's most important duty is to keep their children safe, to keep them safe. And as you've heard again and again here, yes, some parents are gonna be okay with it. Others are not, and timing is really important. I agree with Michelle that we must, that, that there's timing that is involved here. We can't force it to happen. Sure, you'd love to have every parent be talking about everything. That may not be happening in some households. And as we know, if a family is Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Ann. Sorry, time's Thank up. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. Okay, up next, Marika Porter and on deck, Amy Bentley. Very highly charged, emotionally charged topic, and I, I'm hearing the same things over and over. I have a different perspective. I spent 39 years working in social services. Sorry, I spent 39 years working in social services, law enforcement, with the most fragile of populations. And my perspective is far different. So we've heard a lot about the suicide rate from this population. It would be wonderful in a perfect world if every parent was open and accepted and, and, and greeted their child with love and acceptance and open arms when they shared their vulnerabilities with them. It doesn't happen. I worked in child abuse. I worked in missing persons. I worked in human trafficking for decades. And I can tell you that what happens to these kids is they are thrown away. They are what's deemed, they're either throwaway kids or they're disposable kids. They're neither. These are precious, precious souls. I'm gonna keep my personal opinions out. I have many and I'm gonna to try to keep my personal opinions out, but I have a much different perspective because I've worked case after case after case where if the kids aren't, if they don't take their own lives, somebody else does it for them. They're picked up by the pimps, they're picked up by the trafficking rings, and whether you wanna believe the trafficking exists or not here, it does. I worked it, I promise you it does. These kids are, are at more at risk than you will ever know. And when their parents push them out because they cannot accept their personal choices, they cannot unconditionally love their children, so they force them out because they're not conforming to what they think they should be, then the predators get them. Thank you, Marika. Appreciate your point. Now, Amy Bentley, and after Amy is Sylvia Marsden. 
My name is Amy Bentley. I live in Rockland. I'm a Whitney parent, and I'm a teacher at Springview. I am here to address the proposed policy that asks staff to take actions that could harm the physical and mental health of our students, while also specifically targeting transgender and gender nonconforming youth. As secondary teachers, we have transgender and non-binary students on our campuses and in our classrooms every year. And like we do for all of our students, we work to provide a safe and accepting classroom environment for them. We also know that this particular group of students is at risk. This year, results of a survey done by the Trevor Project of 28,000 LGBTQ youth ages 13 to 24 were released. The statistics are telling. About 50% of transgender and non-binary youth report considering suicide in the last year. Nearly one in five reported that they attempted suicide in the last year. In addition, fewer than 40% of LGBTQ youth, LGBTQ youth um, report that their home is LGBTQ affirming. Putting all of that together, let me be clear, outing a transgender or non-binary person can be dangerous. The worst case scenario is death, suicide. And given that almost 20% of these youth already report attempting suicide last year, it is not far-fetched to suggest that, if implemented, the proposed policy could lead to the death of students. On the surface, I understand that a parent might think that they want to know how their child identifies at school without understanding the full effect it can have on the person if they are outed before they are ready. I have to wonder if the parents advocating for this policy would have a change of heart if their child became suicidal after a teacher called home to comply with the policy. As for me, I cannot in good conscience compromise the safety and mental health of a child. The proposed policy is illegal, immoral, it will harm children, and for all of those reasons, even if it is adopted, I will not follow it. Okay, up now is Sylvia Marsden, and on deck is Stacy Jackson. Good evening, Superintendent Stock and our USD board members. I am here this evening as a dedicated Rockland Unified Educator, a collaborator, and a mentor to students. Our role as teachers reaches far beyond the classrooms that we teach in every day. It is a great privilege and a great responsibility that we have to be a part of shaping the minds of our future. However, this evening, I would like to discuss an issue that is extremely important, as we have been discussing already. The wrongness of teachers revealing a student's LGBT, well, sorry, LGBTQ identity to their parents without their consent. Above all, it is crucial to recognize that every child is a unique individual. Our students come to us from a variety of backgrounds, cultures, and belief systems. And as their teachers, our primary focus is to create safe, inclusive, nurturing environments at our school where students feel valued, respected, heard, and free to be who they are as individuals. Part of our responsibility to the students includes protecting their privacy and individuality, especially when it comes to deeply personal issues such as these. There is great potential for negative consequences of telling students, parents, and families about their identities. The minimal being the, the simply the broken trust between a student and teacher, resulting in potential academic issues and social emotional wellness on campus. It is also crucial to keep in mind that not all parents and families, as we have discussed, are understanding and supportive of students with LGBTQ identities. Um, students may fear being rejected, discriminated against, shunned by families, and in the worst cases, fear violence as a result of their identity being revealed. As teachers, we are required to prioritize the safety and social emotional well-being of our students. And this includes respecting their decision as to when, how, and whom they decide to tell about their LGBTQ identities. <clears throat> Sorry, um, I strongly encourage educators to recognize the magnitude of respecting a student's privacy and self-governance, especially when it regards these highly personal matters. Thank you. <laughs> Up next is Stacy Jackson, and on deck is Spencer. Stacy Jackson. No, Stacy Jackson. Okay. So up next is Spencer. And on deck is Brian Faircloth. Hi, my name is Spencer. 
Um, and I am a first year student at Sierra College. I have met so many wonderful, intelligent um, students that are alumni of the Rockland School District um, over my uh, years of experience being in Rockland. Um, and they would not be here today if a policy like this were to be allowed in schools. Not only that, but these students are not going to be able to learn knowing that they aren't safe with their teachers. You, um, you try learning and retaining information when you're constantly in danger. Look at all the students and teachers here tonight on a school night, having to speak out against this prop proposition, having to prioritize their safety over school. School and safety should never have to be separate concepts. Um, all RUSD students are truly going to make a difference in this world, especially kids who can share their unique perspectives with us and all their diverse perspectives. These kids' voices are invaluable. Don't cut their lives short and silence their voices by passing this bill and putting them at risk of harming people or of putting them at risk putting them at risk of harm from the people who should be supporting them regardless and unconditionally in the first place. These kids deserve to be treated as human beings, not thrown away as property whose owners need to be notified as soon as they find out an aspect of their personality. Um, with the time left, I would like to thank all the teachers and students here tonight. Um, same with the parents in support as well. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer. Up next is Brian, and on deck is Meredith Kane. Board, my name is Brian Faircloth. I'm a resident of Placer County. Consequently, I pay Placer County taxes. And this has been quite a meeting. If you just sit here and listen to some of what the proposition really is that you're voting on versus what you're hearing from some of the folks. If you take, if you sit back and you say, most of these things don't even equate to what you're voting on tonight. I recommend that you do vote for this change in policy. I think it's the right thing to do. I don't believe that it's that's in danger of, of I heard outing and they're gonna be chastised. That's an implementation problem. That's not a policy problem. So I would highly recommend that you vote for it and I appreciate the time, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Up next is Meredith, and on deck is Millie Yan. Good evening, board. Uh, my name is Meredith Kane. I'm a teacher and coach at Whitney High School. I'm very well respected by my peers and my students. I had something I prepared to say, and I'm going to go off the cuff as I've been sitting here for the last few hours, and my Apple Watch is telling me to breathe and to lower my heart rate. I have to go with what's in my heart. Um, I want to address a couple of things specific to what was stated earlier today about some verbiage that you have mentioned that I don't see in the proposed 5020 policy. You mentioned things like uh, open changes and required to take action and when the student requests. I see the requests in this 5020 policy. I don't see things like the one-on-one -on -one conversations that were mentioned. I don't see those things in this. And let's be honest, we know the way that the vote's going to go. We've heard from so many amazing students tonight, and I commend them. It takes a lot of bravery to come up here and speak the truth, their truth. And I truly hope that you listen. I've been up here before talking of other policies, and I don't think that there will be a change. However, what I would like to recommend is for those specific verbiage that was used, let, instead of just saying, let's go ahead and do the policy tonight, make a change. If there is specific parameters that you envision this policy, put it in writing. Because what's in front of us is extremely vague. And it makes someone like myself as a teacher who has multiple students, every class period that requests to go by a different name, it would make me liable to go tell their parents. So if there are other parameters in which you believe this policy should be enacted, then please revise it. Make it very clear because it's not. It is discriminatory in the way that it's written, and that's a fact. I don't envy you, but you brought this on yourself. Thank you. 
Thank you, Meredith. Up next is Millie Yan, and on deck is Laura Brun. Good evening, my name is Millie Yan, and I'm a parent of two children in Rockland Unified School District. And I want to say that our trans children are godlings. Our queer children are godlings, and we must honor who they are and their safety. And therefore, I ask you to reject this policy that you are proposing. Thank you, Millie. Up next is Laura Brunn, and on deck is Shannon Cantonella. Good evening, my name is Laura Brunn. I am a teacher at Whitney High School. Uh, in addition, I am a member of the LGBTQ community. Um, I'm also a parent of two teenage daughters. Uh, this thinly veiled agenda item of parental rights is really a targeted attack on an already vulnerable group of LGBTQ students that I am morally and professionally bound to protect. For all of us in marginalized groups, safe spaces have a very personal and important meaning. Every student has the right to a safe, supportive environment where they are given agency to explore their identity when and how they choose. Many of us on the LGBTQ spectrum do explore our identities and our different social circles before we share it with our families for many reasons. Sometimes we need to fully understand ourselves before taking it to our families. Sometimes we don't share our fam with our families because they've made it very clear that they will not accept us for who we are. All of us in the LGBT community know these stories firsthand. As a teacher at, in the RUSD at Whitney High School, I know these stories firsthand. Family dynamics are complex, and this policy of outing our students under the guise of helping to connect families is at best misguided, and in some cases dangerous. Us LGBTQ folks exist, we continue to exist and persist, despite these attempts to scare our students into silence. I've looked into the whites of these kids' eyes every day for the last 27 years, I won't be silent. I'm strongly opposed to this. Thank you, Laura. Up next is Shannon Cantonella, and on deck is Jane Kingery. Hi, good evening. My name is Shannon. I live in Rockland, and I have students in Rockland, and um, I'm getting really tired. <laughs> it's getting really late, so I'm going to do like a poll. Um, who amongst you are family-centered? Can you raise your hands? Would you consider yourselves to be family-centered? None of you. They can raise their hands. They just can't respond. Who of you know someone in the LGBTQ? Who of you know someone in the LGBTQ community? I see hands. Thank and you. And we're not going to respond to you. But you can polls. raise your hands. It's okay. Who of you know someone or has spoken with someone in the trans community? Have you met their parents? Have you learned about their experience? Have you stopped to ask what those families have encountered and how they have handled it? Do you know that most of those parents knew that their children were trans? They knew ahead of time. They didn't need to be outed to their parents. Do, you even pretend, do we even pretend that we have social workers on staff to do this work? We don't have that many psycho psychologists or psychiatrists in our district. The money that will be used to fight this oncoming onslaught of lawsuits from the ACLU and from the district, um, the superintendent's office, in addition to the suits coming from President Hupp's religious post and the anti-mask lawsuit from last year, that could be spent on psychologists. Instead, this turns teachers into informants. Teachers just want to teach. They don't want to rat out their kids. There is a good metaphor, the missing stare. It's the person or the group that keeps causing harm, but everyone ignores it or disparages it privately. This board is a missing stare, and its toxic action should stop. Words don't harm, but actions do. We need to stop making national news for the wrong reasons. We want science in our schools, student protections, and 
Thank you, Shannon. Up next is... Jana Kingery, and on deck is Carissa Kuhn. Hi, I'm Jana Kingery. Um, I'm a very proud teacher at Victory High School here in Rockland. I'm also a very proud mom of two Whitney High School students, one who identifies as LGBTQ, and the other one does not. And I'm a very dedicated volunteer in all things Rockland. Um, but my very first role I had before all of that was a military spouse. And I have been fighting for military spouse rights for four years in this district, and now I'm fighting for the rights of my students and my own children. Um, you display signs out in your lobby and out in the front of the district office that you support your military families, but I, I don't know how. What do you really do? Um, by reciting the pledge, displaying the flag, by singing the anthem, those things do not help our military families. Jane, we're talking about um, 7.1 right now. Um, I'm talking about my military 7.1. Okay. Um, that's not supporting those families. Um, protecting our LGBTQ military youth supports our families. Providing military spouse assistance supports our fa families. There are laws now for, in California that protect our LGBTQ military youth and also our spouses. Um, that is equitable. That is principled, and that's the law. Okay. Um, my kids are here supporting me and the entire LGBTQ community, and guess who's not? And my husband's not here because he's deployed fighting for the rights for all these kids to be able to express yourself and be protected and have their privacy. Okay. Please follow the law. You have separation of the church and state. You respect student privacy. You should enforce military teacher rights. Most importantly, protect our LGBTQ plus um, student. Our military fights for all of those rights and for all of the All right, up now is Carissa Kuhn and on deck is Quinn. Good evening, my name is Carissa Keen, um, and I am a teacher at Whitney High School, and I have been for the past 18 years. Um, I value each and every one of my students, uh, regardless of who they are and how they identify, I love my students, and I am here to support and protect them. And for my students that are here, for all our students that are here, I am so, so proud of them for being here today and for taking on the adults in the room, who should know better, okay? That the adults sitting here would invest so much time and energy. I heard the opening remarks on this. I'm like, that is so much time and energy in crafting a policy that specifically targets transgender and non-binary students, and then call that inclusive, is appalling. Like, that you would even consider such a policy rooted not in respect for our students and their rights, but in transphobia, bigotry, and hate under the guise of parent rights. Shame on you, shame on you. This policy has little to do with parent rights, and it has everything to do with a ha hateful political and religious agenda being pushed on our schools and students. Well, teachers and students, we are not your pawns. No matter how you word this amendment, it is clear that it is discriminatory towards transgender and non-binary students. It strips them of their agency, their rights to self-determination, pri privacy, and a safe learning environment, okay? So why on earth would you even entertain it? What possible? ethical justification could you have to make that decision to come out to parents for kids? That is not your place. It is not our place to force a conversation to happen. It is not our place to take that away from kids. They will come out when they choose and in the manner they choose, and it is not our job to do that for them. That can put them in danger, right? At worst, as Brandon said, it was just misguided, but it can be very dangerous, and this can end up basically enacting real violence on our students. We don't know if they're safe in their homes, right? Thank you, Chris. <laughs> All right, up next is Quinn, and on deck is Tawana Armstrong. I do not have a script. I'm going based purely off my heart. Mrs. Hupp, I have a question for you. You consider yourself a religious person. Is that correct? Uh, yes or no? Just, is that correct? 
Do you happen to know what Leviticus 19.16 is? If you know. Quinn, I will listen to everything you have to say, but I won't respond back. Okay. Well, what it, mean, what it says in the Bible is, Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people, among thy people. Neither, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. Basically, what it's saying is, no person should ever disrespect their neighbor, disrespect their fellow humans, and go and gossip about what is not the other person's personal business. I don't consider myself a religious man. I don't consider myself a man. I'm non-binary. But you, what I've seen in your emails, consider yourself a religious woman. This law, not law, but this pact, whatever it is, if it gets passed, it is going to be the cause of many youth, their downfall, what their hurt. And if you pass this law, you will be standing in their blood, as Jesus said. Thank you. Thank you, Quinn. Now is Tawana, and on deck is Patrick Azuniak. Oh, he even put a Posuniak. Thank you. Hi, good evening, Dais. Tawana Armstrong here, Rockland resident, daughter graduated from Rockland High School, um, 2018. So students, um, I'm sorry, schools play a critical role in supporting students' emotional well-being and positive identity, and studies show that when all students feel safe and supported for who they are in school, they are better able to focus on their studies and thrive academically and socially. Rather than adopt policies that alienate any community, schools should invest resources that affirm and support students and their families in working towards family acceptance, whatever that looks like. Inclusive education, poli education policies increase student academic, academic outcomes and support greater cultural understanding and awareness that helps to build empathy, affirm diversity, and foster greater connection among all students. When young people feel accepted and valued for who they are, they do better in school, and they are able to develop a positive self-image and lead healthy and fulfilling lives. This means being able to express themselves freely, be addressed by the names and pronouns that match who they are, and use facilities and take place, take part in activities that align with their gender without fear of being outed to anyone, including at home, without their permission, I would ask you, do no harm. Do no harm. Please do not allow your fear of change to drive you to look for problem, look for solutions without problems. Please do no harm. What you are proposing is just as harmful as teaching that slavery has benefits. Would ask Thank you, Tawana. Up next is Patrick, and on deck is Melissa. Haiti Sokol. Thank you for allowing me time to speak. My name is Patrick, I'm a resident of Rockland, a Sierra College alum, and I find this policy and the fact that it's even up for a vote deeply concerning. I won't talk about religion, I won't talk about the lives of these kids as they speak eloquently from their own experiences. Instead, I wanna to speak to the parents and the board members in favor of this and their future relationships with their children. You may feel like you're protecting your children from an ideology. I would like to suggest that instead what you are falling into is a trap that would end poorly for you as it does many parents. Growing old without a child who truly wants to be around you. It's as simple as that. Does your child feel safe around you? Can they tell you anything or do you need the government to get involved? Can I can tell you right now that if you break your child's trust by having schools tell on them, you are unlikely to ever get that trust back. Consider that 
Do you want to see your child grow up? Or would you rather them not visit home because you've made them feel unsafe for being who they are? How many family dinners and celebrations do you not want them to be a part of as an adult? How many memories do you not want to make with them? Your child will discover themselves no matter what you do. So do you want to do something that motivates them to come home? To the board, I truly hope you think about what this will do to the relationships between your students and their parents. I hope you consider the gravity of this vote. Would you rather enact policy that further divides families or provide a space for them to learn without worry and to grow up confident in who they truly are? This is the power you have today. Please vote no. Thank you for your time. Okay, on deck is Cade George. Melissa Hardy Swale. I'm here as an auntie. I have uh, a niece, two nieces um, in Breen at sixth grade and fourth grade, and I have two nieces that graduated from Rockland High. And actually, I was just on my way home from the gym and thought I'd stop in. Um, I haven't even been home for dinner yet. Um, but this really concerns me, um, the, extreme, the extremism that I'm seeing in Placer County. Um, you know, I heard this story on NPR on the way here, and I thought, is this really Rockland, or am I in Texas or Florida? Um, and so I'm concerned because I want my nieces to grow up in a safe environment. And a lot of people move from all over California to come to Rockland schools because they're top of the line, right? People spend a lot of money to buy a house here so they can be in the school district. And I guess what I'm really concerned about is how safe are my nieces going to be? You know, with the fentanyl crisis, the gun crisis, the mental health crisis that we face after COVID. But now they have to be concerned about their identity. And it's something that they shouldn't have to be concerned about at such a young age, or even in high school when they're most vulnerable and most susceptible to being bullied um, or targeted or outed by a teacher, which seems kind of crazy. Um, so I know I only have a few minutes or 45 seconds, but the rest of my comment is really for the audience. You know, we've had some amazing teachers today speak and trans youth and LGBT youth, and I want you to know that you have a voice and your voice is voting. You know, when you think about why, why should I even register to vote or why should I vote, think about the school board race and how important when you choose people to sit on your school board, how it impacts you and your life. And when that other gentleman said, I think you said he was threatening you or something like that, what he was saying is he was concerned about your job because these jobs are voted in, right? You guys are all voted. And this is a voting community. And so what I would say to the youth in the room and the younger people, Up next is Cade George, and on deck is Beth Bourne. My name is Cade George. I live in Rockland and attend Whitney as a senior, and I am here to show my strong opposition to this policy. As a board, your interest should be in the best of a child's privacy, safety, and them as a student. How does a policy that outs the child as trans supposed to help them as a student? Students are able to excel in school because they feel safe enough to focus on their studies without the overwhelming anxiety of outside influences. Take away that safe environment and you are depriving them of a fair chance at learning. If a student is added to their parents, they will constantly be focused on, focusing on keeping themselves safe from anything that may bring them physical or mental harm. And when entering a school where the Rockland board makes it so the first priority isn't the student's safety, how are trans kids able to clearly focus on their studies? You are selfishly taking away a child's chance to thrive in a world that is already so actively against them. This policy does not bring families closer like you claim, it tears them apart. Not only are you invading a child's personal life, you are forcing countless teachers to compromise their own morals. You are not entitled to force teachers into giving away a child's personal information, even to a parent. As a school board and as Americans, you praise individual freedom for everyone, but are taking away the freedom of trans youth. You're not giving equality to every student, but instead looking to take it away from a population whose just existence somehow feels threatening to you. When looking at the suicide rates of teens, trans teens are four times more likely to commit suicide. I ask the board members who stand by this policy, are you willing to bear the burden of any suicides that may arise because of this? If this policy is passed and a trans child within the Rockland district commits suicide, that child's death falls on everyone who agrees. 
There have been many cases where trans kids are kicked out of their houses, verbally and or physically abused, and put into conversion therapy because their parents find out they are trans. You're not only aiding in those threats being brought into our community, but you are putting a child's life at risk. Can you look a child in the eyes and tell them they do not deserve to be as treated as equally and as privately as their peers because they are trans? That their life isn't as valuable? Passing this policy will not make them any less present within the community. You have zero right to try and take away the freedom of a child because you don't agree with their life. Up next is Beth Bourne, and on deck is Nicole Young. Good evening. Um, I'm here tonight to read from this book. Um, it's called Lost in Trans Nation. It's a child psychiatrist's guide out of the madness. It's by Miriam Grossman, and there's a foreword by Dr. Jordan Peterson. Um, my name is on page five. Um, it says, Beth Bourne. Davis, California, one of the parents that it's dedicated to. Um, my son is a volleyball player here in Rockland. Um, here's the dedication. This book is dedicated to the parents of kids with rapid onset gender dysphoria and to the groups who support them. I spoke with you from your cars, the basements, and the bathrooms. You huddled and whispered behind closed doors as if seeking my help was criminal behavior. You're not criminals, you are heroes. The criminals are the therapists, the teachers, the school counselors, and the sex educators who indoctrinate your children with falsehoods, and the doctors who then disfigure and sterilize them. They are guilty of crimes, and their day will come. These are my words. It's actually compassion if you tell a child or a teen who's struggling with identity issues that changing their bodies with drugs and surgeries will not solve all their problems, and that there's no wrong way to be a boy or a girl. Please support parental rights. Basic safeguarding of children means not keeping secret from parents. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Okay, up now is Nicole Young, and on deck is Jonathan Zach. Zacherson. Good evening, board. Um, the past three years, the relationship between parents and educators has been sorely stained with mistrust. This policy is one I feel, as a parent, would build a bridge between educators and parents so that our children can flourish in their educational environment. Um, I'm also going to be speaking on the TRO hearing as I was on the call today. This is just a pause for the policy. This is not a law. This is not a ruling. The judge still has a lot of evidence yet to um, review. The current policy is still backed by established case law. It supports the policy. Um, in Parnum versus JR 422 US 584 1979, it says, the status notion that governmental power should supersede parental authority in all cases because some parents abuse or neglect children is repugnant to American tradition. There is no such law that requires the school to keep information on a child's gender identity secret. Trustees have a fiduciary responsibility to protect the district, and this policy covers that fiduciary responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Up now is Jonathan, and after Jonathan, Jonathan is Keisha Williams. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, my name is Jonathan Zacherson. I have many titles, but tonight I speak to you as a parent from the broader Rockland and Roseville community. I know each of you know full well this policy before you tonight is not only the legal one, backed by state statutes and federal Supreme Court's precedent, but the moral one. So I won't go into those specifics. I do want to share a personal experience of mine, though. Earlier this year, my daughter was hospitalized for three weeks due to blood clots in her legs and lungs. Her case was complicated by inflammation and bleeding elsewhere in her body, where she almost died. There were days we didn't know if she was going to make it. Thankfully, she's doing much better now and working with experts to treat her condition. But during the hospital stay, who was the person there by her side almost every moment, spending the night, having tough decision, talking with tough decisions, making tough decisions with doctors, praying, crying. It wasn't one of her teachers. It wasn't her school principal. 
It wasn't any of her school board members, and it certainly wasn't anyone at the state capitol. It was me, her father, someone who loves and cares for her more than anyone else in the world, except for perhaps her mom. And there are people in this room in Sacramento that are trying to say it's dangerous for someone like me, a parent, to know something so critical about their child's mental health that it needs to be kept secret from them. An open secret, mind you, because this policy is only triggered at the same time a child's teacher, peers, other school staff, and even school volunteers learn that the child is being treated as a different gender at school. And if what the California Attorney General sa says is true, that over 80% of kids struggling with gender identity have suicidal ideation, and that over half feel unsafe at school, then those facts alone are reason enough to get parents involved right away so these kids can keep, can get the help and support that they need that only a parent has the capacity to provide and seek out. So I ask this board to do what is right by children, parents, and families, and pass this policy before you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Up next is Keisha Williams, and on deck is Mike Murray. Good evening, board members. My name is Kasia Williams. I'm a volunteer for California Parents Union. We are a statewide grassroots group for parents, grandparents, teachers. I'm also a, a member in this community. Uh, California Parents Union advocates for parental involvement and parent right to choose. We strongly believe that all concerning non-academic conversations between student and teacher should be communicated to parents or guardians before the teacher makes a referral to a counselor. These non-academic conversations can include, but, uh, uh, can include but are not limited to suicidal thoughts, drug addiction problems, gender dysphoria, asking to be identified at school as a different gender than the one assigned at birth, asking to use locker rooms based on gender identity and not the biological sex. These are all very concerning matters and parents have the right to know uh, as parents are best equipped to love and support their kids in all situations. Uh, studies prove that parental involvement is crucial in the overall success of the child, whether it is academics or mental health of a child. Um, I also wanted to mention that I did, as you can tell by my accent, I did grow up in a different country, in a communist country. I'm a very proud citizen of this country <laughs> now. And, um, when I heard Julia uh, Hub inviting families uh, to be members on different committees, and she included Christ-centered families, that made me feel very welcomed. And it made me feel very accepted, and I really appreciate that. So thank you so much. Hey, up next is Mike Murray, and on deck, Jamie Araya. Well, thank you. Uh, Mike Murray, I'm a parent. I have two students in Rockland Unified. Uh, happy to be here after about five hours outside. Unfortunately, many people did have to leave, so I will gladly speak for the parents that either couldn't make it in the door, those watching from home, or those completely unaware of this regulation change. Thank you to this amazing board for all you do and for bringing this tonight. Today at school, my son hit his head on the playground. We received a call about the incident, and we were given the concussion info. We're given this info because the school district understands the importance of the parents. While well, a child spends roughly six hours a day on campus for 175 days a year, it's our job to be there for them the majority of their lives. Parents spend the majority of the kids' lives with them. They are the primary caregiver, they are the primary protector and the primary guide to their lives. This change that you're proposing tonight helps uh, build a stronger bond between parents and child. It facilitates conversation between parents and child, and tell the truth, keeping secrets from parents is not healthy for anyone, and adds to all the problems that many people have mentioned tonight. In conclusion, I know parents. I spent time with parents. I am a parent. I trust parents. This regulation change helps gives parents a seat at the table in their child's life. And that's all we really want. These are our children, and we want to be there for them. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, Jamie Araya. Sorry if I'm saying no, it wrong. Aria, that's fine. Aria. Yeah. And on deck is Megan Madden. Thank you for the time tonight. Um, as I said, I look at the sign that says educational excellence. The one thing that I'm really challenged in hearing tonight is truth and science. And I find that very difficult when we look at the level of tolerance is so much more greater now than ever in history. Yet we find ourselves here being accused of hatred and intolerance. And there is a demand that everyone must think alike. I'm not stepping into anybody else's home and telling them how to raise their children, and I expect the same. Including parents in communication regarding their children is the only acceptable decision. Because at the end of the day, in any crisis that our children are in, the parents, not these people, I'm going to be there for my child. They're not going to be knocking on my door to help. I will be there. Does everyone, the reason why I'm here, I live in Placer County, but my daughter is from Dry Creek School District, graduated from there. But when I heard today that people were being bussed in from outside areas to attend this meeting. Please be respectful. And I guarantee you. Please be respectful. There's, there's, and I'm not going to be called names. I gave you your time, so pipe down. When people are coming in from out of the community to assert their agenda in our community where we live and we have chosen to live here for a reason, then I'm also going to speak up as well. I'm not coming in to raise anybody else's children. I'm here to raise my own. We live in Placer County. We respect Placer County. We ex respect everybody in this room. Never have I hated on anyone that believes in something different than me. When we look at the last three years and the consequences of too much government, especially the interference of government in regards to the safety and well-being of our children, when we were not allowed to make independent decisions for the health. Jamie, I'm sorry, that's time. Oh, thank you, Jamie. Up now is Meg Madden, and on deck is Melanie Higginbottom. I'm a parent of young adult and school-aged children. I am also a registered Democrat. I want to commend the Rockland Unified School Board for having the bravery to adopt the common sense policy of parent notification when a child expresses interest in changing how they identify at school. This policy protects transgender identifying students from harm by respecting and supporting the parent-child relationship. Such students deserve parental protection as much as any other student. A written policy is necessary because where there is no written policy, an unwritten policy arises in its place. Without a policy instructing school personnel to alert parents of a child's distress and adoption of alternative identities, in its place there is an unwritten policy that school personnel may keep this important information secret from parents. Such an unwritten policy is one no school district should tolerate. Spreckles Union School District in California just paid $100,000 to settle a lawsuit with Jessica Conan and her daughter Alicia, brought because district employees hid Alicia's temporary adoption of a male identity from her mother. Another such lawsuit was just announced in Virginia. In that one, I can't even describe what happened to the young girl who was trans at school. It is grossly inappropriate for school personnel to collude with students to hide personal information from that student's parents. It is a violation of long-established safeguarding protocols for adults to have secret communications with minors. It is vital that parents have all information that is important to their child's mental and physical health. School personnel keeping secrets from students eats away at the bonds of trust between parents and children, undermining the family unit and leaving the child vulnerable to those who would use her for their own devices. Thank you, Rockland Unified School Board, for putting students' welfare first. Thank you, Meg. Up next is Melanie Higginbottom, and on deck is Ramona Reeves. Thank you. Today I read an article about this young girl from Buena Vista Middle School here in California. The girl wanted to transition. The school hid it from her parents, gave her all the support they could. After some time, she changed her mind, felt it was wrong, and decided she wanted to talk to her mother about it. School staff encouraged her not to said her mother wouldn't support her. She broke her silence, fought the school, and just won this lawsuit for $100,000.
This is just one of many unsettling stories going on in here in California that could have been avoided with transparency from her school. Choosing to reveal something as important as a child's gender confusion to the parents shouldn't even be up for discussion. I understand some people here, mostly activists from outside our USD community, believe children might be afraid to share this information with their parents, that they might be harmed by their parents if they tell. Let's dissect this for a minute. First, this is an extreme example. Parents in this community want what is best in the best interest of their children so they can live healthy, happy, and successful lives. If there is evidence of abuse or neglect, I know for a fact that our teachers and staff have been thoroughly trained to recognize those signs and will properly address it. If children are truly afraid of their parents, I am confident their school is aware and can handle these very isolated in situations. Secondly, I don't really think they're worried about abuse. I think they're worried that parents will take a different approach to addressing the situation, and activists don't like that. By choosing not to transition, children is not abuse, it's love. The wait and see approach is very effective. According to multiple studies over the past two decades, at least 70% of children suffering from gender dysphoria grow out of it during puberty. That number goes down, however, when schools hide this information from parents and begin socially transitioning their children. Wouldn't it be more supportive if we allowed them to grow out of dysphoria rather than setting them up for years of hormones, surgery, Sorry, Melanie, thank you. Okay, I just wanna pause for one second. We won't have shouting out from the crowd and interrupting people during their time. Be respectful of every person who comes to the podium. Uh, Ramona, thank you. Let me just say, Mary Ann Killian is on deck. Ramona Reeves. I live in Roseville since 1997. My kids grew up in the Eureka School District and Granite Bay. I've been very involved in schools for years, you know, volunteering, raising money, that sort of thing. Um, I believe in parents' rights, and I am for your um, policy to uh, notify parents if there's any um, gender um, discussion going on. Um, I feel like the last couple years, especially since COVID, um, straight children are being targeted and being groomed. And I, and you know what? I've stood in line since five o'clock. I'm sorry, I've stood in line since five o'clock and I've been bullied by a group of people who forced their way up front, pushed children up front to be in line first. And I, there was like a hundred parents who left because they were, felt like they wouldn't, weren't, wouldn't get inside to speak. And I don't, I don't have a prepared speech. I'm just livid that we're being bullied by a group of people and you're trying to change the identity of our children. And I'm for everyone's, I, I think this policy will help um, the LBGTQ community as well as straight kids because parents need to be involved. I've always been involved and I will continue to be involved. My grandchildren are in this um, county going to school and I want to be involved, and I can't be involved if we have bullies pushing us out of the way, because just because your voice is louder doesn't mean that our voices aren't important too. I wanna to protect my grandchildren, and I would really appreciate if this um, policy gets passed. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, up next is Marianne Killian, and on deck is Julie Holyoke. Hi, my name is Marianne Killian. I have three kids who have attended Rockland schools, K through 12. I support the board policy we're discussing tonight, as does the majority of Rockland parents. I appreciate that the policy is logical, loving, and inclusive of students, parents, and staff. Parents have a legal right to know what's happening with their children on a publicly funded campus. I believe in transparency and loving and supporting every child, which this policy will ensure. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ann. Up next is Julie Holyoke, and on deck is Robin Copa. 
Hi, my name is Julie Holyoke, and I have three children in Rockland School District, and I really appreciate the board bringing forth this policy. Um, I feel like it's very much needed, and I support all of the Rockland um, children, uh, mine and yours, and I feel like involving parents is going to be the best thing for, for each child because the parents have known them for years, way longer than a teacher, and know their personality, their feelings, their emotions better than a teacher would. And I know that um, taking the parents out of the picture could cause more problems in the future. And that's so why I appreciate you bringing this policy. And um, thank you for all you do. Thank you, Julie. Okay, up next is Robin, and on deck is Mark Pimentel. Pimentel. My name is Robin Copa. I've been a teacher in Rockland for eight years and a teacher overall for 13 years. Um, I've been a high school chemistry teacher. Um, I also have four kids that I'm raising here that are in the school system. Um, and I support this policy. And the reason is, is as a teacher, I want to tell my parents, like, hey, I've noticed that Johnny is, has been quiet lately or hasn't been raising his hands as much. I want to know as a parent, or I want to tell as a teacher, little things like that. So we are raising our kids in a time when it's really all hands on deck. So of course we want to give our kids the best chance possible to succeed. And so that means teachers, parents, any mentors in the community, whoever that is around that can help raise our children because they have so many issues right now in our youth. I also want to say thank you for listening to all of us. I'm really impressed. I didn't think that you would stay this late to listen to everyone. So thank you for listening to all of us. Um, there are a lot of activists that come out and the voices are loud, but I hope that you can know that a lot of people support you. The, the two friends I was here with had to leave to take care of children. So a lot of people have jobs and children that they have to take care of. But I hope that you feel supported in this policy and know that a lot of parents are backing you up. And we, it's so important, again, that our children feel loved from the parents. Who loves their kids the most? It's not any, I love my kids, all four of them, so much. And I want them to succeed. My, their teachers are my favorite. Every one, I have like the best teacher, but they don't love them as much as I do. I would do anything for them. And most parents feel that way. All parents that I know love their children and they want the best for their children. So let's do the thing that's most loving for our children to, to, on all sides. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mark. And then on deck is Leah Tuifua. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Pimentel. I'm a parent in Rockland. I have two kids in elementary school. I am a resident. Um, I'm sorry. I'm blanking out here. Um, I've been touched by a lot of the stories I've heard today um, on both sides of the party. Um, and I think that uh, we're talking about two different things here. I mean, the individual that talked about his daughter being hurt and spending time in the hospital, it, it, it touched my heart. And I'm, I'm touched by him, his, his, parent, his parenting skills. Um, his daughter's very lucky. There are a lot of kids in this school district that unfortunately do not have the relationship that that individual has with his daughter. And I think that's where uh, this policy can cause some harm. I've heard several teachers, several professional individuals speak about um, the dangers of this policy. And um, when I look at this committee, this, this, this group, um, you all were elected by your peers. You have a responsibility to the entire community of Rockland, right? Not just a small group, not just me, not just the church group, not just, not just anyone, it's to everyone. And I think uh, as leaders, it, it's, it, it falls upon you to, to, to talk to the professionals and talk to the experts, the clinicians, the, 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 social, the social workers, the psychologists, and find out what is the best policy to, to, to to instill with this, within this school. That's, that's, that's what it comes down to. Um, again, folks are talking about, I want to know what's happening with my kids. You probably already know what's happening with your kids. In a sense, you're coming from a privileged, a privileged experience. 
there's some kids out there that we don't know what they're going through. We don't know what they're, what's going on at home. And being outed like this um, could cause some damage. And I think you need to take responsibility for that or take consideration for that and talk to the professionals about what's the best thing to do. Coming out is a very intimate act for anyone. And it's not up to a teacher or a principal to do it. It's up to that individual to do it. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mark. Up next is Leah Tuifua, and on deck is Janine Poitras. Leah Tuifua, I've been a Rockland resident for a decade now, and I have four children currently enrolled at Bull Sunset Ranch in Whitney. I've volunteered in their classrooms, chaperoned their field trips, met with their teachers to discuss how best to collaborate and support their individual growth. I'm an involved parent and I love my kids. I love them more than any other stranger, any other friend, any other teacher, any other counselor, any other administrator ever will. I care about my own children's fulfillment, their happiness, their well-being more than any other person ever will. And when I made a conscious decision to become their mom, I also made a decision to invest in and dedicate the rest of my life to them and their needs and their whole and complete selves forever. And no other human being besides their dad has made that lifelong commitment to each of them. The policy you've proposed validates that reality. I support it and thank the board for being mindful, not just of what it means for open, supportive family relationships like I have, but also of what opposition to the policy means. I feel a vote against this policy is one that says other adults adjacent to my children's lives, however marginally or deeply invested those adults might actually be or may feel themselves to be, that they simply know better than I do and should have unilateral power superseding my own to make decisions for and with my kids that affect the rest of their lives. A vote against this policy says that other people have more wisdom about what's truly best for my kids than I do. And I know that this room is full of intelligent and loving, kind people who disagree with me about this policy. And I know that all of our worries come from our collective desire to do the right thing for all children, but I think every person here who's also a parent believes that they are the ones who are gonna make the best decisions for their own child. And that love. Thank you, Leah. Okay, hey, up next is Janine, and on deck is Kat. Social worker, I've served this community as a social worker for eight years now. Um, I work with children and family services and the emergency contract here. <coughs> My job, like yours, is to provide safe, environments for children. And my job in particular is to make sure that they have a safe and affirming home to go to. Your job is to ensure that they have a safe learning environment, which unfortunately we know is already a challenge physically to provide safety for children in schools, um, in the current climate, physical safety. Uh, we have the opportunity to do our best in our schools right now to provide real, true, felt safety for the children that I serve and that you serve. This, bill, this agenda item does exactly the opposite of that. You are not qualified, neither are most teachers or most school administrators to determine whether or not a child's home is safe. That is up to the discretion of children and family services. Social workers, school counselors, are bound by HIPAA law to protect these children, the information that they disclose to them, and their mental health. We will continue to do that. And I bet that most of the teachers in this district will continue to do that as well. Schools are supposed to be a safe place. My job means that at any given moment in time, if this phone rings at this very moment, my job is to find a safe home for children that have been abused, neglected, or that their parents have failed to protect. I cannot tell you about the in 
Sorry, Janine. Thank you. That's time. Up next is Kat and Nada. Hi. Um, I want to speak to you today as if I'm just talking at you across my kitchen table. Um, something I do privately is I consult um, as to residential child abuse. Unfortunately, what happens in a lot of these cases when there are non-affirming parents or parents who are unfamiliar with uh, queer identity is that they're sent to youth programs under the guise of therapeutic boarding schools. Hundreds of thousands of US children are sent to these every year. California is one of the top offending states of sending children outside of California up until recently. And these schools are highly unregulated. Um, we are one of the only United Nation nations that are not signatories on the rights of the child. So children don't have protections in these schools and residential programs. Many of the parents who are fearful that their children will be queer or see it as a defect, which many in this room do, will choose programs. Uh, educational consultants for these programs often get financial kickbacks. It's a problematic system. Um, and I myself was sent to one of those schools. Um, I speak with legislators in other states um, to help them with verbiage on laws to protect children on a, in a private capacity and work in many organizations. This is commonplace. It is not exaggerated. Children face beatings, starvation, forced religious conversion, and a lot of other horrors in these very unregulated schools. And unfortunately, they attract staff members that sadistically abuse children. That's going to be a reality for a lot of these children. Thank you, Kat. <laughs> Up next is Bruce Yandel. Bruce, sorry I didn't announce that sooner. And on deck is Teresa. Hi, I'm Bruce Yandel, and I'm a proud parent of the Rockland School District. Um, Chino School District is being sued $1.5 million. And when you approve this policy, we're going to be sued, and you're putting us at financial risk. So it's a simple question from my standpoint, beyond the social issues. What's your plan? What programs are we going to put at risk? What staff are we going to put at risk to en enact this program? What's your plan? We don't know what's going to go on. We don't know all, this, all the other issues that are involved. But we do know we're headed down this path. So as a resident, I am asking, I am formally requesting to hear what your board's plan is after you approve this program, this policy, either now or at the next meeting. What's the plan to move forward here? Because we are putting ourselves at risk on a social program and a social agenda rather than an educational agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, up next is Teresa, and on deck is Alan. Aline. Aline. I, I've um, been here since 5.30, and never in my life have I ever encountered so much hate from a group. Sadly, I didn't expect that experience, but that's what the experience was, because I held my pink sign, and there was a lot of hate that I received. With that being said, I've heard most of you speak, and most of you that are speaking, it appears and sounds like to me that you're threatening the board, threatening the school district, threatening teachers if they don't make the right decisions for your side to fit your agenda. Next, basically, you also talk about these kids being bullied, targeted, or outed, 
but do you know <coughs> gays and lesbians existed in the beginning of history? And I grew up in the 70s, went to school in the 70s. I never had ever encountered as much hate as there is now. So you ask yourself, why is that hate there now? It's the LBGT community. They're spewing the hate. There was love. There was love amongst gays and lesbians, yeah. Teresa, Teresa, please address the board. There and was. remember, there's protected classes that we're not going to speak against. Just speak to your, oh, your thoughts on the that. policy. I did not share. I did not know I did that, sorry. Um, so again, I grew up during a time, went to school during a time when there was not this so much hatred. And now there is. And unfortunately, I don't understand. I do have five grandchildren coming up into this district. And it, I brought my kids here to bring them to school in a safe environment. I want my grandchildren to be here in a safe environment. I don't want this hate spewed on them. And it sounds OK, time. Yes, thank you, Teresa. <laughs> up next is Aline. And on deck is Jacob B. Hi, my name is Aline Terpstra. I've raised my three children here for 23 years, and it's been a positive experience within the Rockland School District. I appreciate the board's decision to keep parents notified, aware, and involved in their children's lives. Comments a few teachers have made tonight are pretty disturbing, I think, stating that they, they are in an in a position of authority. Where does that thinking come from? Teachers are in the position of teaching, teaching math, reading, language arts, and the standard educational cur curriculum. That's it. Let's get back to the basics and just teach. This agenda is about notifying parents. Why is that so controversial? Parents need to know when their children are struggling, regardless of the situation, so parents can help their children, especially when something that is it's so life-altering. These views are not political and not religious. They're just parental views, and that trumps teachers, period. I've been outside in line since 5.30 tonight. Many other parents were here but had to leave to tend to their families. The speakers inside the meeting room earlier were mostly organized and came from out of the area. Please listen. An earlier speaker mentioned that parents did not approach the board to have curriculum selection. Parents should not have to do that and should be able to trust that our schools are just teaching the basic educational curriculum, not gender selection. I commend these school board members. Stay strong, support parents that love their children, and get this sexualization of children agenda out of our schools. Bottom line, bottom line, secrets kill, not truth. Keep the parents. Thank you, Elena. Up now is Jacob B. And on deck is Shannon George. Board, I'm here tonight as a Rockland resident, a parent, and an ally. I'm not an activist from outside the area. And I'd like to start by refuting the claim of zero fiscal impact. The California AG has taken legal action against another school district with a similar policy. So why do you believe that there will be no fiscal impact involving a legal battle? The AG office has also acknowledged to local media their awareness of this policy tonight and stated that they will re react accordingly if passed. This is an unwise use of Rockland taxpayer money and will impact the delivery of educational excellence to each and every student. Secondly, this board often touts transparency. As such, I'm hoping that you will be open and transparent about what has led to the introduction of this policy. With whom have you consulted? Have you spoken with any staff, teachers, school psychologists, school administration? Have you spoken with any students, trans or LGBTQ? If so, what is the feedback you're receiving? And if not, why not? I'd also like to discuss what you believe is to be gained from this policy change. 
I've recently seen a quote used to justify trans outing policy. Trans kids do better with parental support. I think everyone in this room can agree with that statement. However, the context matters. The Trevor Project recently conducted a survey where they found that fewer than one third of transgender students find support in their home. Forcibly outing trans youth to a home that will not be supportive isn't helping the youth to achieve better emotional outcomes. Trading their legally protected privacy rights for quote, parental rights, unquote, is not a policy this board should be supporting. I urge you to vote against implementing this poorly considered policy change for the taxpayer, for all the- Thank you, Jacob. Up next is Shannon. And on deck is Jesse Nibley. Shannon George now, and on deck is Jesse Nibley. Good afternoon. Uh, Shannon George, I am a parent here of four children who have been through the Rockland School District, um, one of whom spoke earlier tonight. So as you can imagine, I am enormously proud of her and for her willingness and strength to get up here. Um, I have also been at work all day and have stood in line since 5.30 to be here so that you all know that there are parents in this district that do not support this, that there are parents who are willing to get up and beg you to listen to the teachers and listen to the students and listen to the mental health professionals asking you to protect the most vulnerable of our community. That is where our focus needs to be on protecting those children who do not have people up here speaking for them tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Up now is Jesse Nibley, and on deck is Adrian McManus. My name is Jesse Smith uh, Nibley, and my kids go to Parker Whitney. It doesn't really matter what any of us say because four members of this board are more interested in rubber stamping the agenda of Moms for Liberty than listening to actual parents in this district. They don't care about our voice so much that they would rather throw away our district's money on guaranteed lawsuits than listen to us. But I hope everyone watching this happen tonight will remember that Julie Hupp and Rochelle Price are up for re-election next November. Please keep those names in your mind. On the off chance they're actually listening today, I'll say this. Gender non-conforming kids who feel safe at home, their parents already know this policy won't have any impact on those families. The only students who will be affected are those who do not feel safe at home, and the impact on at least some of these kids will be catastrophic. This rule forces teachers to participate in a scheme that is not only illegal, but also amounts to government-mandated bullying and shaming of their most vulnerable students. Trustee Hutt points out that the policy is only triggered if a student wants to express their identity in some way at school. So essentially, trans students can choose to either live in the closet and suffer the well-documented negative effects of doing so, or be outed against their will to people they don't feel safe with. The fact that Trustee Hupp thinks this is an acceptable situation tells you all you need to know about her qualification to make this decision for students. And lastly, I'll say, if you are afraid your child won't come to you to talk about their gender identity, don't ask the government to step in and fix it for you. Ask yourself what you've done to create an environment that doesn't feel safe for your child and then fix it yourself. Thank you. Uh, okay, Adrian, and then up next is Andrew. Okay, hello. Um, I'm here to urge you to not pass this policy. Um, I think it would be harmful for students in our school district. And I also would like to read to you what I found on the Rockland Unified website about the role of a school board. And this is what is printed on the website. It is to work with their communities to improve student achievement in their local public schools. And it also says the board supports improved student outcomes by creating and sustaining the conditions that support excellence in equitable teaching and learning. And I think this, this proposed policy oversteps those roles that you have stated on the school district website. Thank you. 
Thank you. Up next is Andrew, and it looks like the last name starts with an N. Maybe Neff. Okay, on deck is Abel Yamane. I'm Andrew. I'm uh, a proud parent of four children here in Rockland, three of them in school, and one who just can't wait to join her siblings. Um, they're beautiful. I love them. I'm going to love whoever they become. But the idea that a teacher cannot trust me with something as vital as their individual identity is insane to me. Trust is a two-way street. I can't trust a teacher who cannot trust me with that kind of information. It is important, it's vital, that this information gets communicated to parents. That being said, as an attorney, I can see that there are problems with the way this is written. I think there needs to be some sort of exception written into the rule. However, I think public policy dictates that disclosure, open communication, is much more important, is much more valid as a default principle than having your default be that we are going to lie by omission to parents. That is not a lesson that we want to teach to our children. I yield, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Andrew. Up next is Abel, and on deck is Harley Larson. My name is Abel Yamane. I live in the Sacramento area. I come here as a supportive LGBTQI plus people. Um, I came here to discuss agenda item 71A and the topic of resolution. Yes, it's true that this process ensues upon the child's request. However, when the child does request of the school to be identified differently based on their gender, in order to have access to restrooms, school programs, or activities, or other spaces within the school that affirm their gender, when the child wants to put the pen to paper, and quote, notification shall be made by the classroom teacher, counselor, site administrators. Such notification shall only be delayed up to 48 hours to fulfill mandated reporter requirements when a staff member in conjunction with the site administrator determines, in quote again, on credible evidence that such notification may result in substantial jeopardy to the child's safety, which means the school gets to determine based on the evidence given to them. There are lots to determine, interpret and determine what this end quote, substantial jeopardy to the child is. Not every household is gonna be accepting towards a person's gender identity or change of it. So please respect these children's privacy. This shouldn't be an ask, it should be a given. I don't even wanna get into the language of end quote other than the child's biological sex or gender when sex and gender are two different concepts. Sex is our biological composition. Our gender assigned at birth is determined and based on what society sees us as, which is simply as man or woman. If you're not willing to respect these children's privacy and allow them the agency and protection of the information pertaining to their gender expression or gender identity, then I cannot respect any of you. Also, if a written policy is required for you to build a better relationship with your child, I'd reevaluate your parenting skills and who you are as a person. The perception of gender and the conversation around it is ignorant and it shows. Also, what is this outside of the area terminology? Just because I don't live here doesn't mean I can't care about other people's living conditions and basic human rights. Thank you. Up now is Harley Larson, and on deck is Ashley Wood. Larson, Rockland Breen. Um, look, I've talked to religious parents. I've talked to secular parents. I have talked to parents, neighbors whose kids have graduated from this district. Everyone loves our teachers and are thankful for the way they help our children thrive. In that, our community is united. I'm grateful to our district staff, who I've talked to way too much who I also believe are doing their best for our kids. I'm asking the board's majority to stop intentionally using politics to divide this united community. Parents, ask yourself, why this, why now? 40% of kids in this district are not meeting math standards. Students, is this what you want for your friends, for your younger siblings? You have rights in California. Don't let these four take more of them away from you. Civil disobedience is an American tradition and I encourage you to do what you can if this policy is implemented to stop and stuff this system up as much as you can. Change your gender once a day. You know, change your name after every class. What are they gonna do? I am formally requesting this vote be tabled so the board can hold a town hall Q&A session to talk directly with parents. I've emailed all five of you for years. 
I've gotten emails back from one member. Thank you, Ms. Sutherland. Roger, you're supposed to be the parent, you know, the adult in the room here. And I, I'm, I'm really losing it, you know, seeing what's happening here. I mean, this is just, it's ridiculous. It, it's apparently ridiculous. Everyone else has spoken much more eloquently than I on the issues regarding legality, regarding, uh, you know, finance. And I just don't, just don't understand why we're still here. I don't have time. It'll have to wait for the next meeting. But I have here a list of one, two, three, four, five, you know, 10 or 15 different specifically religious things or political things that members on this board have just done. Um, you know, Derek, why? Who, why do you think this is a problem? I mean, you know, you um, asked for this after Chino was warned. So who, you know, is this you? Did you get a call? For Thank you, Harley. That's time. Up next is Ashley Wood, and after Ashley is Stephanie Rogers. I'm Ashley Wood. I have three kids in this district who um, go to elementary school currently. I've been a pediatric ICU nurse for 13 years, and what I've seen over those 13 years have um, almost destroyed me emotionally because of what I've witnessed families who the passage of this legislation is just going to worsen. To talk with families and be bear witness to their pain of losing their child to suicide and watching those machines turn off, their heartbeat stop, their breathing stop, and the tears and the regret that parents have is unbelievably terrifying as a parent going through this, raising my own children. I don't want you to take this lightly of the damage that this legislation can do. These children need parents to advocate for them. They need their teachers to advocate for them. Our children are suffering, and it's showing in our hospital system. I have witnessed it firsthand, and you guys need to understand that that the damage of this can cause. Not all kids are safe in their homes. Not all kids are. It's just a fact, and a lot of those kids live in this town. So we, it, we need to protect them by not passing this. We're putting them all at risk. Statistics show that 17% of adolescents, as young as the age of 10, we scream. That's a state law, 10 years old, that they are committing suicide, and it happens. 17% of kids are high screen risk. That means 17 of our children in this room right now are contemplating suicide. Think about that. And think about the damage of this legislation passing with that in mind. Thank you. of a RS Rockland Unified School District trans student. And uh, two years ago, they came out to me. And unbeknownst to us and the school, our child was um, mentally fragile. So two, two weeks later, they did try to commit suicide. Um, we are not a statistic. We are real. This does happen. Thank you so much for clearing it for me. Um, uh, do you have the ability to spot these kids do you, in, in a 48-hour period? Um, th this policy is directed to me, and I don't want it. I, I don't know what my child would have done if they had been outed before they had come out to me. I don't know if they, when they walked home if they would have tried to commit suicide. Thank God they did when they were at home, so we were able to catch it. It was unsuccessful. Um, but they don't tell you what it's like after an unsuccessful suicide, what it's like to be a part of a family. You are, our house is still after two years on lockdown. Um, we can't have knives, we can't have everything. Everything's locked down. Um, and every time they say they're anxious, your heart rate starts to, well, what am I gonna do? What if they try to do it again? So I don't ever want another family to actually go through that experience. And if this type of policy is in place, it's very possible you may push these kids into that situation. And I really don't think that 48 hours is enough time for you to assess this very complex 
issue. So I really like the way that it's happening now. I think that, that how going to a counselor and take, taking some time to help them figure out a way to talk to their parents, I think that's a fabulous idea. So thank you. Up now is McKenna Flood, and on deck is Coral Flood. I wrote a very long speech for this, but if actual medical professionals can't convince you, then nothing I say will. So instead, I'm going to speak to the people actually affected by this. You are not alone. We stand beside you, we love you, we care about you, and we are doing our best to protect you. I know what it's like to come to school one day and find out that one of your classmates ended their own life. I didn't know them personally, but I know the people who ran from the classroom crying that day. I know the feeling that stood in the air I know the teachers who told us, we want you to feel safe and loved and cared for. I know that the system, the entire school system, tried to tell us so much, you are safe and cared for. Put your money where your mouth is. If you want these children to feel safe, do not force them out before they are ready. They will die and their blood will be on your hands. I know that there are parents here who care so, so much for their children and love them more than anything in the world, but there are parents who do not. Do not force the law and the teachers to put other people's children in potentially deadly situations. Talk to your child, tell them you love them. Support other trans people in your community and your children will tell you. You do not need to force them out of the closet because they will die. Thank you, McKenna. Up next is Carol, Coral, Coral, and on deck is Harold Duke. I'm very proud of my daughter right now, and I feel like there's nothing else I can really add to that. So many other people have spoken so eloquently, and they, some people have firsthand experience as medical professionals or social workers or students, and I have none of that. I'm just a mom, but I want to make my voice heard that I don't agree with this policy, the, the, the regulation the, that's proposed. I just think it's, first of all, putting the district in a place where we're taking a stand, where we're putting, we're saying that this is, this is a priority above education, above anything else, that we need to mandate how children tell their parents that they're trans. We just do it for them, that's it. We don't give them the timing, we don't give them the opportunity to say, I wanna tell my mom, but I'm not really sure how that's received. As a parent, I want my kids to feel like they are part, they're, they're, they're important to me, and what they want, I need to know it. I agree with that. But I don't think that kids need to be pushed to that. And I have two kids who've been through the, graduated from Rockland High. They were born here, but I just think this is not a place that I would want my kids to be in this situation now. So that's, that's all. Thank you, Carl. Up now is Harold Duke and on deck is Natalie Banning. Thank you. I'm Harold Duke. I'm a uh, citizen of the city of Rockland for over 16 years. I currently don't have children in the school district, but my wife and I have chosen to retire to this community because we care about this community. We enjoy living here. I'm concerned about the safety of your students. I know that you are. I know that the parents that have come up here I'm from both sides are, but there are students that are not safe when they're forced to come out, when they're not ready to come out. That's important to hear. Everybody needs to understand that. It's the students that should be the prime concern. 
It's the students, their safety, that should be the prime concern. It should be up to the students to decide when they out themselves. Not the government, not the school district. It's the students. It's their safety. I'm also concerned about, as being a taxpayer, what this means as far as what's going to be cut from the school district. I don't have students in the school district, but I'm concerned. I have an interest in this community. I, w I have an interest in society in general. What is going to be cut? Because you have to support, you have to back this decision if you go ahead and make it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for allowing us to speak. All right, up next is Natalie Banning, and on deck is Andrea Savilio Benzman. Sorry, that was terrible. My name is Natalie Banning, and I'm a Rockland parent of kids at Antelope Creek, Springview Middle School, and Whitney High School. We have six kids in total, and I'm here representing at least five other families. I want to thank this board for being brave and doing what's right by pro proposing this addition to parents' rights in item 7.1. If approved, the disclosure will strengthen trust between families and Rockland schools rather than driving a wedge between us. This will promote inclusion of the parents in their child's education, which is our legal right, rather than promoting secrecy and lies. This promotes honesty, honesty between schools, administrators, students, and parents. It's our responsibility as parents and families to shape and influence our children's morals and values, and it's not the place of the schools to impose their will or agenda on our children by concealing information from the parents, which promotes dishonesty and is wholly inappropriate. It's fundamentally wrong to encourage minor children to keep secrets from their parents. Any adult who promotes a minor child to be dishonest, lie, or conceal information from their parents is someone who has no business being around children, let alone responsible for children. I'm disappointed by those here tonight who assume that disclosure to parents will cause harm to students when in fact encouraging dishonesty and lies causes harm to family relationships. This assumption of harm, stated so broadly and generally as the rule rather than the exception, causes distrust and improperly vilifies parents. There are so many families who cannot be here tonight who share my perspective. On behalf of those families, stay the course, please pass the amendment, we support you, and we do support you. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Up next is Andrea. Okay, good. You knew what I was trying to say. Um, on deck is Shubika Grover. Um, hello, my name is Andrea. Um, I graduated from Rockland High School last year, class of 2023. I'm here to speak out against this policy that is planning to be implemented um, because I think that it is irresponsible for the school for the school board to implement this policy as it will actively put trans students in danger. How can, oh yes, sorry, sorry. I'm oh, sorry, thank you, thank you. Um, how can the school board say that they know which house environment is safe or unsafe for a student? As an example, I went to Sunset Ranch Elementary from third to sixth grade and I was physically abused and the school did not know. I do not blame the school for not knowing. But I'm going to ask you, can you look me in the eye and tell me the school always knows which home environment is safe or unsafe? To forcibly out students, to forcibly out students without knowing the state of their home environment is irresponsible and actively putting students in danger. And for students who are not in danger and who are simply not ready to come out, this is violating their right to privacy. Students do have rights and they need to be protected. Second of all, the fact that when this policy is implemented, the school board will be sued by the Attorney General and by the ACLU and by the CTA is, would be an embarrassment to the school board. Your reputation, your respect in the community will be used up. How can you claim to support students and students' learning environments when you will be wasting taxpayer dollars 
that could have been used, uh, it's wasting taxpayer dollars on a lawsuit that could have been used to help support students. I'm, that's everything I needed to say, thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Okay, up next is Shubika, and on deck is Mark Travis. My name is Shubika Grover. I've lived in Rockland since the day I was born. Last year, I, was a, I graduated at Rockland High School uh, three months ago. And as a senior, I felt extremely safe and comfortable uh, knowing that I could, uh, was able to form connections with my teachers and be openly and visibly myself around campus with the knowledge that I wasn't, that I wasn't getting emails home telling uh, about me holding hands or the way that I dress or act. Um, I knew that... Uh, um, uh, or. Um, if I was one year younger, I would still be there, and I would not feel that way. I would feel like I have to hide part of myself, and that I wouldn't be able to talk to my teachers during break or after, uh, after class. Um, uh, we've all s uh, seen and heard the effects of forcibly outing students, and that, and that is what the policy does. It, um, there's no mistake about that. From making kids feel unsafe, them being beaten, kicked out of the house, um, it, uh, to even taking their own lives. Um, <laughs> When a policy makes kids, or any kids at all, feel and, and be unsafe like this, in my opinion, there's no question whether a policy like that should be enacted or not. Um, it, since the, uh, we want to protect kids, and this is how we protect kids, by letting them have the discretion to tell their parents something like this. This policy, uh, preventing this policy doesn't put teachers above parents, like some of you may think. Preventing, uh, to, preventing this policy reduces harm, the harm to kids who aren't lucky and privileged enough. It gives kids one space for them to be themselves without being monitored by their parents and, with, um, and when they're faced with unhold, I mean, unsafe households. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now is Mark Travis, and on deck is Curtis Lawler. Thank you. My name is Mark Travis. I live near Auburn. I have no children but I do fully support parental notification. When I was 12, my mother married a gay pedophile. She didn't protect me very well. My stepfather tried to rape me when I was 16. Thankfully, my mother pulled me away from him, or pulled him away from me and arranged for me to live with my father in another state. I left the next day. Backing up a little, in fourth grade, my male teacher liked to have the boys in class sit on his lap while he presented lessons and massaged our backs. What if this was happening today and my gay pedophile teacher told us we were actually little girls and that the district was forbidden from telling our families about our new gender fantasies? This has left an indelible mark on me. Some things are absolutely clear. Predators want to break their victims away from their families and from normal society. Any adult who wants to share their sexual fetishes or delusions with children should be considered as a predator. And parents must be involved in the conversation. This is his experience. This is his personal experience. Just keep it. I feel that there are a lot of well-intended people here, but it is clear that you don't know how predators operate. They operate in secrecy. I ask the board to recognize that pure emotional manipulation by psychopaths going on and don't fall for it. Thank you, Mark. I, I, d I don't disagree with you. He started talking about his own personal experience. Chris, I, I don't disagree with Ladies you. Ladies and gentlemen, please. I, I don't please. disagree Ladies with you. Ladies and gentlemen, you. please let Curtis speak. So I've, I've been here uh, rather late into the night. I've had the luxury of listening to a lot of people talk before me. So I kind of want to address some things that I think are rather absurd. I've heard people say in the same breath that we need to uh, focus on math and science because we're struggling there. And in the same exact breath, they say that we need to stop teachers, have them mandate and out a trans non-binary kid and not focus on that science and math. I've also heard that because I'm in Roseville, I'm not necessarily part of this community, but I am LGTB. I should have a voice. I should be able to talk on something that actually affects me here. At the same time, I grew up in Lincoln. I went to GEMS, if you're aware of that. They have an after-school after roller hockey program uh, there you get to play hockey, which I love, but uh, 
the point is you get to play and be with your teachers and it's kids and teachers all playing the game together and I had a wonderful experience doing that because of that I enjoyed going to school and I cannot understate how devastating it would be if my teachers back then would have to forcibly out me to my parents that I was bisexual before I was ready I would have lost complete faith in my school to do the right thing and complete faith in my teachers and what they were teaching me but more than that I've also heard that this has been uh, a talk about family and uh, parents' rights, but I really want to ask them, why would a child not want to talk to a parent about them being trans or envy or anything like that? Why is it a family issue, and yet it requires a government official to inform you of your child possibly being envy or bi or any of those? And I know the answer to that, and the answer is because if you were worthy, your, your child would have told you. The reason they're not telling you is because they do not believe that they have faith in you to do the right thing, to not abuse them, to not mistreat them, to not hurt them. I do not talk to my father anymore because my father was abusive, because I am bisexual and he did not appreciate that. So the last thing I... Kel Jokoy, and on deck would be Alex Chabotery. Farther up here than it looks. So I come as a ex-child of Placer County. I was born in Roseville, raised in Penryn and I am trans. I did not tell my parents until I was 30 because then I could be independent. It would be fine if I was emotionally hurt by them because at least I would have a house. I'd have a place to live and I wouldn't have to worry about that. When I told them, they were confused, sad. The hardest part being the fact that they sort of just didn't respond. They decided that well, we don't want to know what to say, so we won't. We won't say anything. And that's very hurtful. And at 30, it still hurts. And it still hurts now. I don't have the relationship I want to have with them. They don't have the relationship they want with me. There is no way that could have been made better if I was 16 when that happened. It would have only been more hurtful. Emotions are felt so strongly when you're a teenager. I taught teenagers for six years in a public high school. They're beautiful, wonderful, emotional <laughs> individuals. And I can only say that you will only erode parent-student relationships if you forcibly out children. I can't even imagine how I would talk to my parents if I had been outed. I probably would have just left home because my parents are wonderful people. I'll be the first person to tell you that. They, were, they are educators, they're coaches. They've done so much good in this community and still live in this community. But I still don't feel emotionally safe with them and I cannot tell them about my life today without feeling hurt. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Up next is Alex, and on deck is Steve Bruno. Hello. Um, I'm here on behalf of a <clears throat> uh, anonymous Rockland um, Unified student. Um, so I'm reading uh, an anonymous letter. Uh, hello. The only reason why I'm able to speak to you like this is because of the anonymity, because I have brave peers, brave friends, and I'm not brave enough. But because I have this safety, at least for now, I want to have my voice heard before it is potentially silenced forever. Coming out is a scary thing on its own. You're not sure if people are going to accept you. You're scared that all people will see you as that kid. And there's self-hatred you hate that you can't be normal. You hate that there's this part of you that is different or loves different. But the conformity of the closet cannot be countered with the conformity of coming out. LGBTQ plus members have carved a safe space for themselves at school away from their families. I understand that perhaps you think informing the parents would expand that space, space 
but you cannot guarantee what will happen behind closed doors. You'll be putting children in danger. Please let that sink in. In your effort to push out a political, moral agenda, you'll be hurting the people you are claiming to protect. I can't change my parents' mind about me, so I'm begging you to instead. Please afford children <coughs> excuse me, the freedom to tell whom they wish. Please don't take away that freedom. As a student, as a child, please don't do that to us. Um, thank you. Thank you. Up now is Steve Bruno, and after Steve is Michelle Kapanen. Good evening. My name is Steve Bruno. I do not live within the district boundaries. I'm not one of your voters or constituents, but I do serve on the neighboring school board, so I'm here to speak to you as a peer. Um, I actually had a speech written, lots of things prepared, but wow, there were some wonderful speakers tonight, and they covered every point that I had written down. Um, what I'd like to say is, as board members, your obligation is not to the voters that put you in office, to the people that raised funds for you. Your obligation is to your students, first and foremost. Not their parents, not uh, the staff. First and foremost, your job is to take care of those students. And unfortunately, this policy will put students at risk. Now, I understand that the purpose of this is to strengthen communications between the school and the students and the parents. However, that is not the result, okay? While this, I believe, to be well-intentioned, it will have unintended consequences. And what that is, is it will suppress students feeling comfortable coming out and being who they are. And unfortunately, we know that this leads to increased suicide rates. Or when they do get found out, um, there are increased rates of abuse. Now, I love my children. Um, they're all adults now, and uh, actually, I just became a, a grandfather again yesterday, so I'm really excited. Um, and when they were growing up, I'd take them to the doctor, and I'd always ask, is there anything you'd like to speak to the doctor about privately? And I'd be willing to step out in the hall so they can discuss anything they need. Or if they're going to the therapist, or if they need to talk to their teacher. Because sometimes there are things that kids need to talk about, or deal with, or experience, or whatever, without their parents. That's not a slide against me. That's not a slide against other parents. Oh, my time. Okay, on deck is Dave Butler. Hi, um, my name is Michelle Kapanen, and I'm a resident of Rockland since 1998, and we've had two kids come through the school district and recently graduate Rockland High, and they went to Sierra College, and one's currently there, and they're transferring on. So um, I very much value this school district, this community. What I would like to talk about is um, love and fear. As parents, and I can see here from everyone's passion here as parents, everyone loves their children and want them to grow up to be resilient, strong, self-confident, assured people who are, have self-autonomy. When I hear of this addendum, and at, at first it sounds logical, of course you'd want every parent especially the ones here speaking up who care enough to speak up. They want to know. But the f reality is the stories, the, the off-chance stories that we've heard all evening, when that doesn't, that loving environment, that unconditional love is not there. When you're faced with a child that a parent thinks they don't know, understand. They don't understand, they don't know what's going on, they don't know what this means. It's all very complicated. But for the, trans, the people in the LGBTQ community, they need to, for, I don't know how young you're talking about where this is happening, if it's in the teenage years that is an issue. If kids are young kindergartners, are they playing, are they role playing? Do they have, um, are they gonna get, um, 
teacher paranoid that they're going to start having conversations if they're just role playing. Thank you, Michelle. Time. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not able to tell the difference. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, up next is Dave Butler, and on deck is James Ledbetter. I think it's still evening. Good evening, um, Madam President, members of the board, uh, Mr. Stock. Uh, Dave Butler, I'm a Rockland resident. My wife and I have been in Rockland since uh, 1987, and um, two of our um, daughters have went through Rockland schools, uh, K through 12. And I'm here uh, tonight speaking as a, a father of those two girls and a grandfather of uh, two little girls who hopefully will go through um, Rockland schools. As a Rockland parent at uh, back to school night, we were always told uh, by um, a school site leader uh, that the key to our uh, child's uh, individual success was this partnership between uh, parents, teachers, and administrators. And um, I feel really strongly that parental notification of our child's educational, social, physical, and mental well-being is a fundamental element of that partnership and must be ensured at all grade levels at all times. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Up next is James Ledbetter, and on deck is John Paul. Good evening, my name is James. Uh, thanks for giving me two minutes of your time. Uh, I live in Fair Oaks, my kids go to St. Ignatius. Uh, first off, I would like to say that uh, for each of you, there's an entire community out there of which I am a member that is praying for all of you. Um, we're praying for you guys to have strength, wisdom, and resoluteness with your decision-making process. Um, many of you were elected <clears throat> based on your commitment for faith-based decision-making. The fact that you were elected demonstrates that your community supports that. Several times tonight I've heard that elected officials should not factor faith into their decision-making process. However, this is a gross misunderstanding of our Constitution. The Constitution was written to limit the federal government and to empower individuals and local elected leaders such as yourself. You should absolutely, you can and you should use faith to make your decisions. Our country was founded on a faith-based decision. Our founders recognized that we are endowed with certain inalienable rights, and those come from our creator. They felt this so strongly, the fact that we do not serve an earthly king, we serve a heavenly one, that they started a war in order to found a country where we can spend going on six hours now talking about this issue. You can't do this anywhere else in the world. Our country exists because of a faith-based decision. And we should continue making those. Your community supports that. Uh, the last thing I wanted to address, um, I don't remember who it was, forgive me, I was listening on a phone outside, but somebody earlier had said that uh, they didn't understand who this policy benefited. It benefits the children. Several times this evening, we have been told that the Rockland Unified School District is not a safe space for minors who are members of the LGBTQ community. As such, as soon as they make a declaration that they're a part of that community, they are apparently in imminent danger. That means that their parents should be immediately informed so that they can make the decision on how to best ensure the safety of their child. If it is truly an unsafe space, the parents need to be immediately involved. Thank you. Thank you, James. Up next is John Paul, and on deck is Michelle Paul. Thank you uh, for the time that you guys have put into this. Uh, I'm also known as Papa to the two uh, children in this school district. Um, I support the board's policy to further dialogue between the school, the parents, and the children. I believe empowering and nurturing children, encouraging them to be brave um, and handle tough situations is how they become stronger, more confident in who they are, especially in the face of struggles. This sets them up for success, whoever they choose to be. Thank you for realizing that the first responsibility for our children is with the parents. Everyone else comes after that. Withholding any information from parents would deprive most children, including those from various walks of life, of the right to have the best chances to succeed. Please continue putting Rockland families first. Thanks again. Thank you. 
Now is Michelle Paul, and on deck is Josh Paul. Good evening. I have been a Rockland resident since 2011. My beautiful daughter goes to Rockland Elementary, and we've loved every moment of it. You know, as a parent, we have been entrusted with overseeing the spiritual, mental, and physical development of our children. I see my role in my daughter's life and my son's as highly collaborative. We partner with very influential adults, both at the school and elsewhere, who come alongside us and we work together to support our child's growth. It's why organizations like the PTC exist, to provide occasions for investing in our child's lives, to consent, share ideas, and put that child first. Trustee Sutherland, this, this is the three-legged stool that you mentioned earlier. And earlier tonight, when discussing the science curriculum, you mentioned broken trust. By intentionally withholding information vital to the proper development of the spiritual, physical, and mental growth of our child, those individuals charged with their well-being, that trust is being violated. The most tragic part of this is that while the impact of the broken trust is certainly felt between the adults, the greatest negative impact is to the child. Today, there are systems and structures in place to protect children that live in an unsafe environment. This policy smartly, that's being proposed, smartly engages these existing structures and puts the safety and security of the, ch the child at the forefront. There is no doubt that the, res the conversations resulting from this notification will be intense and, in some cases, highly confrontational. But it is not the state's role or this school district's role to prevent the conversation from even happening. I urge you to pass this policy and thank you for your bravery and in to introduce this common sense measure. Thank you. Okay, up next is Josh Paul and on deck is Justin Kessler. Good evening, I'm, <clears throat> Good evening, I'm Josh. Uh, you've been elected by local residents, including parents of your students like me. Uh, we voted for you because you hold values we like and we expect you to implement them. Thank you for your dedication to our children and continuing to keep parents in the loop with policies like this. I've heard emotional baseless claims that you don't care about our children and this policy would harm them. Well, correlation is not causation, and while I don't propose to know your intentions, I would bet you all want good things for our children and just have different views of how to accomplish that. I believe this policy would actually strengthen the youth in question because anytime you walk alongside and teach children how to be strong, it gives them confidence and sets them up for success, whoever they choose to be, rather than just sheltering them until they leave your class, not learning healthy ways of dealing with conflict. At the end of the day, whether this issue or another issue, the majority of parents should never be put second place to anyone else, especially not an institution or a government. In my line of work, I've personally dealt with hundreds of abusers and their victims, and although I'm only one person, I know it's a small statistic, uh, it has never been because someone was outed. While some tragic stories have been shared, I would argue that maybe additional staff and parental interaction could have had some positive benefits. Please continue passing, passing policies like this. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Josh. Up next is Justin Kessler, and on deck is Kristen Gates. Good evening, board. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you guys for hanging out tonight. Um, actually, I came here for the advisory committee. I saw the story on the news, and I, I felt like the board member was getting unfairly treated. I thought that um, I thought that they were they were they were saying the right thing. And um, we moved here seven months ago, and we moved to this community with um, our four kids, my wife and I because we want it to be in a more conservative community. And so, to be honest, we're pretty, we've been pretty happy with what we've seen. And um, the fact that you guys put this on the table um, kind of solidifies that and, very, and um, shows me that we made the right decision. And I think that's very bold and courageous of you guys to do what you guys um, have done to bring this to the table. I think you guys are the, probably the second, I think you guys are the second um, board that's done that in California. And we all know California's policies are failing. And it's spilling out into our communities and to our children. And I think that 
it's important for parents to make the decisions and um, teachers and faculty and, and schools can help support the students and support the families. Um, again, I want to thank you guys and um, I appreciate you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Up now is Kristen Gates and on deck Atlas Adams. Do we have Kristen? Okay, I'll put it aside for the moment if Kristen comes back. Up next is Atlas Adams. And on deck is Caspin Woodward. My name is Atlas, and I moved to Rockland with my mother in 2012, attending Springview Middle School and Whitney High School. Uh, I was a trans and gay teenager in Rockland, and now I am a happy trans and gay adult in Rockland. I'm just another citizen of Rockland, a human. Trans people live in Rockland too. We too are this community. There is a reason I didn't come out to my parents until I was an adult. When I did, my mom was surprised I hadn't told her. I'm not sure why, since she spent my teenage years telling me how bad gay people are, not knowing she was talking to one. As a teenager, public school was an important place to grow as an individual. I can't imagine where I would be if that environment to grow as a person, not an extension of my parents, was taken away. I'm happier than I ever was as a child before I was given enough space to develop as my own person. Unfortunately, I have seen too many parents who love their idea of who their child should be and not the actual child they have, like my mom. Their idea of helping their child is to force their child to be someone the child is not, but who the parent wants them to be. Children are individual people too, not blank slates for their parents to mold them exactly how they want, like my mother. All my mother's talk of how gay people go to hell so I shouldn't be gay didn't stop me from being gay. It just made me, a child, feel horrible. After coming out, as time went on and my mom saw how happy I am, she came around to supporting me. I know from friends in my community that my experience is not very common, and it chills me that tonight I have heard from many parents who may never come around like my mom did. And children do not deserve to be put in such a dangerous position. I don't think the majority of the board cares about that. But I want to thank all the supporters and allies who came out to support us today, and also uh, board member Sutherland. Thank you. Caspian is up, and Carrie West is on deck. Uh, hello all, my name is Caspian. I'm a Whitney High School graduate. I've been a Rockland resident since 2000, and I'm currently a Sacramento State student. Uh, I am also transgender. I would like to point out that not one person on the school board is transgender. Not one of you has ever had to come out to your parents, to your teachers, to your friends, to anyone. You have no idea the realities and the risks of being openly transgender. And how could you? You've never lived that experience. Transgender people are standing here and we are begging you to reconsider this dangerous policy. And you're sitting at your table and you're lecturing us about our lived experience. You have no idea. The risk is too high. You are wasting money on lawsuits and playing with the lives of transgender children to further your own agenda, and I am disgusted with you, except for you, Michelle Sutherland, you rock. I, I'm truly begging you. I have known people who have lost relationships with their family because they came out as queer. I have known people who have killed themselves because their families couldn't handle it when they came out as queer. This is reality, and I'm sure everyone here loves their children very much, but you don't know how you're going to react until your kid actually comes out. We all like to think we're better people than we are, and the risk is too high. Children could die. Don't play with their lives to push your own political career forward. It's not right. Thank you, Caspian. Carrie West. Hi. So I wish I didn't have to Sorry. be here tonight. I wish this board didn't force me to be here tonight. 
but I also wish you weren't attempting to force teachers to out their students. I wish you weren't so pernicious as to play on people's unfamiliarity with the transgender community to weaponize them to exclude trans, intersex, and gender non-conforming children from healthcare, sports teams, and safe school and home lives. I wish you weren't so deeply fiscally irresponsible in your efforts to force Rockland Unified to spend millions of dollars in legal fees defending this unconstitutional policy in the courts. What you are doing here tonight is insidious. You are weaponizing parents, parents that I absolutely believe love their children for your own political ends. The illogic hurts. Parental consent is a necessity for affording children access to medical care and access to parents' health insurance and health insurance covered gender affirming care. I know none of the children in this district have health care money or coverage of their own. You are endangering the children of Rockland Unified, and you cannot say you aren't, because as many of us have told you in this room, we were those children. We came out. I came out. I was beaten black and blue and thrown out on the street with nowhere to go. It was a teacher who gave me a couch to sleep on. Beyond that, to this school board, aside from Michelle Sutherland, please do better. If you don't, just know I will donate money to your opponents, and I'm the PAC chair of the Sacramento Stonewall Democrats. Come see me for a donation. Thank you. Okay, up next is Dio Wild, and then humans have to take a quick break. We will take a five minute break, and we will come right back after Dio. I am a resident of Placer County, an educator, and myself a member of the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, I had the ability to wait until after high school to come out, and I'm immensely grateful for that because shortly after I found myself homeless. Uh, one of my friends who was forcibly outed to his uh, parents was called slurs and beaten by his parents, and I have two more friends who uh, are trans and unhoused. The rate of unhoused LGBTQ plus youth is one in four. If you cannot ensure that these children are going to be safe after they're outed, please do not forcibly out children. Uh, there's talk about like driving a wedge between children and parents, but oftentimes if these children haven't themselves come out to their parents, there's already a wedge there, and you are going to be driving that wedge further that drives these children out into the streets with nowhere to go. Please, please reconsider uh, your position because the gravity is immense. And uh, also further, this would drive a wedge between the board and between educators, because I know myself as an educator and as a trans person, I would never forcibly out a student. I'm not an educator here in your district, but I will keep my community safe above all else. And I please hope that you consider the impact of your ed educators. Thank you. Thank you, Dio. OK, we're going to take a five minute break. And then we will be right back. Up first, when we come back, will be Aaron Connor Bailey.
your seats. We'll resume. All right. I would like to call Aaron Connor Bailey to the podium, and on deck is Stephen Barasa. Good evening. Thanks for having us all tonight. Uh, my name is Aaron, and I have been an educator in Placer County for a great many years, 20. I raise my children here, and I'm also a member of the LGBTQ community. I want to assure everyone here that I hear from both sides how desperately we love our children and our families. And as always, it's astonishing when they share the same value that we could come at it from two different, very different directions of what's best to keep our kids safe. I want to reiterate to you that you've heard from a lot of people tonight that they were not safe at home when their news was shared of who, their, who they were, what their bona fide identity was. The rest of the comments I had, I'm going to substitute something else I heard tonight, another personal story that hasn't been said tonight. I heard from someone here who was outed in junior high. That person was stabbed by another student the next day, which is shocking and the very epitome of unsafe at school. That makes my heart pound really, really fast. And I want to say to you that creating a witch hunt against LGBTQ children in their own learning environment is not only unacceptable, it is outside the purview of an education board. I don't know what you think you're doing here, but this should not be it. Please continue to serve children, not your religious interests, or any others. Safety is not just about what happens at home. Thank you, Aaron. Up next is Stephen, and on deck is Kevin Cooper. Thank you. Well, I'm a senior member of the gay community. At the time, it was called the gay community. And then all the letters started gradually being added on. And it's overwhelming to see this today in 2023, just the support for the LGBT community. It's mind blowing from where we've come. But you know, I wanna say that this policy, either whichever side you feel about this policy, both are supportive of our community. You know, um, parents are our strongest allies. They're our strongest support. They're our champion. And they're the ones that love us the most. And we gotta give them a chance. Uh, you know, I'm very concerned about the uh, medicalization of children that's being advanced, and I'm very concerned about what's happening in the state capitol, uh, the incremental bills that are being passed that are designed to strip away parental rights. And that's really what's on the table here, is they're trying to take away the rights of the parents and give it to the state for medical decisions. It's happening with birth control, abortion, and now gender affirming care. One particular bill, AB 665, which is on the, you know, working its way through now, you know, allows a 12 year old to check out of their home and into a state facility uh, and uh, without any abuse of the parents, just they don't want to check out, they can do it. Um, and it's very frightening. Um, we need to defend our children, and parents are the line of defense for their kids. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Up next is Kevin Cooper, and on deck is Lance Christensen. <clears throat> Hello, board. Uh, thank you all very much for uh, taking time to listen to everybody. I had a chance to listen to the hoots and hollers from speeches who people, I guess, were using thesauruses to remind our community how bad we are. Mostly spokes from out of town based on the license plates I could see. And the hoots and hollers you guys generated for an idea that government can replace parents, which is silly. 
I had a chance to listen to everybody talk at you and tell you how bad you are. I had a chance to listen to them be creative in the way they described you. I live here. I taught a lot of kids in this town how to hit baseballs, girls do cheerleading stuff and made sure they got financing, Sunday school, football, the whole thing. And I'm tired of hearing that. Ordinary Sutherland, we're a good community. And the people that work with you that come to do this kind of stuff are not nice people. They come and they throw emotional rocks at people and talk about, about all the bad things that are going on. You have a degree from UC wherever. Mine's not. Make them bring the data. The state tracks suicide. The state tracks a lot of stuff. And we know for a fact that there are no people listed in the state database that, have been, that went through suicide in Placer County because it's tracked. Ask some questions. I'm tired of people using their problems as an emotional stick to take away parents' rights. We have kids. We work with them as best we can. We love them. We sacrifice for them. And I'm tired of hearing about how terrible parents are. Mistakes are made, but nobody's giving their parents' rights up to any government. We're doing the best we can, and I'm super thankful for your support. Thank you, Kevin. Up next is Lance, and on deck is NG Reed. Thank you, board president, superintendent, and members. I appreciate the time that you put into listening to so many people and is standing up for state law, the Constitution, and the 14th Amendment right for parents. My name is Lance Christensen, the vice president of the California Policy Center and a father of five, and I live in a school district next door. I'm here to speak today about trust. Let's just walk through a scenario really quickly. Little Johnny in fourth grade decides he wants to become Sally, and he tells his teacher that. His teacher excitedly affirms Johnny becoming Sally, doesn't ask any questions, but Johnny's friend Max is curious about this. But Johnny's teacher tells Max not to tell his parents or anybody else. And when Max goes home and tells his mother, his mother calls Johnny's mom and says, what's this about Sally? And the mother asks, asks the question, what are you talking about? Confused, this is a real life scenario. And in fact, it has to do with trust. When the trust is broken between a teacher and a parent, as has happened to me, it's very difficult to get it back. We've heard a lot of heartbreak today. So much pain in this room. There's a lot of problems in our society that can't be fixed here. It's going to be fixed in the family. But if we want to talk about fiduciary responsibility, just ask your colleagues in Spreckles School District how much it cost them when they hid the identity of kids who had been transitioned. You swore an oath on the Constitution. It's above all other oaths that you gave. And in the end, if you want the best parental notification policy, honesty is that policy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lance. NG and on deck is Joe Patterson, Assemblyman Joe Patterson. Hello. I'm NG. I am a former Whitney student, and I'm here to bring you some much needed perspective on this policy. If this is to be implemented, it's going to have a primary result and a secondary result. The primary is the initial outing, which has a best case scenario of a teacher telling a parent who already knows and is accepting about their kid's identity. Your best case scenario here is neutral. Your worst case scenario is anything from a permanently ruined relationship between a parent and child all the way to abuse, kicking your kid out of their house, or suicide. The second effect is that now students who are entering these schools will know this policy is in place and will know that they cannot trust teachers with their identities. The only shoulder that someone who cannot trust their parents has to cry on is being taken away from them by this policy. If you implement this, it has zero positive effects. The best case, again, is neutral and a myriad of potential negatives. Thank you. Thank you. 
Assemblyman Joe Patterson, followed by Tom Oates. Well, great. Thank you so much uh, for having me. My name is Joe Patterson. I am a uh, father of four children, three of them which go to uh, Rockland Schools, proudly, Sunset Ranch Elementary School, and a fourth eventually will go there as well. Um, you know, I've been listening the whole night. Uh, we were at Whitney Junior Wildcats football practice and cheer and uh, did dinner and everything. I said, I'm going to have plenty of time to get over there. So went on a run and then got over here. And, um, you know, I just think it was really that important to be there with my family first before coming over here. But I appreciate all the people that waited many hours to be here. But I'm not really here to talk about the policy. Actually, I'm here to just really thank you for your service and the commitment that you're making to the community, all of you and, and staff included, for sitting through this. Um, you know, in my uh, professional life, um, I've been on the receiving end of, um, you know, some interesting comments and really hateful comments. And I don't think anybody in our community in Rockland uh, that is elected out here um, is doing it out of ego or anything other than the love for the community. And I'm really thankful to all of you for volunteering for this job. And yes, you were elected by the people and you work for the people in this volunteer capacity, but it really is a volunteer opportunity because you love this community. And I'm thankful for that. And I wish we could replicate all of you, you know, 1,000 times throughout the rest of the county. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. And now Tom Oates, followed by Kathleen Victoria Gwen. All right, I really have to follow Joe. Um, my name is Tom Oates. My parents moved here in the 80s, and I've lived here my whole life, going through Rockland Unified and Sierra College. I do not have any children, but I am here anyway, because this regulation change isn't about me. It's not about you. I am not speaking for myself in the same way that I'm not speaking for you. We are not saying you don't love your child. We are not calling you the unaffirming parent. This is not a personal attack on you, your beliefs, your family, or your choices. What this is about is protecting those that are vulnerable those who are not being represented here tonight, those who are seeing abuse at home, those who feel safer at school than at home, those whose unaffirming parents are not here tonight. Nothing about this says a child is required to come out to their teacher first. If a child comes out to their parent, we won't force them to tell their teacher because this is no one's right to tell their story besides the child. If they choose to come out to their friends first, that is their choice. If they come out to their teacher first, that is their choice. And if they come out to their parents first, that is their choice. They get to choose their support network. If you love and want the best for children, all children, then let them choose. Do not support this regulation change. Thank you. Thank you. Catalina. Up next, Amanda Dixon. I am known as the Scarlet Huntress, and I authored The Rose Stain 10. I was born in Salinas and raised in Soledad, but for the past several years, I'm now the third generation in my family's 1965 Loomis estate. Over the past month, we have been moving in our fourth our son may attend Whitney or Dar Oro next term. My educators saved my life. Due to birth trauma, I have several cognitive disabilities, testing off the charts in some areas and well below where they should have been in others. Due to this, I was in and out of special ed, mainstream, and honors courses, as well as IEPs throughout my education. Some years later, my youngest son, who was very emotionally troubled from his alcoholic parents' relationship, was also in these programs. 
My father was an educator at Soledad District, and I was one of the kids who would be at the educator's summer ping pong retreats and home poker nights. Some of them were close friends. Through middle school, I escaped into the library and developed a strong rapport with the librarian. They gave me an ear and a place to go when there was nowhere else. It's because of these connections and support that I formed that sophomore year, I didn't pull the trigger on half my class. I found another razor blade instead. You see, I've never wanted to hurt anybody. I just wanted the pain to stop. I could never understand why I was the only one who wanted to save the caterpillars from the class wall while most of the other students would throw their ball at them and squish them. I would take them home and watch them transform before releasing them. I've survived more than 13 suicide attempts. A fair amount of my body is coated in mental health battle scars. Though I had support, the world was too unkind to bother to keep me safe. I'm 37 years old. I'm one of the ones who shouldn't be here. I'm a grown-up trans kid who wasn't a Thank you. Thank you. Amanda Dixon and on deck. Oh, Amanda, you're the last. My name is Amanda Dixon, and we have two children in the Rockland District. I've served on committees for the last four years. You have helped our family more times than I can count. You are open, honest, and always available. You are faced with challenges every day, and it's easy for people to criticize what you do. You are our friends, neighbors, and parents as well, but most importantly, human beings. My hope is for people to understand the rules and bylaws you must follow collectively as a group when making decisions. Please know we are grateful for all you do and we'll be behind you 100%. We go to church. We do not go to destiny. I have four gay uncles and I support them just the same. Where is the other side being represented today? Where is the safety for the Christ-loving children and parent involvement? Oh yeah, they got, they got blocked and bullied outside. Where did these people get bust in from? If they think they have a right over my child, over my dead body, Michelle, your reputation precedes you, and we see you. Please continue to listen with an open mind, but block out all the negativity and childish behavior. When life throws you a curveball, knock it out of the park. Pass this policy. This has always been about protecting the children and the family unit. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Do we have public comment? There's public comment. Right, right. And there's no more on the agenda items. Okay, so the first thing at this point is um, is there a motion to approve the revision to Administrative Regulation 5020, Parent Rights and Responsibilities, and Administrative Regulation 5145.3, Non-Discrimination Harassment? So moved. First by Trustee Counter. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Sadoff. Georgia, will you please call the I roll? Just, I would like to just speak before this is taken. Just We've heard so much tonight, and I just want to really think about these comments and that have been made multiple times that this is addressing a problem that doesn't exist. We know, all of you know up here, that our USC teachers are not engaging in any of the impropriety that others have talked about in other areas. And instead of encouraging the trust and encouraging those who come out in support of you to say, 
just know our RUSD teachers are not doing that. They are not encouraging secrecy. They are just accepting students at face value. And we have the tools for them if they say, I don't know what to do. I want to talk to my parents. Nobody is encouraging secrecy as been, has been described in other areas. I also think it's really important to say we don't have the supports for students to follow through on this, for students who then are outed. We don't to ensure that they're safe. And I feel that with the changes or the considerations that you've made to say, well, this isn't for private conversations. This is only if they actually want to show outwardly some element of who they are. I think it's right on to say, OK, well, then it's not really about trans. It's about you wanting to show that you're trans. And again, I just, we don't have the ability to make sure that these students are safe. And that tells me that it's not even really about it. it. That's telling me that there are trans kids that will exist and you're okay with it as long as they're not open with it. And it just, it reminds me, it's erasure of them. And it reminds me of what you all did last year with the email signature thing where you don't want teachers to be able to have inclusive messages in their email. So we're going to we're going to take away signs that students feel that there's support and then we're just going to throw them into whatever situation. We have to think about each of us have to think about the outside world, outside of our own home life situation. I believe that everyone that spoke here truly feels that they will care for their child regardless of what they do. I think all of these are the best intentions, but we are a public school district that serves so many, and we cannot claim to know what other parents feel or would do. So I just, those were some of the take homes from all that we heard, and I really feel that we have an opportunity to channel the concerns that both interests have into parent empowerment to organically, to constructively improve relationships of this three-legged stool. I actually agree with you on that. And I think um, that that can come from this. I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think we can do both. I think we can definitely do both. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. Did you want to say more? OK. okay. You know, Michelle, I, uh, I thank you for your comments. Um, I think we, we heard a lot tonight from people who care, are concerned, are afraid, are worried. And a lot of times we go about things in different ways. Um, I will say when it comes to we cannot claim to know what parents would feel or do, I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. And that's why this is actually really important to me because I do think there are a lot of assumptions being made that parents um, wouldn't care deeply and wouldn't want to walk through a situation with their child. And so I do think there were many things said tonight that were actually quite inaccurate statements. And I do feel a responsibility as a trustee to address a few of them. Um, so I'll go through them really quickly. Um, but, but I want you to know, um, earlier we got to share our whys of why this was important. And it's been said many times tonight that this is a political agenda, a religious agenda. Um, I, I will reiterate that I have had parents, teachers, staff approach me about this policy uh, because they're very concerned for a variety of reasons. Um, but there were many things quoted tonight that we haven't spent time painstakingly going through every word of the proposed policy. Uh, that's actually not accurate and not true. We have not only received very clear legal counsel that the policy that is being provided tonight does not break state or federal law, and I'm happy to go through a few of those in just a moment. Um, but I myself has also met with multiple civil rights attorneys, both at the state and federal level, that have agreed with that. And so I have had people ask tonight why I'm comfortable moving forward with this policy. And I do think that our, our, our parents, our students, our staff deserve to hear from us. 
And so I want to share with you why this um, is a struggle hearing such grave concern, but why I also feel it is not the place of a trustee to go against many things at the state and federal level. Um, several Calig codes were quoted tonight, many of them Calig code 200, 220, 200 is about equal rights and opportunities for our students, which I fully support. And actually 5145 shows that. I fully support equal rights for all students. 220 that was quoted talks about no person shall be, shall be subjected to discrimination. I 100% agree with that. That is not what this policy says in any way. There was talk about Title IX, AB 1266, Cal Ed Code violations. Each of those are unsubstantiated. Both AB 1266 and Cal Ed Code do not indicate anywhere that notifying a parent is prohibited. 5145 shows multiple areas that our students still have the rights that are afforded to them as they should. And I know some in the community are concerned about that. Tonight, what we are discussing and we are addressing is a conversation with a parent. And right now, there is no state or federal law that says that a student's rights supersede a parent's rights. It's not in writing anywhere. And so it was also mentioned Chino Valley's resolution. We are not passing Chino Valley's resolution tonight. We are passing an amendment to 50, 20, and 51, or I am mentioning uh, 50, 20, and 51, 45.3 couple things about the TRO tonight or today with Chino Valley it does not apply to any other school district it applies to that school district only and the resolution that they passed I want to reiterate this is not Chino Valley's resolution additionally it makes the uh, an assumption was made in court today that parent rights should be waived due to possible harm I will never support harm in a home, harm of a child, never have, never will. That is not what this policy says. This policy says that at the request of a child, at the request, at the request, it says it three times. Finally, I wanna get back to our policies, 5020, why this is important to me, and it connects to the statement said a little bit earlier is in our 5020 policy, which is actually enacted back in 2019. We're just making one amendment. It is a very important policy because it cites Cal Ed Code 20 different times as to the rights of a parent. And there are actually many rights that when this was first brought forward and I saw it, I said, that's already in our Ed Code. It's actually, this is already addressed in our Ed Code and I'll read it or in our um, 5020, and I'll read it in just a minute, um, but it was communicated to me that our, our policy is not clear, that our regulation is not clear, and that without this verbiage, it is unclear, and that is why Section 21 is being added in, and I just want to mention a few of them. If you haven't had a chance to look at 5020, number 16 speaks specifically to a parent receiving information about any psychological testing the school does involving their child. This is Ed Code 551101. Number 17 already states, again, this is from 2019, backed by CSBA and Education Code, to refuse to submit or to participate in any assessment, analysis, evaluation, or monitoring of the quality or character of the student's home life, any form of parental screening or testing, any non-academic goes on to talk about counseling programs. Number 19, to question anything in their child's record that the parent guardian feels is inaccurate or misleading or is an invasion of privacy and to receive a response from the school. That's Ed Code 51101. Finally, 20, to provide informed written parental consent before their child is tested for behavioral, mental, or emotional evaluation. This is Ed Code 49091.12. There have been abundant comments tonight that it is our responsibility to follow state and federal law, and right now that is what is required of us. This notification policy is covered, I believe, by 16, 17, 19, and 20. 
However, I've been told abundantly by staff that it is not clear, and therefore it is the responsibility of the board to make clear the right and role of a parent to work with the school, with their student. That is why I believe 21 is important. Thank you. I will say, though, that these points here, which are often related to evaluations that are done with consent, I don't believe that that applies. And it's interesting, actually, that this says that the parents have a right to refuse to participate in any assessment or monitoring of the quality or character of the student's home life, which I don't disagree with, but doesn't that tell you how limited we are in knowing what a student's home situation is before we make a decision like this, right? I, I just, this is, and to say that it's not discriminatory when we're specifically talking about one group, how it, that is on its face discriminatory, I'm concerned that it has, that notification may be made by a counselor in the language because I believe those conversations to be confidential or maybe, Maybe I'm incorrect on that. But I do think that the one thing that we know is legal is what we have in place right now, which has not posed any problems right now. And I wish that we had our legal counsel here to ask questions in real time for the public, because as confident as you are, it would have been really good for the public to hear. I just appreciate um, Derek and Julie. Thank you for working with the attorney. And you know, I, I appreciate the 16-page legal memo that we received. I have full confidence in that. And um, I, I know that that was um, that that was developed within um, the cooperation of her, and that it complies with our current law. So I feel confident in that. I feel confident moving forward. Again, this is complicated. This is emotional. This um, I appreciate all of those that were willing to share young and old, and um, be, be vulnerable. Um, I still go back to, um, for me, the intent is to lean in and see these children for who they are and to support them, and that takes parents and teachers. It was, it was brought up a couple times, you know, Chino, uh, their policy, other district policies, et cetera. I think in, in our conversation and looking at different things, in no way in Rockland do I want to just copy and paste something that was done by somebody else. You want to look at it, you want to evaluate it, you want to discuss it, you want to redline it, you want to cross things out, add things, subtract things, et cetera. We went through that. We went through that with the lawyers. That's why in the conversation and in section one, on 5143 down there, it's really just two simple ads, with the exception of parent notification, and to all other persons except the student and their parents. Everything else in that policy is exactly the same as it was two months ago, two years ago, what, however it went through when, when we passed it. All we're doing is adding parent notification, parent communication, keeping those people involved. And as long as we always maintain the parent communication, the child conversation, and help out kids if they need help when they're discussing anything, relationships, problems, challenges, whatever. And I think we have amazing teachers that do that every day, every week. I just want to continue that. I don't want to have one random policy over here that says we don't do that, but everything else we do. We need to be congruent. We need to align it all together. We need to never put some hindrance, some little wall, some little speed bump in that says, well, if this comes up, we avoid that conversation. I think we want to always have that conversation between the students and the parents and the teachers, and then whatever comes up, any of the challenges, all that stuff that happens as you mature through from adolescence into adulthood and going through the schools, that we work those through with the family. Can I add one more thing? Um, when you were asking about um, resources, 
when I was talking to the counselors and the school psychologists this week at both high schools, uh, we do have resources available in Superintendent Stock. If there's some that I'm missing, please let me know. That include wellness together intervention, care solace referrals, a crisis resolution center. There is also an LGBTQ county resource to support families. Um, and also, I think that something that uh, was a takeaway for me, and maybe we can put it either um, maybe on our parent university list of classes, is that we provide some additional resources for families on how to have these and other kinds of challenging conversations. I think that there's a real need even among adults for some of those kinds of skills. Okay, Georgia, will you please call the roll? Derek Counter? Yes. Tiffany Sadoff? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Michelle Sutherland? No. Julie Hupp? Yes. Motion passes. And now we will go to Barbara Patterson, Deputy Superintendent Business and Operations, uh, to present resolution number 232404, approving the prepayment in part of the 2020 tax exempt refund lease. Thank you, Pres President Hub, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Stock. Um, the current outstanding principal of the 2020 tax exempt refunding lease is $12,919,000. By making this one time prepayment of $7 million in principal, you will be saving the district almost $1 million in interest um, over the, the remaining term of this financing instrument. This payment will be made with the proceeds from the sale of lot uh, 49. So, staff requests that you approve this resolution. Any questions? Thank you for all your work on this, Barbara. Yes, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you for going through that. So much work. And there's no comments about this. Okay. Um, so do we have a motion to approve the resolution number 232404? So moved. Was that you? Yeah. Uh, first by Trustee Sutherland. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Price. Georgia, will you please call the roll? Derek Counter? Yes. Tiffany Sadoff? Yes. Rochelle Price? Yes. Michelle Sutherland? Yes. Julie Hupp? Yes. Motion passes. Um, there was an item eight on the agenda. It was an information item. We are going to skip that item and move it to the next um, meeting. Do we have public comments? Oh, no, not on that. No, okay. Um, but then we are going to move to item 9.1, um, public comment. And I will remind you, um, the things up on the board still apply. Um, and I'm going to repeat, public comment is an opportunity for members of the public to address the Board of Education in open meeting. Members of the public are encouraged to address the board concerning any item on the agenda or any item of interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. The board will not take action or have discussion on any item not appearing on the posted agenda except as authorized by law. Matters not within our jurisdiction or purview are not appropriate for public comment. The board would like to hear from all those who have come to speak. Please be mindful that there are many people who wish to be heard. For this reason, we ask that clapping be kept to a minimum and the noise level be held down to allow each individual to have their complete time. We note that the views and comments expressed during public comment are those of the individual speaker and do not necessarily reflect the opinions, beliefs, or positions of the district, the board, or district staff. The district believes in an inclusive, welcoming, and safe environment for its meeting for all of our community. The board respects each individual's rights to express ideas and opinions. We expect speakers to refrain from personal attacks based on protected categories under state and federal law, including race, religion, disability, and sexual orientation. The board will not permit any disturbance or willful interruption of board meetings. Persistent or excessive disruption by any individual or group shall be grounds for the board president to terminate the privilege of addressing the board. We appreciate the public's participation and your assistance in keeping this board meeting efficient. I think we are 
all ready to move forward with that. And I have first Amanda Dixon and on deck Brian Faircloth. Oh, this was the same thing. Okay. So for 9.1, we have Brian Faircloth and on deck Price Johnson. Once again, Brian Faircloth, uh, resident of Roseville and Placer County. I want to thank you for allowing me to speak. I want to call your attention to a lot of folks have talked about, oh, at the state level, we're all getting, everything is good coming out of Sacramento. I heard a lot of those comments. One of the things I'd like to, to mention that LCAP, which is the name change of the accountability program, <clears throat> if you were not a resident of this world and you came down and you took a look at that policy, you would say that is the most racist policy that could ever be adopted by anybody. It actually categorizes and forces the local school districts uh, under the auspices that you're gonna have money taken away from you if you don't categorize all your students. And I would, I would ask you to take a look at that and give it a good uh, consideration that it's another policy coming from Sacramento that's actually a racist policy, not helping the student's policy. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Up next is Price Johnson with Josephine Toppins on deck. Hi, thank you for your time. Uh, I'd like to jump right into it and try and address two things in my two minutes time. Uh, first of all, uh, the non-apology that uh, President Hupp started this meeting with, um, I, I do believe is a dishonest mi uh, misframing of the situation. Um, Ms. Hupp, I was that parent that contacted you in your opening statement, as you know, as you hastily contacted back at midnight when I expressed my concerns. I am the angry parent that went searching for more information, Mr. Counter, Ms. Sethoff, Ms. Price, about why our science curriculum was pulled this year, because I moved to this district for my children's long-term education. I moved here so they could get the best. And to walk into my homerooms for both my elementary students to find out that they did not have approved science by this board, a, a curriculum that had been reviewed by 24 educators that had been left open for two months for public opinion and received nothing but 21 glowing and or supportive or constructive comments in favor of the curriculum. For this board to feel that they have the authority, the expertise, the knowledge to make a decision opposite of that, and then the only official post that they make from any of their official pages comes from the president of the board's page requesting Christ-like and family-focused parents to get involved. We have no issues with you. I believe truly, Ms. Hupp, you are a good person that does not make you good at your job, and you have demonstrated that this last week. And I just want to let all of you know, Mr. Counter, Ms. Sathoff, Ms. Hupp, Ms. Price, you have failed not just my elementary age children this week, but you have failed countless children, more than you will know that you impacted by this decision. And lastly, Ms. Hupp, we heard a lot tonight about allegations of being bust in. I'm one of the parents that showed up here at three o'clock today, and it is incredibly disappointing and hurtful to see your husband standing aside those calling us bust in, calling us activists, and continuing to boo speakers like the teacher. Thank you, Price. Thank you, Mr. Up Johnson. Up next is Josephine. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Josephine. Okay, Marcy Johnson with Bruce Yandel on deck. Um, it's hard for me to come up here. As somebody who actually grew up in the church, I actually went to a small church that taught me how to love and how to be compassionate. Um, Coming here and being told by people who say they are from the church 
and have Christ-like views telling me that I am busing people in here, telling me that I am not here under the right pretenses is just crazy to me. Um, I don't agree with your post. And to be honest, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be so upset right now had you just owned that what you said was so problematic. Your post was so problematic and apologized for it, but you didn't. You doubled down. You did. You doubled down. You loved a comment calling me out as a mob. You liked the comment too. And it's just, it's so sad. It's so sad. And I just, I just, I, I can't. I can't. I'm, I am losing my faith. I am on the verge of losing my faith because it's people like you who want to use your faith in just the wrong ways. And I just don't agree with it. I don't agree with it. I don't agree with the big churches in this area who want to spout out saying anybody who doesn't believe their views is going to hell. Isn't that the biggest form of judgment anybody could ever place on anybody? Aren't we called not to judge people? I'm pretty confident that's what we are. We're not supposed to judge people. So why is it okay for people to yell at me saying I'm going to hell? I don't agree with your posts. I don't think you guys have a, a, enough of an opinion to make those revisions that you guys made. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Up next is Bruce, and on deck is Mark Pimentel. I'm Bruce Yandel. I'm speaking as a elementary parent. Um, I would, I'm requesting some clarification from the board. Um, maybe you could address it next meeting on whether the Amplify Science curriculum is going to be included and as one of the curriculum that's going to be considered for the committee that's um, being formed. Um, it's my understanding that the negative vote was based on was based on the process and not on the program. And um, so when 24 educators get together and they have a unanimous um, endorsement of that program, I would like for that program to be considered in this next review. And I want to make sure that there's some assurances that that program will still be considered because that's the program we use in the middle school and that's a program that I know a number of uh, other parents consider to be the best program available, and I want to make sure that that's under consideration. So I would like an answer from the, from the board in the next meeting to assure that that program is included in the review process. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Up next is Mark, and on deck is Jacob B. Mark. Okay, Jacob B. On deck, Mike Murray. Good morning, board. Take a look around at how many folks came out tonight to share their thoughts and concerns with your action, uh, with with your planned actions tonight. I would like to voice my disappointment in your refusal to choose a larger and more appropriate venue, given the level of interest in tonight's meeting. You had every reason to believe that tonight would draw a large crowd and requests were made to move to a larger venue, but you chose not to. Would you please take a few moments to explain to the audience why moving to a larger venue was not done? It amounts to suppression of voices in this community. When you make people wait, for four hours outdoors, half of that in the sun, you're suppressing people's voices. It is difficult for people to come out and endure that. And I understand that some of that was due to just the number of comments that people wanted to make, but this could have been held in a high school gym where everyone could have been seated indoors while they waited. You suppressed voices tonight. Thank you, Jacob. Up next is Mike Murray with 
Chris Von Coven Collenberg. Thank you. Uh, Mike Murray, Rockland, thank you again for letting me speak tonight. Um, I just wanted to come up to say thank you uh, to this board. You guys are really probably the best in the state. You true leaders, true heroes. Um, thank you for always standing and doing what's right. You guys have been amazing for our community, have represented us well, have had good morals and values all the way through, have done everything correctly. Thank you so much. This is why we all voted for you. So thank you. Um, that's all I got. Thank you, Mike. OK, Chris. My name is Chris von Kallenberg. Uh, I live in Rockland. My son goes to Granite Oaks. He's in the eighth grade. So I'm an IT manager. I've been in IT for 24 years. I hold a plethora of security certifications, including CISSP, Certified Penetration Tester, Certified Forensic Analyst, et cetera. Um, my wife and I are here today to inform the board and fellow Rockland USD families that district staff are actively working to prevent parents from being involved in what their child is doing online at school. This is contrary to what you guys even voted for tonight in terms of all the transparency speak. After several years of trying to work this issue out unsuccessfully with staff members across two schools and the district itself, we felt it was our responsibility as parents to bring this to the attention of the board and the parents in the district who care about what their children are being allowed to be exposed to while at school when they're supposed to be getting an education. We're asking the board to provide an immediate and unhindered, unhindered monitoring solution, providing transparency to parents that are interested in their children's online activities while at school. The district's current GoGuardian solution fails to provide this. Our statements evidenced by the following facts. The district used to provide internet usage reports to parents. The district will not even provide these reports to administrative staff or special education staff when requested now. The district has explicitly stated that the district does not maintain internet browsing data on its students, yet the manufacturer of the district's internet filter GoGuardian states in its administration manual that the system stores six months worth of browsing data. After being denied reports, the use of our own internet monitoring software on district Chromebook, et cetera, um, I was able to manually extract some internet traces and found that the district internet filter was allowing my son to browse a plethora of inappropriate content, graphic violence, and playing video games for hours at school every day of the past couple of years. Happy to provide evidence supporting all of this. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. That's the time. I know you waited till 1 o'clock in the morning. Thank you for staying. <laughs> All right, I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Pending agenda, item 10, pending agenda items. Trustees, do you have any items to be placed on the pending agenda? Um, I would like to suggest putting on, um, I guess, action on a policy for receiving community input when we put out the um, new curriculum for review. So can I ask about that? Um, yeah, so um, receiving we, the, the, well, so the board recently changed from doing the spreadsheet to just asking for individual emails. So I know there was some concern about delay in receiving them, but I think it would be worth exploring options to where we could get them as they're received in real time but then we all have the same information that we're working off of. Does that sound like something we need a policy for, or is that something we could just correct? Um, if, if the board had a consensus to give direction to me, uh, I can work through that, but if it's something the board wanted to discuss, then you could agendize it either um, as either an information or action item. But um, the board had previously given direction to uh, staff to uh, use individual emails and not uh, collect uh, parent feedback through any other means. And so if you would like 
if that would like to be changed, I would seek direction from the board. Uh, and that can be done either through discussion, like I said, as an information item or as an action item. But uh, until I have different direction from the board, um, then we would proceed as we have. Yeah, I was just, just asking, um, Michelle, are we looking at getting community feedback on, on the committee? Is this the same as the committees, or is this from everybody not on the committee? No, feedback, well, from anyone, any parent who's reviewing during the review period, like we've done in the past, but before it took a long time for us to get that spreadsheet. But I would like to look at, I mean, the technology exists to where we could just receive the information in real time and then we're we're all getting it mm -hmm. and then district staff who are in charge of running all of this also can have it too so i'm it, guessing we all have an interest in that yeah yeah that i guess I, where i'm going is information I think, fast yeah roger the process is we when you go through it where there's some kind of score sheet some kind of summary of of the feedback i would think it's just the supplemental here's here's all the different people's feedback that you attach to it like as an appendix but here's the summary sheet Right, in what in the process we had we had used that I think I'm hearing just the request for modification is is that when after the uh, presentation the information item like for example tonight we were going to have on Spanish and we would <coughs> delay to the 20th was then we open up the required 30 day public comment period and then uh, an option could be that we could put up a like a like a, like a Google sheet or something that would allow community you know, community and parents to write in on that, their comments, and there is an, an option in the, uh, to have that be that the, the trustees could view it in real time, that there is no filtering, there is no delay. Um, that is an option. Uh, currently, what we do is we just have the emails uh, for families to email you individually. Um, yeah, I, I think we, we discussed this recently, and I know some of the concern I shared then, and, and, and again, this was just very recent, um, was that there are many formats that parents like to choose. Um, and there are some times where a parent may want to approach one member of the board or four members of the board. Um, and so I know there is conversation and discussion and frustration before um, about there being one format that parents had to write into a public document. Um, not everybody wants their comments to a board member to be made public. And so um, I feel the community, um, we have made ourselves abundantly available. Um, I know many of us, I know for sure, including myself, my cell phone is everywhere. People misuse it often. I, I get signed up for lots of surveys. It's quite fun. Um, but I, I make myself available via cell phone, via email, um, happy to chat with people, um, but I, I, I do see concern um, in saying that there needs to be one format um, that essentially is weighted higher than other forms of conversation. And the reason I say that is it has been said recently, uh, multiple times, uh, that the decision regarding the science curriculum um, and the, the statement made to me by multiple individuals was that I used unofficial comments from parents. Uh, there is not a, a formal official comment as opposed to an unofficial comment. If a parent chooses not to utilize um, a public uh, Google Sheet, um, but they choose to call me, that is still a very official comment to me. Um, and so I do not feel at this time that it's necessary to institute um, a format that we saw only 21 parents use. That is not to say that they cannot email or call, but to not have an official way to contact not just the board, but the district on what is being put forth, it seems like, why wouldn't we? And it's not, it doesn't have to be public either from, right? I mean, it's... Superintendent Strzok, is that okay? Um, the, I mean, the, I mean, the Google Sheet could uh, be, you know, shared as, uh, so trustees could, could see that. Um, uh, and but I, I would just say is, uh, is that sh that document would be a public record, um, just as emails would be a public record. Um, and the names would be shown. Um, the names uh, typically are shown. We can't require folks to put in a name. We obviously usually we have like a name, 
you know, what if you have greater or greater school your children attends, and then what's your comment? That's typically the type of information we collect. Um, and then again, we we don't we can't require somebody put in all that information, but but that's typically what we. What do you think the best way is to navigate this? If we have, um, I mean, we could do a subcommittee where you can get the intent and they can work with you and brainstorm some ideas. Um, that That's an option. It also, um, you know, that is an option if the board wishes to uh, pursue that. Um, other, or it also could be, uh, you know, a, a discussion of the board as an information item as well at a future meeting if, if the board, uh, according to its bylaws, wishes to pursue that. Um, but until Michelle? I have direction from the board, counter to what I have now, um, we would proceed as we have. Michelle, what do you think would best serve the interest that you hold, agendizing it or forming a committee? So this would be taken to which committee? The board uh, does have the option to form a subcommittee of itself to work on issues and then it can report back to the whole board um, you know, it's work, um, and that, that's a practice that's used by boards to uh, allow it to facilitate work, uh, whether it's on a policy or on some other area, um, and, and that would, it could be a subcommittee of no more than two members of the board. I think I either I would be fine. I'm happy to do, to have a subcommittee put into place to look at it, or, or if it's easier to just have some information come to an agenda item. I'm open. I just I think um, eliminating that does limit feedback. I think it's a lot harder to then email extra steps, and then the district also isn't seen. And I think we all need to see. It doesn't mean that other comments are less valuable, but to have a channel where parents can easily submit feedback to the district seems appropriate. So I. Subcommittee sounds fine if that seems to be something of interest to I guess just else. going back, are we talking about a specific topic that we want feedback from, or is this just general? I mean, is it like anything different than public comment or emails that we already get? No, it's specifically for when we have a curriculum that we're opening up to the public for the review period. Okay, so, so, so I, I think the committee, like we have, a, we have review committees that go through that and they get that feedback. So you're saying that when we do the, and I'm going to ruin this, so I apologize. When we do the 30-day mm -hmm. notice period, yep. if, if anybody's got feedback, yes. they would, we, we would get that mm -hmm. feedback. Right yeah. now, if they had that feedback, or go back five months, two years, does that, all that feedback just goes to a committee member or members, or does it? Currently, the way we did the high school science and the French <laughs> per board direction was uh, we posted the uh, trustees, uh, you know, official emails and invited uh, the community to give direct email messages to you all. There, that, that was the process we used then. Um, and we currently have until I receive further board direction. So is there a motion to create a committee or a motion to place an item on the agenda? Can I say it that way? Okay. Well, I'll make a motion for the subcommittee. Okay. Is there a second? I think that's a great idea to brainstorm. Do you second? Okay. So first by Trustee Sutherland, second by Trustee Price. Is this just an I or an A? Um, but it would be great if you could name the subcommittee so I'd know oh, who to yes. work with. Yeah, just, I just so past precedence for us has never been that we voted on a subcommittee. It was typically one trustee brings forward an item, and if a second trustee is interested, then they can engage with the superintendent and or legal counsel and then discuss bringing an item back to the board. I haven't seen us as a public body had a necessity to make this an agendized item. I would suggest we don't. I think it's the purview of the board, and it's incredibly important that the board sets the direction of how meetings will be ran and how we receive uh, comments and dialogue. Um, I would like to say I just I, I, I would have a concern that this becomes a a public platform um, that could be misused and we've had a history of it being misused um, in, in, in public 
comment, we are able to address if there is speech that is hate crime or if there's speech that is inappropriate to the topic. Um, so I, I, because I won't be a part of the subcommittee, I would just like to mention um, that I would be more interested in it being feedback to the board or feedback to those that are making the decisions, whether it be the, the curriculum committee. It's just, I'm just only talking about relevant to a, evaluating a curriculum, not similar to the spreadsheet that was going on during COVID when people were writing, like just relevant to that. Yeah. Do you want to be on the subcommittee? Okay. okay. I'm happy to do it. So let's so then the subcommittee would bring the ideas brainstorm bring the ideas back to the board and that would then be something that the board would vote on um it, it could work through a couple ways uh, one is the uh, board committee could um uh subcommittee could work with me to draft a memorandum of the uh work of the subcommittee and um and we could we can go from there um another option is it could be put on as just an information item and then the board could discuss the subcommittee's work and you know, through that conversation, direction may be given to me. It doesn't necessarily require a vote, but um, what I'm looking for is, is just direction from the board. Okay. And, you know, um, Great. So there are a couple options. So um, I'll, I'll work with a subcommittee um, be, uh, because we have um, uh, a couple adoption pieces coming up. Sure. Great. Thank you. All right. Any other things for the agenda? This meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>